The ELSA Monitor is Transonic's extracorporeal life support assurance monitor that helps objectively assess the efficiency of ECMO therapy, which helps to improve your ECMO outcomes. By using gold standard transit time ultrasound technology, ELSA verifies delivered blood flow, quantifies recirculation, and trends oxygenator clotting, allowing perfusionists to provide the ideal ECMO delivery for their patients. ELSA is an easy to use, non-invasive way to measure recirculation in VV ECMO without blood sampling. ELSA also helps perfusionists improve bedside decision-making for COVID-19 ECMO patients. Start maximizing ECMO efficiency. Let the ELSA monitor help your surgeons, intensivists, and patients while safeguarding your ECMO program at the same time. Transonics ELSA Monitor. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of the MediWeb PerfWeb Spring Conference. We've got a great show for you today. Let me get through all of my housekeeping notes, and then I will be introducing our esteemed panel. Welcome to everybody that's watching online via YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and of course, the LinkedIn, and our own internal system. So you guys, I always forget to even mention you guys. Uh, our program today is sponsored by Houston Extracorporeal Technologies. That's HET.us. We have, uh, happens to be, we do both these educational programs and we also have a perfusion practice in multiple hospitals in the Houston market and we're hiring two. So if you have an interest in joining a, a really incredible group uh, that works, does some real great cases in multiple places, We'll have some, a position on the north side of Houston and south side of Houston. Look, reach out to us, HET.us. You can learn all about us right there. And then Transonic. And Transonic is one of our sponsors for the Spring Conference. I want to thank them so very much for their willingness to participate. And their participation is actually in the support of Dr. Kravitsky, uh, Nikolai Kravitsky, who will be here on Saturday to give his presentation. I think you're going to find his data and his presentation's fascinating. Uh, the, uh, the guy is a PhD, doctor of science, and incredibly knowledgeable on flow uh, validation. So, you know, they have flow probes for coronaries, they have flow probes for, they have the ELSA meter, which of course you know about. How do all these things work? Why do they work? And what's the science behind it? What can you actually do with it? There's some interesting data that he's gonna have. Um, Social media, please like, follow, share us on the Facebook, the Tweeteroo, and the LinkedIn, but also please go to our YouTube channel, become a subscriber, click the notifications bell, give us a thumbs up, thumbs downs aren't allowed, we rarely ever get them, but I've seen one or two, I wonder sometimes where they come from. And, uh, but also what's really important to us is making comments in the videos that we have or also during this live feed that we're doing, comments just saying hello, anything really matters the way Google and YouTube do their analytics as to the value of your site. So it's very helpful for us if you can do that, much appreciated. Of course, from our perspective, we want you to call in so when you see the call-in number, please just go forward and, and do that. Uh, you can also contact us at uh, our two websites. Well, I'll talk about that first, perfusioneducation.com, which is a free site. You can be, get a free membership. You go in there. It's our library. You can earn all of your CEUs, all that you would need. We do programs throughout the year, you, single source for getting all of your CEUs. And it's going to be multiple presenters, multiple studios. It's not going to just be one source and that's all. You're really a valuable resource. Now, I still think you should look at other things that have topics of interest, but we're going to try to cover everything so that we can be your single source for most 
of your CEUs. Not for all of them, but I'd like it to be for all of them. Um, contact us at perfusioneducation.com if you want to send us a, a note, you want to ask to be part of our faculty, you'd like to develop some kind of relationship. We have a relationship with Canada, a relationship with Spain. We're working on a relationship down in Venezuela. We're working on a lot of different things right now. Um, I think I gave you our call-in number. When you see this symbol, you can call in, be live on the air. Um, our MediWeb app, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna actually play with the app, but there's a bunch of stuff in there. You can find us on uh, the App Store and on Google Play, Google Store, whatever it's called. Um, you've got podcasts, Podbeam, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, whatever your favorite place to listen to podcasts uh, is, you will find us there. So please do that. And now it's time for me to introduce our wonderful faculty. Here in the studio with me is to my immediate right, almost as always is the case, is Tammy Sparacino. And she's there because she kicks me under the table whenever <laughs> I'm saying something she doesn't want me to th say or think I should say. Um, and uh, Tammy, of course, you know her from the Tammy Sparacino Journal Club. Um, her bio is online. Uh, you know, she's just a big part of this. She is, she is this program as far as I'm concerned. And then right next to her is Patrick O'Toole, perfusionist extraordinaire. Patrick is a Texas, no, a Rush University yes, graduate. Chicago. I'm sorry, Rush University graduate. And you've been with us now for, gosh, Patrick, with six us for years. six years. You're 20 plus years in the industry. You had a short sabbatical where you were in industry working for, I think, Soren at the time mm -hmm. with their S5 pumps and that kind of as a consultant perfusionist. Yeah. And then came back to clinical practice full time and have been back full time for six, eight years. And uh, I think it's fantastic. You're a great, wonderful perfusionist, wonderful person, great member of our team. Thank you. And uh, he uh, took a real, I think, interest in some of these new technologies, in particular the one you're going to be discussing today. So the first part of our program today is going to be very simple. Oh, and then John Ingram. Where's John? There's John. John Ingram. There he is. Good Perfusionist. Morning, you know, I, I can't see. You know, look at all this stuff I have around me. I can't see anything anymore, John. They need to raise those up or I need to grow. I need to get a little taller or not slouch in my seat so much. But John Ingram, incredible guy, big part of this program, been with me, for, been doing this thing from the very beginning, currently does his own program on our show called the John Ingram Knowledge Nuggets. Um, and uh, it's been fantastic. I still t keep telling him that the only gem of the week needs to be our job here in Houston until we <laughs> fill those positions. So I'm holding you, you know, that's, I'm holding you responsible for that, John. Uh, but John does a, uh, he's been a perfusionist forever. He's uh, been a businessman. He's uh, done these kinds of educational programs. A wealth, he's working on his master's degree right now, almost done with that. Um, just has done so much in this field and really understands it from so many different aspects and is excellent at teaching. Um, and he's going to be doing two new technologies, but currently you're doing a lot of ECMO and that is, I think, one of your uh, fields, of, certainly one of your current fields of real expertise with contemporary knowledge about that. So I think I have done a reasonably decent job at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, introducing our faculty. Now later, I do need to say, we're gonna have some THI day. We're gonna have Ann Grecho is gonna be here talking about some real interesting stuff. And uh, also Deb Adams talking about giving back. You know, we always talk about all the clinical stuff in our profession, but what about the human side of what we do? And I think she's gonna really bring that home. And of course, you know, Ann and Deb, both members of the American board, both have, uh, 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 Deb has, go, De uh, well, Ann is very, very big in the STS, the STS database, knows it like nobody else I know. And uh, also Deb is the director of the Texas Heart Institute School of Perfusion, having supplanted um, Terry Crane upon his retirement. So, you know, a lot, a lot of positive things happen happening in our, uh, our world. And then we also, do we have Matt coming in today? Yes. Yeah, and then later this afternoon we have Matt. Yeah, ten thirty, Matt Warhuber coming in, mm -hmm. and Matt is going to be uh, coming to us from, of course, Vanderbilt. He's the director of the Vanderbilt Perfusion Program there at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, 
Um, and uh, he's going to be talking to us about uh, perfusion schools, perfusion training, which is going to be really good synergy between him and Deb Adams because Deb is the director of the school, whereas uh, uh, Matt is the director of the perfusion program, and they have a school as well. And so I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting discussions about the level of training perfusionists are getting today versus what they have historically gotten and where is our profession going to go. So we're going to be really excited to see when Matt Warhuber comes in. Technologically, I'll just go ahead and caution everybody right now that the harsh reality is we are really pushing the envelope in technology. We're using all kinds of new tools. We now have two remote studios going on, one where John is, one where Matt's going to be coming in from. We're going to have multiple people here, up to five, once we get all of this going. We do have a technologically advanced studio, but we are certainly pushing the envelope of technological capability and personnel. In other words, we don't have 20 people back there doing the job, you know, doing, doing, running around and getting all of this done. It's done by a much smaller crew. So if there are failings along the way, we're going to do our best to uh, fix it. So be patient with us. That's all I can ask. But so far, it's really hard to tell that we don't have 20 people back there doing all of this. So I think that it's remarkable and a testament. I rarely ever say anything about the guys in the back that are doing all of this with the cameras and the switchers and the tech and the, the computer programs and the Facebook and the YouTube. I hardly ever say anything about them, but I will say it today. They are incredibly gifted and incredibly talented. So they make us look really good, which I appreciate so very much. Okay, I think I have said everything. It's the first time I've ever actually done an entire opening and used all of the time. So with that said, John Ingram, I think you are first up on the list to talk about. You're, you're first. Oh, I'm first. Mm. So I'm first on the list. So I'm going to take my new toy. And I'm going to mirror the screen. It's going to probably ask me for a code, likely. And actually, while it's doing this, I have two new technologies. One that I did as a formal, and then 9063, and then one I just heard about uh, yesterday in one of our call-ins, yeah. and you guys are going to see it actually for the very first time, too, because I didn't send it to anybody. And, and if I may, Amit, I hope you're watching uh, the program because I added your, those images and videos you sent me into my slide. So I'm going to do two, next, two, two new technologies. And then uh, all I have to do is go presenter view. And I think I'm ready. Joe, the floor is yours. The floor. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> new technology. So my new technology is the MC3 Nautilus Oxygenator distributed by Medtronic. Now, MC3 is a company that was founded by Dr. Bartlett from, of course, University of Michigan, ELSO. We all know who Dr. Bartlett is. I would call him the godfather of modern ECMO as we know it today. They use, interestingly enough, the old Tarumo cannula manufacturing site is where these things are being built. So, you know, Terumo got out of the cannula business mm -hmm. and they took over that plant, that, 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 that infrastructure, and then made the, uh, originally the Crescent cannula. And that's also distributed by Medtronic. And uh, they make the Nautilus oxygenator system. And it comes in two iterations. You have a base model, which is just the oxygenator, and then you have the smart device, they call it, which has a casing on it, which I'll show you, that has sensors built into it that record a variety of things, flow, pressures, and so forth, which I'll show you. So uh, cost on this thing is, I list price is 2000 for just the oxygenator and 4000 for the smart device. 
Um, it does not come with a pump, so you have to have your own pump. This is only an oxygenator plane or an oxygenator with sensors. So this is what it looks like here, and here what you see is, of course, oh, shoot, I'm so sorry. Oh, there you go, that's what happens. Yeah, there's the patient, there's the crescent cannula, here it's coming down, you see the pump, this is a, uh, I believe it's a Medtronic pump, and then you see it going into the oxygenator and coming out of the oxygenator. The oxygenator is here. This is the smart case. So just this oxygenator without these sensors, which I'll show you more about, but it's got obviously a heat exchanger. You see it there. And this is what the device looks like. Here is the smart device. It uses four <coughs> alkaline batteries, which are replaceable, not rechargeable. The, bat the batteries, if it's just four, uh, double, uh, four, al four alkaline batteries, and I've, I've believe they're double A, I'm not sure, triple A, I'm not sure what they are actually, the type of batteries, please forgive me. Um, but they last about 120 minutes. It's 2000 with the oxygenator only with sensors and display screen, which is this thing here, this box, there's the batteries right here, is about $4,000. And here you see the oxygen inlet, you see the various different things that are uh, recorded, including temperature, saturations, and uh, flows. Here's a short little video from Medtronic that sort of explains it. You have a sound? The Nautilus Smart ECMO module is designed for ECMO. The first that doesn't sound too good. with the convenience of integrated monitoring the Nautilus Smart ECMO module improves long-term gas transfer while providing real-time device performance data. Integrated sensors in the blood inlet and outlet ports measure pressure, oxygen saturation, and temperature. Monitored values are displayed on the touch screen. The touch screen also allows for SO2 calibration. Utilize the touch screen to set alarm limits. The module gives you audio and visual alerts when alarm limits have been exceeded. Here, the oxygen gas flow has been disrupted. The light bar provides at-a-glance assessment of oxygenator status and is visible from at least 4 meters. When gas flow is restored, the module recovers from the alarm state automatically. The Nautilus Smart ECMO module is designed for long-term performance. The circular shape eliminates corners, areas known for clotting and stasis. The guided inlet design reduces velocity changes at the inlet, where low flow and stasis may also occur. Finally, the filling veins aid in even filling and even flow distribution across the fiber. The circular shape, guided inlet design, and filling veins work in combination to create the Nautilus Smart ECMO module's circular flow path design. This flow path technology results in improved gas transfer. The module is used with the Nautilus oxygenator holder which allows for versatile positioning. Nautilus Smart can be powered with four AA batteries that are included. Double A. Battery life is 120 minutes or greater. Alternatively, AC power can also be utilized. To power on the module, flip the switch to the on position. As a convenience, pressure sensors are pre-zeroed and no further action is needed to ensure pressure sensors are zeroed prior to use. The large blue ring on the inlet side of the device and the red ring on the outlet side match the colored caps on the blood inlet and outlet ports. The colored rings help confirm the inlet and outlet side of the device once colored caps have been removed. Blood sampling can be done at the lure ports located on the blood inlet and outlet. 
When Nautilus Smart is first powered on, the ready screen will appear. Measured values are displayed, but alarms are not yet active. A press and hold of the play icon activates alarms. Alarm limits can now be set, alarm notifications will occur, and the Nautilus Smart ECMO module is ready to go. Simplify your circuit with the first oxygenator featuring integrated monitoring. Nautilus Smart ECMO module, designed for ECMO. Okay, so I think that's fairly interesting. Um, uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. Hold on, guys. This is a uh, mess. I'm not sure what we have here. Um, this is, I think this is the same thing, it's isn't it? It's the same it? thing. That's how it started. Yeah, I think so. So let me just move on to this. I think this is a very interesting uh, this thing here. It's an imaging where they put radio opaque dye, and you'll see it. You'll see the dye going through the oxygenator and then distributing and then coming out the other end and then you see how it clears. That's mm. interesting, yeah. So I think that is very interesting. I think also, if I may, what I found very interesting is that they themselves mention about the, um, about the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the square, the corners. Yes, the corners. They and mentioned I've, a circular design. Yes, yes, and I think that is very important. But this is their interface, which you can see here. They're getting, basically, they're getting free, they're getting free advertising from me without actually being sponsors, advertisers, because I had to do new technology, and I, I actually saw this when I was in Nashville yeah. and thought it was a pretty cool device. You know, you throw the whole thing away. I was yeah. wondering, so yeah, what the whole part of thing is, is thrown away. The whole, yeah. the whole thing is disposable. Okay. And if you look right here, if you can see it, here's your arterial. But I'll, oh, sorry. Oh, man. David, this is driving me nuts. Okay, there. You see the sensor? Mm -hmm. See, if you have the base model, you don't have these sensors. Mm -hmm. There's the sensors. The saturations, the blood gas, nice. basically, and nice. the uh, and the pressures. I, I take it those are trending devices, considered to be. It says it's zero. I don't know. That's a very good question. I don't have an answer for that. So yeah, we'll just take it. We'll just keep looking. Um, there it shows their flow characteristics. Here it shows those filling veins that they were talking about that you see here. It's round shape. Here you see how it comes in, goes up, goes across the membrane, and then you know comes out and. More than likely, you know, if you if you understand, if you understand um, uh, oxygenator design, it's very important that you have some level of uh, turbosity because if you don't, then you'll have laminar flow and your right. gas exchange will only be on the outside mm -hmm. and not reach the inside of your flow path. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's one of the problems is you have to create those turbulence. Eddie's are our friend. Eddie's are our friend. I like that exactly. <laughs> you probably learned that. Did you learn that in industry? Uh, yeah. Or just well, knew I that? I learned perfusion school. Perfusion school, yeah, <laughs> that's very true. Uh, we had bubble oxygenators, oh, so yeah, you know, I yeah. remember. I, I, Why are you looking at me? I don't remember. I don't remember. I heard so uh, <laughs> here's their blood path <laughs> drop. <laughs> um, which I think is very reasonable. You can see at about five liters here, you have, I guess at six liters, you have a uh, pressure drop of about 60. Your O2 transfer rate, you know, at, uh, and, and I don't know what they're using for a hemoglobin here. I think there's a standard, but it's about, you know, about 300 to 400 between four and six liters, which is, you know, excellent. Your heat exchange <coughs> performance seems very good and your CO2 performance also seems quite reasonable. So I think, it's a, I think it certainly meets the expectations of the market. Mm -hmm. So that's my new technology number one. New technology number two Just a minute, I, I, I kind of know something about that I was going to mention. And the Nautilus? Yeah, one of the newer features that they're working on is a, a, um, it's a Wi-Fi remote uh, app that you can run it from. Really? <laughs> no. I just thought... Everybody would buy that if, they, if that was the case, right? 
Anyway, all right. You I mean wish. if you go to the MediWeb <laughs> app, you can run the Nautilus system? <laughs> That's exactly Patrick. what that I was That would be great thinking. on the MediWeb app, yeah. Okay, so we had a <laughs> we caller. We told you he was going to be fun. We, go, uh, we, we had go. a, we had a, say that again, John? Yeah, I was, do you want to um, discuss a little bit the option in it before you go to the second one? I have a couple comments there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, I didn't see if you said that these are polymethylpentene fibers. They right? are. They're PMP fibers. And I meant to say that and didn't, and but yes, they are. The second question would be, uh, because this is interesting, you know, I'm doing uh, in an hour from now, my second talk is about a brand new ECMO oxygenator also coming out called the Breeze. And it's very interesting where we're going to be able to compare these two. But, but is this biocoding? Yes, it is. It was listed in their uh, yes information. They have whatever their name of their biocoding is. Yes. Uh, yeah. And what's interesting is you don't have to buy a console at all with this. Right. Well, y no, that's not true. You not for, you have to have a centrifugal pump, so you're going to have to have some kind of a console, some kind of a oh, pole yeah. to mount it on. I mean. So no, I. But can you control the flow from that? You don't need a knob. No, there is no flow from that. It That's just, just an oxygenator and measuring device. That doesn't change the flow at all. Mm. No, you have to have a pump, and if you want to go up or down on your flow, you have to turn the pump speed up or down, as the case may be, um, and then it's just simply reading that change. So you mm -hmm. don't have, it doesn't have a pump integrated into it. Well, right, I saw so, that you had a so you pump can use, You can use any centrifugal pump that you have, correct? Yes, you can use any right. centrifugal pump that you have. You can use Terumo, you can use Medtronic, you can use Levanova, you could use what a peristaltic pump. It really doesn't make any difference. You can use a roller pump. You can use any pump you want. Yeah, but all your monitoring for your oxygenator saturations, temperatures, I think there was a bubble, et cetera, all that's built into the system. If yeah, let me go, let me go way, back. Let me, yeah, can you throw my slides up it's and it, have uh, the was, studio and John in, 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 in the picture too, or no? Like, can he be in the, can you, hey, David? Yeah. Can, can John be in there too? Because you have the studio and me, but you don't have John. Go I'll to the so, first Yeah, slide. so let me go. To the very first slide? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yes. There. You, oh, there. Um, no, you listed one. a price of 2000 Yes. I think. And, but then if you add the, the sensors and display screens, then it's uh, 4000 But all that's built in together. You don't need to zero anything, connect no. anything. It's plug and play. But then you, then, you, then you obviously need to run the pump, whichever centrifugal pump mm -hmm. you're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead and talk, guys. I'm going to go answer our phone. Um, so, yeah, so I think is here where I read, I read that it was PMP and bio-coded. Let me see if I can find that slide. Maybe it's here. I'm getting, I'm done with this. I'm done with this. Uh, I'm going to fucking quit. Let's see. Um, I think it might be here. Hold on a second. Let me give it to somebody because I was up on the panel. Yeah. Um, now, do you yeah, have, is it. there air bubble detection on the Venus inlet or just on the outflow, oxygenator outflow problem? Well, it looks like, o, it says O2 saturation in slash O2 saturation out. So it sounds like it's reading it on both sides. So you've got your, your inlet uh, and your outlet. Well, what I mean by bubble detection for, for a lot of purposes. Oh, bubble for detection. Let's air. see. You think yeah. it's, I do so not look, see that. Let's let's just I don't see it either. So let's go here. Yeah, uh, well I'm not criticizing it's, it. You it's, have, it actually has no, I don't think you're criticizing it at all. For, for what it's doing. It's but it looks a, like a, you um, get it looks like you get flows, you have um let's see. I was come trying back to find here. the screen where it talked about the biocoding because I know I read that. Pressure in out, delta P. So you get the pressure in and out, O2 sat, O2 sat in and out, temperature out, set alarm limits, receive visual alerts. Uh, I don't see, I don't even see a bubble detector on there, frankly. Um, that's if your sat's going down, that looks like that. You know, John, I, you know, let's compare it to yours. I want to move forward to this other guy's thing. Okay, good. 
Hello, this is Joe Basha. Who's this? Joe, hey, how you doing? It's Rick Garcia. Hey, Rico. Ricky, how are you? Great talking to you, man. I haven't. I, good, I, good. It, I miss you guys down there. In fact, I'm ready to move to Puerto Rico <laughs> after this program's over. Absolutely, open invitation. You and I, and John, John Ingram. I haven't seen John in like 30 years. Uh, your friend of mine yeah. from a long time ago. I know. I know. Hi, he's doing Stanley. great. Good to see you again, man. We've got to get together. Listen, I want to. I want to first of all thank you guys for doing this, especially now with the uh, the COVID. Everything's hard to get our points and uh, outstanding job with this. Thanks for doing this. Um, a uh, really cool device you're presenting here. Uh, is, quick question: Is it available? First of all, is it hard to get? And is it um, FDA approved for more than six hours? Okay, those are great questions. I don't believe it is approved for greater than six hours. I don't believe, but don't quote me on that. I think if anybody has any interest, I would probably reach out to Medtronic. My goal today was really sort of to introduce just the new technology. Uh, I talked to Erica Reyes, who's our rep with Medtronic, and they do have it available. So if you have an interest in it, I do think it is available. Um, I'm not 100% sure for my purposes it's worth the cost. I don't know if it is. I'm not, I'm not terribly excited about it, but I do think it seems like it's a good oxygenator. So it's a little less expensive for just the oxygenator than the Quadrox is. I think they're running about 2500 yep. And this is 2000. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're on back order too. Uh, it, it's hard to get the quad rocks, and uh, you're gonna have difficulty getting them. So that's it's a good it's a good alternative. Well, that's oh, another yeah. that's another issue, uh, Ricky. You got to think about is right now there's a only a single source that manufactures PMP fiber, and that's made by 3M. Okay. And so when there's a PMP fiber back order, it affects all manufacturers of oxygenators exactly the same. The only difference would be how many they had maybe in inventory at the time the back order occurred during their production well, cycle. And, and I know it also depends gotcha. on where gotcha. you are in the line. So you can place your order and if there's, you know, only 10 people in front of you, then, you know, you're obviously going to get it sooner than if you're like 30 people. Because I know I, I've run into that before specifically with the cardio help. There were yes. so many people in front of you that it still took another, you know, several months, even once they were restocked. Very good point. So, th so that's what I understand about it, Ricky. I would reach out to your Medtronic rep um, to really get into the woods or the weeds, I guess they, they say, get into the weeds with all of the details of the oxygenator and uh, all the various things that you asked me. I simply really don't know. It was sort of an introduction got it, got to it. a new technology that seemed, yeah, I only get 15 minutes and I'm already two minutes over. So, <laughs> and I still haven't talked about my friend. The only reason I'm two minutes over is because I had to get up and go answer this phone because the person supposed to answer the phone was outside smoking cigarettes. And so <laughs> that's part of the problem. Um, but that's like. <laughs> Okay. Got it. Listen, guys, thanks. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, greetings to all. Everybody. Okay. Safe. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. So he's not outside smoking. I take that back. He was in the other room listening to the program. But, uh, but anyway, I want to go on to this other guy's thing. So, so, Ricky, I'm coming to Puerto Rico to visit with you. Um, uh, you know, and, and that's where, uh, what's his name is, too? I always forget his Brian. name. Brian Cheatham. Brian Cheatham. Brian Cheatham. You're working with Brian. How's he doing? That's correct. Oh, he's fine. Everything's, everything's good. Everything's good. Well, be sure good. to tell him we said hello. Yeah. And Ricky, I've reached out to our rep here, and if she gets back with me during the program about approved for more than six hours, we will certainly let you know. I actually think there's only one device, and it's actually made by Fresenius. Hmm. Um, Fresenius is getting into the ECMO world. And I think theirs is the only one that is FDA approved for six out, for over six there's hours. There's an answer on the chat. And the YouTube oh, there's an answer on the YouTube chat. Okay. Nothing is approved. Well, that no, that says nothing. No, I think Some the Fresenius yeah. is the one. I think it's the Fresenius device. I thought Quadrox was, no? No. no. Really? We can discuss oh, wow. all of this. Okay. Ricky, um, before, just a minute. Me. I, 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 Ricky, I met you about uh, eight years ago in Puerto Rico. I was down there when you guys first got the Inspire Oxygenators. 
I, I met you a couple times. Oh, back when you were in industry? Yeah. Oh. He was with Leave it Nova. He looked a Under little industry, younger back then. I looked a lot younger. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So let's throw that slide. Ricky, it's good talking to you. Thanks yeah, so much for I the think, kind uh, words. I think ignorance is only good. It's really great. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, buddy. So I was talking to this guy yesterday, Amit, um, up in Cleveland, and we were talking about gas flow interruption. And I just want to show this very quickly. He said he had to adapt it to make it work. And this is his thing. So you see a, a 3 8 reducer here. You see an ET tube extension. This is made by Omita. And then you have another one, an ET extension, and a 3 8 quarter reducer. So a, 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 a little bit of engineering went into making this thing. But here's a video of it running. So you're doing a case. And if you look right here, you can see it spinning. Called the spinner. Oh, and it shows you the nice. gas flow. Now you know what that was. That's incredible. There it is. Cool. So I'll play that video again without the uh, pen markings. Because I actually think that was a really good idea. I think that's a very creative idea. Yeah. I love it. There it goes. You see it spinning. Yeah. Right there. And so if it's not spinning, you don't have gas flow. If it's not spinning, you don't have gas flow. And it reads as low as one liter per minute. Wow. That is incredible. What's the spinner in there again? What did he use? It's something from Omita. Yeah, I wrote okay. it down and again, yesterday. And again, Omita makes it, and I guess it's for ventilator. Yeah, for, it's for, for oh, something else. Yeah. Okay. It's right. a, a gas flow indicator from Omita. Yeah, oh, for, for anesthesia cool. machines. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good and idea. And then he came up with a way to adapt it for the yeah. bypass. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I'm done. I went over. So who's next? That was your other new technology. That was it. I'm oh, done. Oh, that's, that's great. Because okay. we learned about it yesterday. Uh -huh. I'm done. So, I think John's next, isn't he? John, are you next? I guess I can be next, absolutely. Well, let's see who's supposed to be next. Uh, I don't know. Well, I'm next. It's, it's me and you and your other, every other one. Yes, here. so it's you. Yeah, John John Ingram, new technology number two. Okay, let's go with John. And I'm going to pull your slides up. Okay, okay. guys, so um, I'm going to do a similar thing, Joe. Uh, this, this technology has probably been out a little, a little while, and uh, it's really exploding. And I thought that maybe it would be good to, uh, to talk about it, review it. Maybe we can learn some things, but also for maybe some people who haven't seen very much of it or don't do very much of it. So um, this is going to be about the Impala 5.5 with Smart Assist heart pump technology. And um, I don't have any disclosures on this. Uh, I, don't, I don't own stock in the company. I'm not friends with the rep. He didn't take me out to dinner. Nothing <laughs> like that. So if we can go ahead and we check it, it out. <laughs> so um, don't feel bad, John. Medtronic, didn't, Medtronic won't, won't even support our programs, OK? So, and I still did their device. It's just the way it is. Okay, so the purpose is to produce, um, uh, well, I, I mean, uh, my screen is cut off there, actually. I can't see the, uh, the whole thing for some reason. But um, the indications are, you know, it's, it's um, uh, going to, it's a treatment for cardiogenic shock uh, that usually is acute within 48 hours of an MI. This was the original intention of, the Impel device. So it's an acute cardiogenic shock situation from an MI or following cardiac surgery, maybe due to cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. But it's a result of isolated ventricular failure, usually the left or the right. And uh, it's, it's a ventricular failure that's not responsive to optical medical management and conventional treatment measures like balloon pump or whatever you might, might have. Uh, contraindications. It would be if you have a mural thrombus in the left ventricle, this, this device is going to end up in the left ventricle, so a mural thrombus in there would be detrimental. A, a mechanical aortic valve is going to be a contraindication because this device is pretty large and has to go across the valve. Severe aortic stenosis or insufficiency for sort of similar reasons. An ASD or BSD LV rupture or severe right heart failure. And I think you're going to see um, why, why some of those things are. All right, so uh, we're just going to kind of do uh, uh, an overview of this particular Impella, the 5.5 with Smart Assist, talk about some key components, talk about the console, the controller, and there's something called a purge that goes along with this to keep it operating properly. There's a purge system. Then we're going to talk about 
how to properly position it, and how to manage it. So what we're going to do, as I said, describe the impeller with heart assist. We're going to identify key components, the controller, the function of the purge, and the position. So we can go ahead with that. So there's a, a family of, of these catheters that, have de that they've developed and um, that, that uh, Abiumet has developed with this. And it kind of started off with the Impella 2.5, which the whole intent originally was to, to support uh, you know, PCI procedures, percutaneous coronary intervention, and basically just offer some, you know, just some cardiogenic support, cardiovascular support. And the Impella 2.5, it only flowed about 2 to 2.5 liters a minute, which is why it got, how it gets its name. But then they realized after a while that it actually had a lot more applications than that. So they have uh, the Impella CP, and they have the 5.0, which now flows 5 liters. They have the uh, RP, Impella RP there on the lower left, which is for right ventricular support. That's actually kind of a, a different uh, cannula, but we can talk about that on another day. And then the one today I'm going to feature is kind of the latest and greatest, but it's really gained a lot of traction out there, the Impella 5.5, and then the console and it has smart assist technology that they've added with the catheter combining with the controller. So if you've never really seen one, the catheter um, basically is shaped like that and it's at an angle like that and it's rigid that is not flexible in that area there where, the, where you see from the beginning to the end of the, of the actual uh, device. But the blood inlet is at the end of the, of the catheter. And the blood outflow is at the uh, during the, uh, the body of the catheter, up proximal from there. Now the catheter diameter, the, the catheter is only nine French, but the actual device there is 19 French. But even though they call it a 5.5, which is basically the the, the 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 liter per minute flow, it can flow up as high as 6.0 liters a minute on this device, which is pretty impressive. So here again, just a family of devices, and these are the left side devices. They do have one right side device. And if you notice, starting on the left, you have the original one, Impella 2.5, and then they improved it with Smart Assist, and then they had a faster device, more powerful, the 5.0. You notice how those all have those soft pigtails that need to stay uh, uh, coming out of the end of them. And those pigtails were designed to keep the end of the catheter, the inflow, off the myocardial wall of the left ventricle and not sucking down against the myocardium and, uh, and causing flow issues. So they, they put that little flexible pigtail in there to prevent that. The problem was, though, that that little pigtail often got caught on the uh, trabeculae of the, uh, of the chordae, I mean, of the, my, of the uh, mit mitral valve. Yeah. And so that little pigtail, even though it was flexible, a lot of times would get hooked on the chordae tendon. So then they came out with um, the devices there, the last two on the right, where they don't need the, uh, the pigtail any longer. The Impella LD and then the Impella 5.5, as we're going to talk about today, no longer need that pigtail on the end of it. So what this is, it's a microaxial blood pump, basically like a turbo tur turbine that you see in a, in a jet plane or something similar to that. The catheter is 9 French uh, based uh, catheter, but the microaxial pump, the actual device on the, uh, on the end of the uh, cannula, uh, on the end of the catheter is 19 French. So you need a 21 French sheath to feed this through. Okay, so if, if you're going to put this in, you have to be cognizant of, of the same thing of putting about a 21 French cannula, which, which for ECMO and adults, that's not asking a lot. We usually put in quite a bit larger than that. Uh, there is a low anticoagulation regime, regime that goes on with this. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, <coughs> it needs minimal bedside support. So you, you get a single access point, and there's different options for how to insert this. Uh, you don't have to rupture the septum or go across the atrial septum or anything like that. There's no priming. There's no blood outside the body, no real bleeding involved. And of course, they're, they're trying to compete with uh, ECMO a little bit here by saying you do not need multiple large cannulas to be inserted to get this working. And um, it gives you basically the big feature that it starts with is direct ventricular unloading. And in this particular one, delivers 5.5 liters a minute from the ventricle, which is pretty impressive for a tiny device to flow that much. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the anatomical placement. And see here, you're going to see a video here. And you see how the device 
It's sitting in the left ventricle and now it's inflowing and then outflowing on the aortic root. Okay, you can insert this two different ways through an axillary. You put a graft in to the axillary uh, artery and then you feed the cannula down that graft and into the uh, axillary and then it's going to drop down into the aortic arch and come down. Now you're doing this across the wire, across the aortic valve, and then it's in, in place. You can also do this with the chest open directly into the aortic root with an open chest scenario. And you see here how the blood flow is being pumped up into the aorta, and there's sensors there that is, the smart technology gives you an indication of what you're doing and the flows and the pressure. So here's the catheter. It looks a lot like this. It hooks up to the console with about an eight foot uh, drive line, and it gives you all the readings. It's an intelligent screen. It can tell you what's going on. And you can also manage this from an app, by the way, on your phone. That's awesome. So here's awesome. what it looks like. That's incredible. The advantage is not a femoral insertion. If you do this, it can go into the axillary, and the patient's mobility is so much better with this type of insertion. So this is what it looks like, the Impella 5.5. <coughs> Some of the, this is a shorter catheter, so it, it doesn't have to be near as long to insert up the femoral artery and also not being inserted femorally, as you just saw in the video, the patient can be very mobile now. So if you look here at some of the features, go back, go back to that, that slide. So backwards, yeah. So this slide, if you look at the left, one of the reasons they call it smart assist technology is it has this optical pressure sensor. You see the red uh, LED, but it's also a pressure sensor uh, on, the, on the device itself, on the outlet of the device that's going to be in the aorta. And if you look over to the right, you see where the inlet, as I mentioned, is at the end, comes up through the rigid cannula, and then out of the outlet there where the smart, smart assist sensors are located. And by the way, the, the, the impella itself, a lot of people think the impella and the motor is down near the inlet, down into the left ventricle. It's not. It's up in the aorta where the outlet, where that yellow, where that blue uh, circle is saying outlet. That's where the actual uh, uh, impella motor is located. So it suctions blood out of the left ventricle, and then it empties it right there at the outlet where the, where the impella is into the aorta. And then you would just take the, um, continuing on, on the uh, cannula, you see there's a, a suture to the suture to the skin, a sterile sleeve lock, and then a red impella a plug, basically where uh, next to that is the purge sardine. We're going to talk about this system needs a constant purge to keep the motor from being plugged up with stagnant blood. And then, of course, it would just plug into the console driver there at the end. So, you know, probably Joe and Sammy and, and uh, Patrick, a good way of looking at this, and one reason why it's, it's gained so much traction is that it's really a balloon pump uh, on steroids. I mean, it's just, you know, tenfold what we hope we ever could get out of a balloon pump because the first thing it does, on the left you'll see it decreases end diastolic volume and decreases end diastolic pressure of the, of the left ventricle or the right ventricle if you insert it on the right, but primarily looking at the left, um, which is always a great advantage for a struggling heart to relieve the stress and strain and the O2 demand on the left ventricle. So it decreases oxygen demand. And by increasing the blood flow into the aorta, you're now increasing the oxygen supply, right? So basically, if you look there where it says AOP, aortic pressure, aortic pressure is increased, which gives you an increased blood supply to the coronaries. It also gives you an increased blood flow, an increased blood pressure. So you get systemic hemodynamic support while relieving uh, oxygen demand and increasing oxygen supply. So there you see the picture, what I was saying before, the location of the impella. And so this rotating impella pulls blood through the cannula, from the left ventricle, from the end, up through the cannula. And um, the, uh, automatic, the automated controller, you know, you, you control how fast the impella rotates. It says that it's automated there, but it doesn't automatically adjust the speed. You manually adjust the RPMs of it, just like we do on any of our other type of uh, pumps. And so, of course, the rotation speed is proportional to the flow. Higher RPMs is going to result in higher flow, assuming that you have the preload volume in the left ventricle in which to uh, retrieve from. 
So you see, as soon as the blood comes up uh, into the cannula and meets the impeller, it then exits right away, right out, right outside that impeller blade. So is the, is the exit of the, uh, of the into the aorta. So basically, the way that this pump um, operates, it operates on something called P levels, which basically stands for a power level, the amount of you know power you're going to energy you're going to you're going to ask to be delivered to the to the to the drive to the drive line and to the impeller. And at, at P zero there at the bottom, you have zero RPMs and zero flow. And as you go up P one, P two, three, four, you notice on the right that the revolutions basically jumps up somewhere between two to 3,000 RPMs each time you go up to a P level. And you can see that you have on the second column what your corresponding flows you would expect your flows to be. And the range for each P level gives you there. So for example, if you're at a P level five and you're wanting to flow 4.5 liters, but you're not flowing 4.5 liters, you're flowing only four liters, then you probably have, you're asking for too many RPMs compared to the amount of uh, filling volume you have in your left ventricle, meaning you're sort of sucking down. And if you do that, you know to lower your P level and get your flows back to where you're not sucking down like you normally would see with a lot of our pumps. Similar thing can, can, can happen. So now we look at the controller itself. And this is just the actual unit that the uh, driveline catheter hooks into. It's the interface that basically helps you monitor and control the the impeller pumps. Um, and here's where we get involved with something called the purge system. There's a purge system, which is a, uh, we're going to talk about it exactly, but it basically is a small amount of saline fluid. It's actually D5W that is pumped into the backside of the impeller motor itself to keep blood from accumulating and, and sludging up the rotation of the impeller and, and, uh, and where the axial is. And so also, this has a backup power, which is operated either the wall or has at least a 60-minute battery, depending, of course, on how much you're asking the unit to do. A lower level, of course, a lower P level, you would probably have a longer than 60-minute battery life. So this is what it looks like on the IV pole. And um, by the way, that controller there is just sitting in a holder on that IV pole. You can There's a handle on the top of it. You can pick that right up off that IV pole, put it right on the patient's bed, and you don't need that IV pole at all. It's just a convenience if you prefer to have it on the IV pole. But it does come with a nice wide stance, good good uh, heavy wheels on it, so it's easy to roll. And of course, this uh, this controller is going to help you, you know, prime the, the system in that initially get it going. It's going to detect flows. It's going to help the air, the, the purge system mostly. Um, it's a high resolution display, very easy to read. It's easily to transport this unit because, like I said, you can detach from the IV pole, so there's no issues with ambulance or fixed wing or helicopter. And then it has the automatic purge system. And this automatically controls the purge system. We're going to talk about what that is here coming up. So just looking at the uh, controller briefly, I don't want to get too deep into it, but it's a combination touch screen and selector knob, that big selector knob there actually helps you rotate and select things up and down on the screen. And then when you press that large knob, you press it in, it will click. And that will give you the enter of what it is you're trying to bring up. If you want to bring up the display screen, you rotate the knob to display. And then you press on that large selector knob, and up comes the display screen. So it's a, it is a touch screen also. But this selector knob gives you something nice and rigid that you can click on, sort of like a, a heavy-duty enter, enter button. But it also rotates for selection. So here's some of the things you have on the touch screen. You, your alarms go off. You can touch right there and mute the alarm. You can go into your flow controls. You can change your different displays. There's different, four or five different displays that the uh, screen can give you for settings and, and looking at history and things like that. The purge menu gives you all the information about what's going on with that purge I keep talking about. And then you can get to a main menu button as well. So not to get too deep in the weeds, a little bit hard to see on some of these, but if you see there on the placement screen up on the upper left, it's pretty much the main screen you're going to use. And you're going to see an aortic pressure line. You see the red wave with actual aortic pressure numbers. It also gives you a left ventricular pressure wave, which is in the white one there, which gives you LV systolic and LV end diastolic, 
which tells you a lot about how well you're unloading your left ventricle. And this smart assist technology with the catheter that has now these sensors on it can detect what is the left ventricular pressures and, uh, and the end diastolic pressures. So you see there, it says the left ventricular pressure is 99 over 3. If that end diastolic pressure of 3 were to go very, very negative, you know, you might be sucking up against the myocardial wall. If it goes very, very positive, you know, 12, 15, 20, then you need to increase your flows because you're not fully unloading the left ventricle. And then in the green at the bottom, this basically gives you some power indications, tells you how hard the pump is working, how much energy it's drawing, and that, that you can look into further. It kind of tells you if you're overflowing the system, meaning you're working the pump too hard for how much flow you're generating and also gives you a good idea of how well the pump is working. That's something you can get more experience with if you get this device and you use it. Hey, hey so John, this, uh, hey John, this I don't mean to, yep. John, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we're, we're running a little bit behind on time. So okay. can we sort of move forward with this? It's sort of an introduction. I think we're almost, I think we're almost done, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, the, uh, the, the task bar at the bottom shows you on every screen you get to your flows and your RPMs. So you can always have an eye on your flows and pressures and uh, RPMs. Go ahead. And then um, the PERT system, real briefly, is just a cassette line that you hook into the console, and you're going to connect it to a. Uh, go ahead. You're going to connect it to a. Uh, uh, it's going to keep flushing the impella, so there's no blood, stagnant blood that accumulates in the impella motor itself. That's what the purpose of it is. So it's a high pressure line. It drips very slowly about 2 to 10 milliliters per hour are going to keep that from getting clogged up with blood. So it creates a pressure barrier so blood cannot get, get clogged up in the, in the axial rotation there. Go ahead. So you're basically going to make a D5W with 25 units per milliliter bag. You're going to hook it up to the cassette. The, the console is going to purge it for you, and you're going to connect it up to the end of the catheter, and it's going to take care of itself after that. And that's what it looks like inside the console. It has the disc. It walks you through it on the screen. And it gives you, uh, you know, ideas of, of what you're flowing. It's going to flow about 2 to 30 millis per hour. You do have to keep in mind how much heparin you're giving the patient. There's a small amount of heparin that is going into the patient there with this purge. And there you can look at the history and see how much you've been purging, how well it's been working, and you can calculate how much heparin you might be giving the patient if you're worried about bleeding. And also you can do, uh, this is the last slide, you can also give, put less heparin in that bag. The manufacturer allows you to put half a mile of the heparin in that bag if you have issues and concerns about bleeding. So I think that's all we have there, guys. Mm. Is it? Yeah, I think, John, I think we need to wrap this up. I'm sorry, but we're going to run done. out of time. That's the last slide. However, uh, yeah. Oh, okay, great. That so was... thank you. Um, that was a very comprehensive review. I really wish Abiomed would have paid either you or I about <laughs> $50,000 for that. Our, our, our intention here is more introductory to something that is kind of a new technology. So they're 15 minute quick kind of go, you know, get it, get it introduced and let people do their own looking at it uh, versus, you know, that was pretty comprehensive and I appreciate it very much. I do think that I've gotten a couple of comments and I just want to point it out. I do think the Abiomed is a good device. I don't think it's a, impella. an Impella, yeah. the Abiomed Impella. I don't think it is the, the, the panacea that they try to describe it as. Um, I think the left-sided Impella, when you get up to six liters like that and then the RV is failing, now you need another solution. I think we're going to have a very good debate and it could be a uh, not today, but it will be a good debate over VA ECMO with perhaps either an impella or a tandem uh, transeptal in order to decompress the LV or whether it is uh, really the device that should be used when you have that much heart failure. When you're flowing six liters or five and a half liters, the, I, it's hard for me to believe the RV is just operating perfectly normal. And then, of course, you run into the problem of overloading the RV. With no, now you have to deal with decompressing it. But those are discussions for another day. I, I've gotten some comments online about Abiomed being somewhat anti-perfusion. Mm -hmm. um, 
we had the whole episode with them and the FDA talking about uh, 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 ECMO and how our charges or how the hospital's reimbursements for charges were dropped. So, you know, do I think it's a good device? Yes, I think that it is a good device. I think it is a good device when used in the appropriate circumstances. I think VA ECMO is a good technology, a good technique when used in the appropriate circumstances. I think both combined are good to use in the appropriate circumstances. So, you know, I, I think that a lot of these technologies, doesn't matter who what company it is, try to say theirs is the one that solves all of your problems. We're the only one that you need. And I think that's fundamentally flawed thinking. That's my view. What say you? Well, can I backtrack a little bit to the MC3 because I have an answer yes. for Ricky. So it is approved for 48 hours in the U.S. and 14 days in Europe. They did do oh. additional testing uh, for um, up to 30 days. They found good performance, but FDA is approved for 48 hours for that and 14 days in Europe. Excellent. That's Thank great. you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank uh, you for that. I yeah. appreciate it. Sure. Oh, okay, so back to the Impella. Um, I agree with you. I think it's, it's a very useful device. I think that... Um, it has its place like many devices do. I don't think necessarily I've had a lot of good experience when I'm using the 5.5 actually being able to reach those maximum flows. And of course it is dependent on volume, um, but for lower flows, more of a support, um, I've seen better, um, better- uh, LV venting. Yes, exactly. And, or just for, mild dysfunction, enough right. dysfunction that you need support better than just a balloon pump. Yeah, I've had a really good um, experiences with it in the cath lab for um, yeah. temporary support during mm. procedures. That's when I've seen the best type other than the LV vent. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Yeah. John, very excellent comprehensive review. I really think you need to send Abiumet a bill. I'm not <laughs> kidding. That was way, way, well, that was really good. I, I want to try to avoid that. <laughs> as much as possible in terms of I don't want to be advocating for a device or appearing to advocate for any device from our program's perspective um, I just much. think John is very thorough and so anyone who hasn't had any experience with that you definitely understand the entire system now absolutely yeah. absolutely okay all right Patrick O'Toole I think I can make up some time here too so good I, I can go through this pretty quickly so uh, what I'm doing my presentation on is uh, hold on a minute that's not right. Hold on. You got your pen. You want me to help you a little bit here? You I just need to go to the next slide. Okay. Hold oh, on. just no. Just wait. Use your finger. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it draws right. nice lines, doesn't Hold it? Hold on. Let's clear pen markings. Let's get this back up I'll here. I'll use the pen later. Oh. Okay. Now, next. Oh, what is going on? I need a little okay, help. Okay. Now, now it'll work. Nope. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Now, unselect pen. There you go. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. So um, you did a show, uh, I think it was PerfWeb number 56 or 57, on the Transmedics device that they're using in Vanderbilt. Yes. And, um, I, and you know, that's, that's under, under, they're investigating it now. Basically. Yeah, it's not really for Matt sale. Matt Warhoover uh, mm -hmm. and Dr. Uh, Hoffman right. and, uh, and uh, Joey uh, Lepore mm -hmm. all came and, and they did it from Vanderbilt. It was the inaugural presentation of theirs was on the, um, uh, it was actually on de uh, donation after cardiac DCD. death, DCD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and, it was uh, amazing. And that's what it was about, but this technology is very yeah. interesting. Anytime somebody uses the word reanimation, it's interesting. Yes. <laughs> that's exactly what they were talking about. Absolutely. So uh, what I wanted to do, though, was uh, just sort of think about that new technology and what would happen if it was widely accepted, and then, you know, how would we be involved? How would it affect our profession? So looking at it from the perspective of, you know, what would be the opportunity, uh, now not all of these people are, are transplant um, candidates, but the number of potential customers would be, you know, 12 million liver failures, uh, cardiac, um, sorry, uh, congestive heart failures, 650,000 per year, and the liver failures, 2.8 million per year. But yeah. sadly, go ahead. I was just going to say, that would, that's a huge impact. No, yeah, it's giant. It's more than heart surgery. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, sadly, only three out of ten transplants are actually successful when we transport these on in cold storage. On of in all the these organs or specific organs? Just 
All of them in general. All of them in general. And they're really, if you look at this, I did look at the specifics. They're all close enough to three out of ten. I left it that way, not to mm -hmm. get too far into the weeds with yes. the details. Um, so the question becomes, you know, time is really the enemy when you're moving an organ uh, on, on ice. And how long do these organs last? So uh, a heart is four to six hours. Four, four hours, that's, that's like a four-hour cross-clamp time. You know, your yeah. heart is going to start to, uh, to decline in its function. Uh, lungs are about the same. Livers are a little longer. They do transplant uh, intestines and pancreas, although the uh, device I'm going to talk about, really, they're not involved with that yet. But I'm sure they will be in, in the future. But the real opportunity would be with hearts and lungs because of their short period of time that they can survive. Um, so here's the device. Uh, it is designed one machine with different inserted cartridges to transport uh, lungs, hearts, and livers. And they do this under warm perfusion, um, simulating the, the organ as if it were still in the body. So uh, briefly, let me talk about lung transplants. And they did do a study on lungs. Uh, again, we have about 30% uh, success with uh, cold transport. And they showed an 87% success with normal thermic, oh, which is just a gigantic jump. And we also have to remember that most of these organs that they transported and transplanted were organs that would have been considered unusable. So they reanimated those organs while in the body while, while, while they were still in the body, and then they put it on this machine and, and moved it. And uh, it did some pretty amazing things. The most important and exciting part about this that I found was that the distance, because of the length of time we can keep the organs viable, uh, increases up to 20 hours, mm. which is huge. That's from Hawaii to North Carolina. And uh, that's really big, because that increases your pool of people that are going to be donors and your pool of people that are going to be receivers. Well, and it also, if I may interrupt real sure. quick, not only are you having a longer distance that you can do it, but you're having a more successful transplant. I know, yeah, exactly. So you're really getting it on all fronts. Mm -hmm. So transplants really could become a, a really big thing, mm -hmm. and I think perfusion needs to be involved in it, which is really what I'm kind of talking about. There are other uh, devices out there other than the transmedics. They're not the first, but they're in development, so I think there will be you know, several machines that, that are using this type of transport. And they're, they're all, they're, they're, they're pretty similar, but this is just the one I'm focusing on. Uh, with heart transplants, uh, they, again, we're at 30% in general for success. And then with uh, normal thermic perfusion preservation, we're 81%. Again, it's, it's, it's a really impressive study. So It really is. And again, we're about 20 hours. So hearts and lungs are about the same. Livers, they, uh, they're in the process. They haven't released any data, so we don't know on livers. I suspect since we have such good results with the others that we would see something yeah. similar with livers. Okay, so um, this technology does increase or will increase the viability of the donor supply and the, do donor, the, the uh, receiver demand. And so the number of organ transplants, if we look at that increased distance, it's 33% longer, 33% more receivers and, uh, and donors. So that would be, if you just kind of calculate it out, it's an increase of about 1,300 transports per year wow. if everybody were to just start using this device. Yeah. And again, what if we use it on, on hearts that are actually viable? I mean, we could have even better numbers. So the question becomes, uh, should we be involved with uh, organ transplant? I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of involved with the, uh, sometimes we're involved, sometimes we're not. I mean, okay. I, I've never been involved with a transport of an organ. Have you? Or either of you? Uh, no, uh, I, but I haven't really worked at a transplant center. So that, of course, would limit my um, exposure to that. Yeah. But um, that, that would be an interesting question to ask Matt. Of course, they are involved, but I wonder what the trend is across the country, if he has any idea what other right. heart transplant centers are doing and how, you know, how much perfusion is involved. Yeah. Well, it, 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 I think John actually is going to have some, uh, some insight into this, oh. but very quickly, of course, Matt, you know, they have to send, when they do a heart, I don't know about the other organs, but when they do a heart, they send two perfusionists. Yeah. Two. But are they involved in livers at all? Good question. Don't know. Because, you know, of course, if I was trained on doing uh, right. liver stuff, 
Yeah. You know, but we used to do it differently, though. We used to go on pump. Yeah, we went on pump. But you know I, what I mean is, perfusion had a hand in that part, uh, that kind mm -hmm. of procedure. Mm -hmm. But I wonder um, today if that's still something that perfusion's involved in, or if they've developed new techniques where we're not. I just don't really know. I don't know. It's a good question. Well, I, I think it's a good uh, question for Matt. I think as soon as we start putting these, um, you know, these these organs on pump. Yeah. We should be involved. They are. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I think and, and we they are, are with right the now. hearts. Yeah. And I know not? with the hearts and the lungs. Right. But I don't know with the liver and the pancreas. I don't know. Right. Yeah. The question. liver, their, their uh, transmedics is currently, from what I understand, involved with a, a very similar study that they're doing with livers. They haven't released any results. So I think we don't know. But Patrick's yeah. point is that it's a mini pump. So it is. we should be involved. Well, it's a lot of work, too. Again, we'll talk more about it, I think. We'll yeah. bring it up with Matt, but I can tell you right now it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's yeah. not that simple. In fact, I want, but go ahead. Let me let you yeah, finish we're, I'm just about through this so we can talk in just a minute. So I did look up the perfusion scope of practice. Uh, AMSECT mm -hmm. did publish that. And uh, we are to be involved with uh, organ procurement, uh, thermogenic lavage, which I kind of look. Shake I'm not sure what that is. That's it's like it, washing yeah. an it's organ like or the cancer. Yeah. No, it's the it's when they put the it's the shake and bake when they put the hot uh, uh, like, uh, uh, chemotherapy like for isolated, oh, isolated isolated limb perfusion. Limb, yeah, limb but perfusion. for an organ or isolated limb perfusion, right? Yeah. But okay. uh, thermogenic lavage is, tends to be the abdominal for colon cancers, uh -huh. and oh. they put a hot uh, uh, chemotherapeutic bath, and they circulate it, and then remove it oh, okay. into the peritoneal space. I mean, because I've never done that. I, I used to do isolated limb perfusion a lot, mm -hmm. um, but it's been a number of years. Mm -hmm. And you that's can get another that at thing a, that at you can do too. too. Is just uh, yeah. thermogenic. <laughs> you can give a much higher um, temperature yeah. and much higher uh, uh, chemotherapy, you know, chemical agent, right. toxin for the cancer into a a limb because it doesn't become systemic. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and we used yeah, to uh, send it in at about, I think, 43 or 45 degrees as uh, how warm mm -hmm. that would be going in. Mm -hmm. When I was in uh, perfusion school, speaking of hyperthermia, there was a one little study that didn't really pan out that showed that uh, they thought that the uh, HIV virus died at 42 degrees. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, we were going to open a clinic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, that would have mm -hmm. been incredible, right? Right there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to skip my next slide. Oh, no, I'm not. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip that. Let's just go ahead and uh, finish this up. So um, that's my talk. I was just uh, wanted to talk a little bit more about how we should be involved and what people think about that. Well, I think it's a very timely talk, Excellent. especially since we just uh, you know, had the talk from Vanderbilt talking about they didn't really go into the device too much. They talked more about the actual doing it mm -hmm. and um I well think i want to bring right. john into this john you want to talk uh, if you're free to can you talk about that experience the one that you called me about yeah that's what i called you about joe um we uh i personally have not uh, done this or actually even been trained on it we have a large perfusion group i think we have uh, 17 or 18 perfusionists i think at this point about half of them have been trained uh, half or maybe a little more now but it we probably done, or I should say, they probably done about four or five, and it has been extremely, extremely difficult and stressful on the perfusion staff. You do send two perfusionists, and there um, is a ton of things that you have to do. When the timing is right, it has to be done very quickly. Things have to work together. Two people have to be doing one thing at the same time. Somebody's doing something else. I think there's different models, there's different teams doing this, and, and Matt can probably shed a, a lot more light on it than I can, but the team model that, that they sold us on at our hospital is a very stressful one. The responsibility of the perfusionist is enormous, and other team models, they actually have a scrub tech that does the sterile side of things, which apparently is a lot going on there as well. In our particular model, the perfusionist is scrubbing in, doing the sterile side of things. The other perfusionist is doing the non-sterile side of things. They have to work very quickly together with a lot of tedious steps that have to be done right in order for this to, uh, to get launched. And then once it's up and running and you're traveling back to the site, there is a lot to do as well. You have to take very frequent ABGs, blood gases, and you have to manage the lactate that's being produced. 
if you do anything even slightly off. Uh, you see, you have a functioning organ that's beating with no other organs supporting it to remove waste products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have the, the liver and the kidney there to remove all these uh, waste products and byproducts of metabolism that the heart is producing. It's going around in circles in the same blood. So this becomes the, uh, the, the real big challenge. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's very easy, we have found out, to take a heart and, um, and not have it survive the flight back. Now, I know that in our initial ones, we took some very, very you know, difficult hearts that uh, probably were probably good ones for us to start on, put it that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that it's been, uh, this, it's, 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 it is a huge learning curve, I can tell you that. And okay. it's very labor intensive. Yeah, sounds like it. It's a lot of hours. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's, again, a great introduction to it. Um, uh, some good questions, some good thoughts about it. It's something we can maybe do. A, we'll get uh, Matt involved, mm -hmm. John, you involved. But I want to make clear to my group that's here, uh, when John called me about this, do you have any interest? Of course, I immediately see the the the, the <laughs> risk associated, yeah. and it was uh, no thank you. Yeah. Well. So we're not gonna. I mean, I think this is again limited to people that really know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Everyone shouldn't just be trying to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the company's best interest to sell more of them. It's in the I think patient's interest to have it limited to the number of people who are actually doing this until it's refined. Okay, um, those are my final thoughts. John, you've got one more new technology. Um, yeah, it's going to be quick. And it's on you. It's, it's, it'll, it'll be, it's going to be a short one, so yeah. you guys will like it. <laughs> good, else good. Yeah. <laughs> we're only 15 minutes behind. We're good. Uh, that's okay. The world will still be here when we're done. All right, you can put the slides up. So, Joe, this is interesting because you just did that. Nautilus M3, three, uh, MC3 oxygenator, and this is uh, amazing because I didn't realize you were going to actually talk about that. And this is a, a fairly similar thing that's just come out by Abiomed. Again, I don't own stock in the company. The rep didn't buy me dinner. In fact, I don't even know the rep's name. I don't get involved with that at our institution. Um, but we did get some of these in about six weeks ago. We've yet to use one, and the reps told us during their three days of clinical education that we were the sixth center in the country to even get these. I don't know if that's exactly true, but that's what they said. So this is what it looks like. There's a console there. You can wheel it around. It can mount it on an IV pole. Let's take a look closer. And um, so um, this, is, this is how it looks. Go back a slide or two, guys. I don't know what you skipped there real quick, but um, it's progressing on you. <laughs> so basically, you have a, a console. It's basically designed for mobility. And it does hook up uh, gas lines and, and drive lines and stuff to, to the mounted bracket there. Go ahead. And um, I'm not sure the order of the slides you're doing there, but OK. So basically, um, you can see there that um, you have the venous and arterial line that go into it. And that's what the unit does. You can pop up the handle and go with it. Okay, so this is a video, okay? Yeah. So it goes into a sophisticated bracket, has a centrifugal pump built in with the oxygenator, and the flow sensors are right there on the outflow lines on the arterial, nothing on the venous. The blood flow comes into the pump as our as venous blood, then it's pumped into the oxygenator through the center. The, the oxygen goes from the uh, outside of the membrane to the inside, and you end up with uh, arterialized blood coming out. That's how it looks like on a cutaway. You have your gas flow that comes in and in as your blood flow comes in from the sides. And you can see there, there's actually a two-phase oxygen sweep system we're going to talk about briefly. It, it's a two-phase system, one primarily for sweep, one primarily for oxygenation. And so you end up with a very simple system. You close it into that uh, mounted smart bracket, and, uh, and basically off you go. So basically, we'll look at it a little bit closer with an overview and the functions and a little bit about this specialized gas uh, feature that they have on this machine. So they call their, their, their oxygenator the integrated, they call it the pump lung unit, okay? 
And there's something on there called an innovative gas technology. We're going to talk about where there's a two-phase, two lines, two gas lines that go to the oxygenator, not just one. Wow. Go ahead, guys. They call it the breathe system. This is what it looks like a little bit closer. So they call their oxygenator the pump lung unit, and there's a pump driver there that's mounted on the smart bracket. It does come with a hand crank. They call it E-drive in case of a failure. They call the, uh, the, the disposable, the, the pump lung unit disposable, or PLU disposable. And this is meant to be the simplest. They went all out to try to make this the simplest ECMO system they could possibly think of. And, and when you see what's on the screen, you're going to see how simple this is. It has its own internal gas supply. It makes its own oxygen. Not with it. It's not a backup tank or anything like that. It can make oxygen from room air in case there's any failure of the blender or you run out of your O2 tank. The battery life is three hours, and it has nice rollers on it as well. Go it ahead. has an oxygen generator. You know, like, those ox what, like an oxygen generator. So, like you yeah. have uh, people walk around with that yeah. need supplemental oxygen. Yes. That's incredible. Right, it has that. It has that job. It can make unlimited, as long as it's plugged in or the battery's running, unlimited oxygen it can make on its own. So you pop the disposable unit into this uh, smart bracket driver, and as you can see there, it's a centrifugal pump in the back, immediately up against the oxygenator. So basically, they are in tandem, and uh, are in series, really. And then um, you have something called a condensation tray. There's no heater cooler with this. There's no heat exchanger, you'll notice with that. And it, as far as condensation goes, all of our oxygenators we're used to using have a drip, drip, drip. This doesn't do that because when it drips down, this has a condensation sponge and a tray there that absorbs all the condensation. And that sponge will last a very long time. If it ever gets saturated, you pull that little condensation tray out and replace the sponge. But it can last for many days. So you don't have any condensation dripping, and you have no water lines with this as well. So basically, again, you see where the centrifugal pump would sit. That's a magnetic uh, RPM driver there. And you see there's ultrasonic flow sensor bubble detectors on the outlet. Only on the arterial outlet, by the way. Nothing on the venous. There's nothing detecting venous bubbles or saturation or anything like that. And then on the console itself, they're showing you how you connect two separate gas lines along with the driver line. So again, that's what you see now. This is how simple it is. You basically, when you prime it, it's going to be just like a bag priming circuit with a bag. You fill the bag, you let the, the, the venous line drop all the way around, you hold this in your hand, you, 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 you twirl it around, get the air out, pop it into the uh, smart bracket and go with the RPMs for a while. And if you want lower port access or you want pre and post membrane pressures, you have to open these accesses lines there and hook them up yourself. So this is what it looks like again from the side. You see it's going to take the blood from the outside of the membrane to the inside. It's a cylindrical oxygenator, Joe. So you'll love the fact that it doesn't have any corners. It is a PMP, polymethylene fibers, but it is non-coated. This is a non-coated system, the tubing and the membrane, and also without a heat exchanger, as I said. And then there's about 12 feet of tubing on the venous and oxygen side. So it's pretty long tubing there. So this is what's interesting. You have two different types of way to deliver gas to the oxygenator. The external would be your blender or an oxygen tank. And by the way, your green oxygen line from your blender, you do not connect it to the oxygenator. You connect it to the console, and then the console uh, air and oxygen lines connect to the oxygenator. So when you connect an external gas source like your blender or an O2 tank, the console is nothing more than a very large connector at that point. But you do not connect it directly to the oxygenator. In the case that the external gas mode fails, there's a backup internal gas delivery system that is automatically activated when the external gas flow is interrupted. And it makes, like you said, Joe, unlimited amount of oxygen from the room air as long as the, the, the console is plugged in and running. At three liters per minute. At three liters a minute, yeah. But that's so only you hear, enough for emergency. What's interesting right. is when you connect your external gas supply to the tank or a membrane, it essentially functions exactly the same as any other oxygenator, even though it has two air inflow lines. When it's on, um, when it's on the uh, internal mode, when the machine itself is making the air and oxygen, then does it, does it do something separate on the two air and oxygen lines. One is heavily 100% oxygen, and the other one's an air-oxygen mix.
But bottom line is, it works and acts the same from our standpoint as any other system we've used. If you want increased, uh, if you want to uh, decrease your CO2, you increase the sweep. If you want to increase oxygenation, you increase the FO2. So even though there's a two-phase system here, for all practical purposes, it's interesting to talk about, but it operates the same from the standpoint of a perfusion. So real quick about the console. Uh, it's basically as simple as it can it get. It only monitors uh, RPM liters per minute. It has a bubble detection on the arterial side only. If you get air into the, get, into the venous side, the only way you're going to know it is that the pump is going to pull with air and your flow is going to drop and your low flow alarm is going to go off. That's the only way you're going to know you have, you have venous air. You have a three-hour battery. Go ahead, guys. And this is how simple it gets on the screen, Joe. Look at this. This is your home screen. Blood flow, RPMs, and is my gas on? That's it. That's the whole thing you get on the home screen. It shows you if you're on internal gas, meaning the machine's making its own, or if you have an external source, it shows you that you have external source. This is the home screen right here. And if you leave the screen alone for 30 seconds, it locks on its own so nobody could ever come up and touch it once you walk away without unlocking the screen. <clears throat> So the blood flow is the same, controlled by RPM. It's measured by the flow detector. You have upper and lower uh, alarm limits for blood flow. And you can adjust the RPMs just like you did with the up and down arrows that I was showing you. The RPM ranges as high as 4,500 RPMs. And it goes up in increments of 50 RPMs every time you hit the up arrow. <clears throat> so here again, you see if there's an alarm that comes up, it highlights in yellow. It tells you sort of what the problem would be. And you can adjust the sound of your alarm, too. It's loud or, or, uh, or soft. You can also adjust the bubble alarm limit for smaller or larger, or larger bubbles, just like we do on our, some of our hard lung machines, <clears throat> where you can sensitize the bubble detector. So there here, uh, again, uh, once you um, walk away from the screen, it locks. Or you can manually lock it and manually unlock the screen. The sweep gas, as I said, you can have an internal source coming from the machine itself or an external source whereby you hook up your green line directly to the console and it's delivered to the auctioneer that way. So it's talking about the flow range, like you said, Joe, up to three liters a minute it can produce in gas flow on its own. And you increment it up or down by 0.5 liters a minute. And you can see there's an air and an oxygen setting on that. So basically, um, you, it has a self-side process, by the way. You don't need to side this oxygenator yourself. Every, I think it's every eight hours, if I'm not mistaken, but you can program it. The machine will self-side the oxygenator, and it takes two, to two minutes for the sighing process to be complete. But if nobody touches this oxygenator or system, it will sigh itself. I believe it's every eight hours. For, it's a two-minute process, and the screen will tell you that it's doing that. It will tell you where it's at in the sighing process. And basically, that's a, another look at it for the absorbent disc for the, uh, for the condensation tray. You just monitor it for saturation. It comes with an uh, external drive. Go ahead. It comes with an external drive crank in case there's a, a failure. Same thing that you're used to with the other ones. It just shows you RPM on the screen on the top of the driver as you're hand cranking it. And I think that is the end of that. There you go, guys. Thank you so much. Excellent. Good that work, great. John. Yeah. Good work. So Very good. Um, what about this question? We have a question. Can you actively warm or cool with this breathe, breathe yeah. unit? Um, and the reason that this person asked is that they actively cool eCPR patients, which makes sense, and have, have had a couple of accidental hypothermic rewarm slash resuscitations with, uh, with ECMO. Well, as I was uh, sort of saying there, there's, there's, this, is, this has got to be the simplest ECMO uh, system uh, ever. It, 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 they, they tried to, to do that. And, and by simplifying it, they eliminated, uh, there's no heat exchanger. There's no hooking up of a heater cooler. So if you have to cold uh, code cool, or if you have to, a patient that's septic and you want to cool them, or if you have a patient that's cold and you want to rewarm them, you're not doing it with the oxygenator. You're going to have to figure out another way. So that is a drawback. In addition to the fact that there's no um, bio-coating, which is coming, they are going to have that in a future edition, they said it is coming, but right now they wanted to release it. There's no bio-coating, 
And basically, um, you know, they, they just wanted to make it a pretty simple system. So between what you showed there, Joe, with that Nautilus system, which was also pretty simple, self-contained and, uh, you know, looked pretty easy, um, this is what seems to be coming out, I guess, as a competition to the complexities, I guess you could say, of the cardio system. Yeah, well, I think that, yeah, that's true. Um, and uh, this certainly, you know, I don't know if that would even, I don't know if that would be a good transport model. I really can't, there's no reference, so I don't know how big or small it really is. But it brings up a larger issue, and, and we'll just maybe discuss it for two or three minutes, uh, because I think we need to, to move on, have a break. I think Deb and, and, and Ann are here as well. Um, but, you know, where are we going with all of this? In other words, when I looked at your system, you know, we don't have to go back and look at the pictures. I noticed that there were no, I didn't see any, any, any as far as I was, could see, any access ports. So what do you do if you need to integrate CRRT into it? There are? There were two access ports, but they are optional, and you have to hook them they're, up during priming. They're optional, you have to hook them up during priming. Okay, so I didn't see that. Um, what if you need to go V-VA? or V dash VV. How do you, what happens when you cut into this system? Is it the same as the other one? Oh, you void the, um, the manufacturer's you, Well, any protection, whatever. is that the case, You're John? gonna cut that into your arterial line. You're gonna wire your arterial line if you're gonna do that. So that's like any other system. But Joe, you have no temperature probes, you have, you have no pre and post membrane pressures, unless you use the ports that are there to you know, hook up a tubing, flush a, transducer and hook them up yourself. You have no venous bubble, no venous saturation. You just have an arterial bubble, arterial flow. And so they're trying, when we ask where this is going, the manufacturers have decided ECMO is everywhere. Let's make it so simple, like they try to do everything else, like the balloon pump and the cell saver, where it's one button and anybody can run it. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what it looks like to me. And uh, I guess we'll have to see how all this works out. And, you know, and you're, you, again, you just brought up, I think, the point, and I think that's also the point that's bring, being brought up by one of our uh, uh, listeners online, is that they are doing everything they can to simplify a very complicated process. ECMO is not, is not, is not a CRRT. ECMO is not a balloon pump. Now, with that said, and to be fair, back in the old days, the balloon pump was managed by perfusionists yep. at the bedside, and I understand that we have to progress, right, in mm -hmm. life. We have to become, we have to continue to evolve, make things simpler, make things better, make things, you know, all that stuff. It's very important and increase the numbers of patients who can be treated for things. But I think what's happened, at least this is my perspective, is that this latest pandemic has created a surge of flooding the market with these potentially good ideas once thought through and dealt with, etc. but using marketing tools to try and create an atmosphere or an illusion of simplicity when it really isn't that simple. I mean, just selecting an ECMO patient itself is very, very complex. So I, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel necessarily really good about that. It looked very good. The diagrams look great. Everything always looks great until you actually see it being used. Well, I think simplifying things is always a good idea because there's usually safety measures involved in that. However, simplifying it down to not having good functionality or promoting that you don't need to be um, a trained clinician to use it is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, we, we've seen this before, what was it, maybe, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, a uh, device came out, it was gonna be, a, you know, a, the, what was it, the, uh, the first generation of the tandem heart, and it was going to revolutionize everything because it was so simple. Yes, I remember. And they still say that. But my point is, is it didn't really pan out that way, right? It didn't end up, we had it in a hospital I was working in, and it was going to be perfusionists put it in and then never look at it again. It was going to be monitored by the bedside nurse. 
in reality, that didn't really work out well, and perfusion was still involved because it was not really that simple and had issues and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. So I think I'm always hesitant with new devices um, promoting themselves as being so simple mm -hmm. because that's not really where we want to go. These are life support devices. Yes, and when it goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong. I mean, right. so, yeah, you can hand crank the thing, but as uh, I think John was saying, you get air in the venous side and you have to get it out because of an oops or you have to change it in the middle of the night or whatever yeah. it may be. Um, those are, you know, we got clot. Remember, uh, we had a patient with clot in the inflow of our centrifugal pump um, and uh, the pump was decoupling and it was, you know, quite traumatic, but we got it taken care of. And, and But you have to be able to identify these things extremely you know, fast and, just, and know what you're doing. And going back to the whole heater cooler fiasco that, you know, occurred some years ago, not being able to see your device and see what's going on inside of it is yes. not always the best thing. That's a very good point, too. Um, Eric, uh, one of our listeners, says um, he agrees with, with, uh, with, uh, with Jim that... Is Jim's comment is, is this trend a consequence of limited staffing by perfusion? <laughs> and Eric says that's the crux of the entire discussion. Agreed. So I agree with Jeff. I agree with Eric 100%. Yeah. John, what say you? Yeah, um, the, 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 the obvious, the obvious uh, appearance is that um, we don't have enough perfusionists. It's very complicated, very, very, very complicated. Let's make it so simple so all of a sudden, we can market this to ICU nurses and we can market this to whoever. They didn't say that, but if you look at this device, it's almost so simple, it's almost, it's almost laughable. There's one knob, I mean, actually there's no knobs. There's a knob to turn up and down the RPM and there's a screen that tells you what's alarming and there's soft alarms with a yellow that tells you, hey, this might be happening. And there's a red alarm, which basically all that is, is your battery's dying, or your air bubble and your arterial line has gone off. Now, in order to do anything with this, did you see the bracket, how it's embraced in there like this big metal? If, if you're gonna get air out of that thing, you have to turn it off, take it out of the bracket and try to manipulate the pump and the oxygenator somehow, some way. I don't know where the air is gonna go unless you've hooked up uh, some type of discharge ports where you can pull the air out of, like we do with our others. Uh, I don't know where the air is gonna go and I don't know how you're gonna get it out. But, well, Tammy uh, and I were doing a case not too terribly long ago, yeah. and I won't go, I won't belabor it, but it was a VA ECMO, and the surgeon, um, you know, for some inexplicable reason, pulled the venous cannula out. And of course, you know, it just filled with air, and he stuck it back in. <laughs> he and, stuck it and, right back in. Yeah, and, but... he, and he's like, well, that doesn't matter. It's just some air. Just walk it through. He, he didn't quite understand the gravity of the situation. Now, we have our own system that we use. Had I been using this, I don't think the patient would have survived. They were completely ECMO dependent. Um, we just happened, and I guess this is just, I'll pat, uh, I'll pat you on the back, that I think it just comes down to having the experience to know, to guess the right thing to do at the right moment. And then uh, Jeff also said, I've seen massive air entra entrainment and thrombus ingestion as well. Yeah. So these are real problems. Um, and I think this is becoming a industry versus industry, that meaning pro manufacturers versus clinician uh, battle. And we're going to see where it all plays out. But I know they're, they're in the market to sell widgets. And we're in the market to uh, choose the widgets that we feel are in the best interest of overall patient care and safety. Mm -hmm. And those two don't always align each other. So those are harsh realities of, uh, of capitalistic medicine that we have to accept. Agreed. Now there's downsides to socialist medicine as well, which is a lack of innovation. So we're the gatekeepers, sort of, of what's right and what's not right here, and we have to take that very seriously. So, Joe, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just throw something on the opposite side of the fence back out to you. A lot of people are probably thinking, well, wait a second, we don't use CardioHub, we use CMAG and Quadrox or some other uh, centrifugal pump and Quadrox, and we have no monitors on that either. We don't know what our negative P is and delta P is and pressures, and, we're, and we don't know anything. We just, unless we hook up a temperature probe or a purge line, 
to the quad drops. We're just running as simple as it gets. And uh, this is what they've kind of gone back to in a way. So I guess, you know, what would you say to that? Well, I, I think that goes back to the statement I've already said. I think simple is good. Less complicated is good, but you still need to have functionality. And things that are marketed, uh, idiot proof, if you will, I think are dangerous. These are life support devices, mm -hmm. and you that's not the first thing you need to say is that anybody can do it. And I know that's not what they're saying, but that does seem uh, the direction that we seem to be going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Agreed, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to belabor them. Let's see, we're belaboring all of these points. I, say, <laughs> we, I always I say want I don't to want to belabor the point, but I keep belaboring the point, <laughs> um, even though we need to go to break. But I do um, think this device is really innovative with uh, creating its own oxygen. I think that's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. So it, you're, everyone is, it is. I think, actually, I think that's a really smart idea that we maybe should be doing absolutely. with our systems anyway, right? Agreed. And coming up with some way to do that just in every system as a separate, uh, distinct device. But, you know, you, you uh, uh, we were talking about, what the hell were we talking about? I lost the train of thought. <laughs> I Damn don't it. know. I do that all the time. I hate that. I think maybe um, we were going to wrap this up because we're over yeah, time. Yeah, let's just wrap it up. <laughs> I, had, I had some thoughts about all of this, but you know what? The thought just left me. We're going to go to break. Uh, we're going to take about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, John, are you going to be you're going to be rejoining us, right? Yes. Yeah. So we've got Debbie Adams and we have Ann Grecho, and we're going to have a great second half of all of this. So if uh, you all would just give us about 10 or 15 minutes to get our act together here, we will uh, we'll come back and we'll get the second half of the day's program done. Let me just see what Eric's. The only other real driver is ECMO reimbursement. Hospitals are less willing to pay. Oh, yeah, I forgot to ask. That's a good question. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a very good point, Eric. What is the cost of this breathe device? I didn't even ask. Do you know? No, I don't know. I would have, I, I'm curious to the, so, so, so we'll find all of that out. You know what? We're going to come back and we're going to revisit this topic, uh, John, because you're an ECMO specialist. You, 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 not, you're a perfusionist, but you are a, 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 an expert at ECMO. Yes. Now, we're going to talk. In fact, I think Matt's going to give a talk very similar to this coming up. But I'd like you to give the talk where I'm going to give you a couple of hours <laughs> to talk about the devices, the cost, the advantages, the disadvantages. Do an and, overview. And, 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 and yes, and also the philosophical argument that is going on constantly about in the political landscape of who should be doing this, how should it be being done, who shouldn't be doing this, and why. I think these are really great discussions, and it'd be worth a, I think it would be worth a two or three hour session just on that. Yeah. You get two hours, 59 minutes, and I can have one. <laughs> well, I think you'd be, uh, you'd be remiss if you didn't ask uh, Deb and maybe Ann to be a part of that, because they would be, they would be stellar in, in answering some of those things about you know, what you just said. I think so, too, especially from an ethical perspective, mm -hmm. because both of them have very uh, 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 they have a high degree of knowledge mm -hmm. in the ethics, healthcare ethics sort of thing. In fact, Deb Adams was the uh, director of the uh, of AMSEX Ethics Committee oh. at one time. So I think her and Anne, of course, with her involvement with STS, I think they're both uh, very knowledgeable on healthcare ethics because it is unique uh, to a lot of other things. Okay, 10, 50, let's, do, let's do 15 minutes. So it's 1027. We'll come back at 1045 and we'll get started. The ELSA Monitor is Transonic's extracorporeal life support assurance monitor that helps objectively assess the efficiency of ECMO therapy, which helps to improve your ECMO outcomes. By using gold standard transit time ultrasound technology, ELSA verifies delivered blood flow, quantifies recirculation, and trends oxygenator clotting, allowing perfusionists to provide the ideal ECMO delivery for their patients. ELSA is an easy to use, non-invasive way to measure recirculation in VV ECMO without blood sampling. ELSA also helps perfusionists improve bedside decision-making for COVID-19 ECMO patients. Start maximizing ECMO efficiency. Let the ELSA monitor help your surgeons, intensivists, 
and patients while safeguarding your ECMO program at the same time. Transonics ELSA Monitor.
Oh, and uh, can we bring in, there they are. Hey, there we are. Okay, we're back. Let me introduce some new folks that just joined us, please. So there's Deborah Lowry Adams to Patrick's immediate right over there. You can Hi. wait. Hey. And Deb is, uh, of course, uh, I you know everyone knows who Deborah Adams is. I'm old. No, you're not. You look like a, you look like a little kid. You look like a youngster to yes, me. I, yeah. um, but I the mean, uh, current director of the Texas Heart Institute School of Perfusion, and we have Ann Grecho. Everyone knows Ann, and was a staple at THI. She's since now with the Memorial System. But Anne was uh, at THI for many, many, many years. Um, you're, uh, we've already talked about you a little bit, extraordinarily knowledgeable in the STS. Both of you are very, also very uh, well learned on ethics in healthcare. Uh, but Anne, you're also, now Deborah, you used, I don't know, if, I don't believe you still are, you used to be a, uh, a board member for the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion. But, and, and huh? Not anymore. Not anymore. But you I were. I rotated off in 2013. You, but Anne you were, but Anne, you member. are a current right. board member of the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion. Yes. So, you know, really, I think both of you have had tremendous impact on our profession, on our societies. Um, you know, I have uh, for some time, I guess, been a little bit of an outsider in those two things. Um, and uh, But I'm, I'm trying to make my way back into in, into favor, into positive favor. I'm working on it. Learning to play in the sandbox? I'm really trying. Okay, okay. good job, Jim. Yeah. Yes. And then we have Matt Warhoover. I don't know where he went to. Of course, John's back with us. Do we have Matt? Yes, we have. But he's just Hi, John. Here. Oh, he's just adjusting something. There's Matt Warhoover. Hey, Matt. Welcome. So Matt Warhoover is the uh, director of the perfusion program at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Department of Cardiovascular Perfusion, and uh, he too is, you know, his 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 uh, number one his I think experience and his uh, extraordinary understanding of running a perfusion department, uh, having being associated with the school, of course, there at uh, at Vanderbilt. Um, being an employer, as well as dealing with all of these very complex perfusion cases, I think is going to add a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of knowledge to our overall understanding of where our industry and our profession are going here because some things are happening, some things are changing, some things that I think may be good, and some things that I'm not 100% sure are going to be that positive for us. So I believe that Ann Grecho, uh, the extraordinary Ann Grecho, is first on the list uh, to give us a lecture. And the title of your lecture today has to do with the uh, role of professional societies. That would be like AMSECT, uh, Eurosect, or whatever they call their version of it, um, the Canadian Society of Perfusion, um, the American Academy. So. There's a lot of, yeah, and it could just not be ours. It could be any professional society. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this. The floor is yours. We need to make sure we go full screen on that. Oh. Oh, I have to go full screen. Present interview. Oh, please. Mm. Full screen. There's a button. Full screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, well, no, it's, it's, it's in. Oh, I don't know what you mean. Oh, I know what you mean. I know what I have to do. Presenter view. That should be it. Wait, somebody's there. Right. There? No. no. Magic, help him. I mean, I'm, no, because she's in presenter view. Cut to commercial. Cut to commercial. Um, no, don't cut commercial. We'll figure it out. Let me just close it. You don't want my help. No. No. So I'll just try it again. Maybe it just needed to be restarted. It's okay. There, there we is. go. I got it. Good job. See Thanks, that? Joe. I didn't even get stressed. Yes, you're at the best. Now, Ann and I just recently changed a <laughs> ECMO circuit out together. Oh, I heard about in that. In the evening. Yes, and we did. I didn't get stressed then either. No. It was, it was well, it was good. It, it, was it good. went well, and 
I'm really patient sorry that happened to you. Well, <laughs> you, all about it. You, you stay in this profession long <laughs> enough, you're going to see some things. You yes, know. and yes. then you were pulling all of that clot out of the, yes. that yes. clot yes. was that long. Yes. It Crazy. just was like a big, long, giant egg yes. snake. Yes. It was really gruesome. It was, it was impressive. <laughs> it was mm. an impressive clot. Anyways, um, I want to thank everybody um, for asking me here, to inviting me to give these uh, couple of presentations today. Uh, welcome to this conference. I always find this a very um, interesting, provocative, and uh, good discussion occurs in these uh, presentations and these meetings. So thank you, everybody. So the role of perfusion professional societies. So if you just look up what professional society goals might be uh, in general, they seek to further their profession. They uh, seek to further the interests of the individuals engaged in the profession and serve some public interests. Uh, what could they offer? Again, I think we all know that uh, continuing education is a big goal. And again, a part of our um, perfusion um, credential is to seek continuing education. There's a lot of opportunity for scholarship within some of these societies for students. And we all love the networking, I think, uh, at these meetings. Of course, being more virtual in the last year or so has kind of changed that up a little bit. But it, there's still great networking that goes on. And then there can be uh, unified efforts to enhance the profession. Uh, again, this may include some legal and political activities. Um, I'm thinking mostly for perfusion if you're doing some legislative actions in your state for licensure and things like that. So if you, what, what perfusion societies are out there, and as Joe started to list off some international and state and national, you can see this list is, is long and it's, and it's not complete. Um, but for those of us in perfusion, we're all familiar with the American Academy Cardiovascular Perfusion, the AACP. Uh, some of us are also very familiar with ANSECT, American Society of Extracorporeal Technology, or ANSECT. But if you uh, go a little, as we work our way over to the right, a lot of state uh, listings there, and that again is not complete. Just looking in the last couple of days, uh, New York has a state society, Washington State has a state society, and, but I can tell you that Texas does not have a mm. state society. I, I can tell you that, and I'm just going to throw that out there no. to this group. Huh. <laughs> just a little food for thought. I nominate Ann as president of the Texas Society of Perfusion. I second. second. Oh, third. Third. It's done. <laughs> and I think we have a quorum. It's oh, done. boy. Oh, boy. I guess I shouldn't have opened my mouth there. Um, what is uh, Perfusion Pages? Oh, uh, is that an association? Yes. Okay. There's, a, there's a lot of... Um, there's some blogs out there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. okay gotcha. That, that people can belong to, and then if you go over to international again, that I ran out of room alphabetically. If you go mm. past P, you're going to see Romania. You're going to see mm. a whole okay. lot more. Mm -hmm. So it looks like there's a lot of opportunity to participate in a perfusion society on some level. Um, you know, looking at some of the state societies, some of the membership dues are there are no dues. It's free. Um, there are some great offerings for students. Um, I think Debbie could probably mention maybe some that maybe her perfusion students have applied for. Some of these scholarships, um, some of them are um, very good money in terms of what they can get. Um, some of it's based on presenting at a meeting um, and getting a first award or a second award. Um, some of them are, are named in memory and honor of people. Um, they all have officers and they have maybe an annual meeting again uh, Michigan which isn't which is listed there I have been to that meeting before it's multidisciplinary their surgeons their nurses their perfusionists their STS people all get together I mean it was pretty amazing mm -hmm. um, just loved it so there's really some great things going on out there in perfusion societies that you you might want to be a part of or at least check out um, I'm not aware that any of our state societies would um, limit you if you don't live there. They probably oh. would be interested in just having you participate. Yeah, well, you know, Matt is, the, was, is, I think, the current president of the Tennessee Perfusion Society. Mm. 
So I think he's going to have some. Uh, I think he's going to have some uh, very good uh, insight into this as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's just a lot of opportunity, and maybe we just don't. Maybe we just keep thinking of our two national ones, and you know, do I really? Can I afford that? Do I feel like there's anything in it for me? And we're going to get to some of those questions on why you may or may not participate. And I hope we get some discussion and some feedback um, on this panel and then from the group out there on, on what they think mm -hmm. about that. So if you, if you look up AMSECT in the AACP, you're going to see that they have uh, a mission statement or a purpose statement. It's, it's there for you to read. They, they basically are both fostering um, professional needs, improving uh, continuing education, uh, improving knowledge in cardiovascular perfusion, and a way to, to present this all. So a way for, uh, for us all to learn. So I, the other question is, what is not the role of a perfusion society? Oh, yeah. And I think this is going to get some discussion going, and um, that was the intent and purpose. So this panel can uh, interrupt me at any time as we get going here. Um, your certification and your recertification is, is the role of the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the ABCP. Now, your school accreditation is really uh, the role of KHAP, which if you see it spelled out there, is the Commission on Accreditation of Allied Health Education Programs. Mm -hmm. uh, under that, there are committees on accreditation, which are commonly referred to as COAs, if you look at that structure. And the Accreditation Committee on Perfusion Education is one of those, and commonly referred to as the ACPE. These how, this is how perfusion schools become accredited and can uh, offer their degrees or certifications and allow their students to be board eligible. So that is, that is the education arm and the certification arm in perfusion. So what about micro certifications? And again, we have, we have seen this. Um, AMSECT in particular, we're going to talk about that a little bit right now. So the first question hey, I... Hey, guys, I'm sorry, Dan. Hey, guys, yeah. something keeps popping up on the slides. Okay. So sorry. Go That's ahead. okay. So in general, uh, micro-certifications, do we think they have a place? Do we think they're helpful? So. I'm thinking of autotransfusionists, maybe ECMO specialists, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, currently, right now, through AMSEC and a group called IBBM, um, which is International Board of Blood Management, mm -hmm. there, there is a way to gain a perioperative blood management technician certification. Mm -hmm. uh, you take an exam, you do um, provide a case log to them, and you can have this certificate. Um, the, the same thing through the same IVDM offers a certificate in adult ECMO specialist. Again, this is something you can apply for and take an exam and provide some application and you can have this certificate. You think they would have been a good choice for changing that circuit up the other night? <laughs> I'm sorry, forgive me. No, it's okay. Because Thought I'd I, throw it out there. Well, so I, in some ways, it can provide those, those perioperative people that are, that are providing some services within our scope as perfusionists, it does provide them with some recognition that they have achieved um, a competency level, they have proven some knowledge, um, again, might be helpful for them. Well, I agree with that completely because otherwise, what is actually required uh, for these people? I mean, it's just there's nothing required, right? We could actually make someone an ECMO specialist and there's no uh, requirements as far as what their education is, what their experience is. is that, am I correct on that? Yeah. So I think the certification yeah. is good. Yeah, I think well, it's we'll talk back to this. the institution. We're yeah. going yeah. to right. we're we're discuss that because I've already written something down oh. about it because okay. of this. But let me let, let's let, go ahead. Go so you can, make, you can make the point, as, as Tammy did as well, that for, for, these, for these clinicians, it could be helpful to them. It's something that proves that they've got a, a certain level of competency. Mm -hmm. So, but how can it be harmful? And personally, and I'm not speaking for anybody except Ann Grecho, 
um, I think it can confuse the non-perfusion community mm. as to who is credentialed to do what. Mm. And again, with these cert certifications being put through our AMSEC, our, one of our professional societies, it, what's the oversight, the validity, mm. the consistency with this certification process? Um, just with background on the American board, I, I know what that looks like, and, it, and I believe that all CCPs at least value that and, mm -hmm. and accept that that um, is fair, it's equitable, it, it does um, prove your ability and your knowledge. And again, this is a little bit new, I would say, and someone can correct me from the audience or even on the panel, if it's two years plus maybe that we've had the um, autotransfusionist um, certification and that the probably sounds about right. And the ECMO specialist, I want to say, within the last year to oh, 18. I didn't mm -hmm. even know it existed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Again, food for thought, and I, I hope we all get into a discussion on it. So we did actually ask CCPs in the last uh, recertification cycle uh, what they thought of additional, the need for additional certifications. Again. You know, the caveat there is it was for, you know, do you think CCPs need this? And you can see the overwhelming response is no. Yeah. Um, if you look over to the right, it does give you a breakdown of who answered that question. Uh, that looks like about a 75% response right there at 3,300. Very That's high. Awesome. Yeah. A lot higher. Than I sent mine in. I, did I answered. That's great. I'm in that 3,300. Right. And you, I mean, you, you can skip these questions, but again, um, I mean, you know, tagging it onto your recertification, you, so you might get a little annoyed that we're, you know, trying to get you to answer some questions, but we're also trying to figure out what the community is thinking. And we can't, you know, we can't talk to all 4,400 at once, but we can try to survey you mm -hmm. and keep it short and sweet and to the point. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have comments then, and you want to make them, you're certainly welcome to do so. So that was what CCPs thought of uh, additional ECMO certification, and uh, even more so for the VAD mechanical assist device. If there's any need for that among CCPs, an overwhelming no. Again, about the same response rate, just under 3,300. And I think the most, maybe a little bit interesting, was pediatrics. Mm. Mm. So if you look at that, that's about a 60-40 split. So in general, I, th I think the community feels like pediatric perfusion is a, maybe a little bit different in your skill set. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I have an, an opinion about that that hopefully we'll get in discussion about. But that was probably, that is the highest that people thought maybe there's something there. I, again, I feel like if you start slicing and dicing our certification too much, uh, we're not that big a group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I can I make a comment about this particular response? And this again comes from you know just feedback from um, recent graduates that have taken the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion certification exam, and it's quite heavily um, represents pediatric pediatric practice uh, pathology pathophysiology um, ECMO circuits. Um, regular circuits, muff, I mean, the whole plethora of pediatrics. And so, and who's responding to this may be, like me, some older perfusionists that when we took the board exam, it may not have had as much of the um, pediatric influence. So I think, this is my personal opinion, this is Debbie, uh, Debbie speaking, not former director or program director of a school that our, I think our certification exam um, adequately um, examines the knowledge and skills of an entry-level entry perfusionist into our perfusion practices and that's what our certification was meant to do for our adult and then from there you go you go on and you, you specialize I mean are we gonna our, our practice is heavily uh, aortic aneurysm so now do I need a subspecialty mm -hmm. to do you know type 1 dissections and T triple A's and so I anyway that's just my comment so I think it might be skewed by people like me <laughs> that took the board in 1980 or mid-century mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> mid-century. Maybe not mid-century. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie, for, for that insight. I, again, it was probably, it was the highest uh, response for yes that we saw in those survey questions and, you know, where, where it's coming from and, you know, like Deb said, um, then do we need to just make sure we're including that in our certification exam? Do we need to beef up the pediatric uh, portion of it? Uh, you know, ECMO as well, just to make sure that that certification is representing all the subspecialties we are, that are in our scope of practice, because there are several. Mm-hmm. How did I get rid of that? Okay. So the big question, and I, I mean, I almost wanted to put this out as a survey if I'd had more time for people getting on the uh, conference today. Do you participate? And why or why not? So I would say common barriers that I could think of is that the dues are too expensive. I want my employer to pay for it or else I'm not going to um, participate. Uh, What do I get out of that? Um, Is it really worthwhile? I don't have time. And, you know, maybe the other question is if you don't like it or you've just got a bad taste or you just feel like it's not for you, Would you be interested to participate to make it better? Um, You know, be an agent for change. Um, I do think participating does give you perspectives from people. Um, You know, again, um, in our city, in our hospitals, we we work with, you know, a finite group of people. And we we do network, we do know people, but, you know, you can talk to somebody and get a different perspective. Um, I think it's, I think it's worth it. And then also just sharing ideas and experiences. I think one of the things I've missed about in-person meetings is soft learning, you know, that informal discussion of a case scenario with a colleague, maybe over a beverage, <laughs> and either affirming uh, what, you, what you did, how you did it, or getting a new idea of what to do and how to do it. Um, I, think that's, I think that's worth it. I think that's, you can never learn enough. I think mm-hmm. you should always be learning. And, I agree with that. You know, in your, in your practice, you know, if you're primarily adult cabs and you're not really getting out into those, you know, uh, those aneurysm cases, it doesn't matter where you practice, one could come through your door any time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you don't do it a lot, um, you know, there's some things you can learn from talking to people that do it all the time. Absolutely. So I, I think there is benefit there. And then um, as discussion, you know, if you participate, I'd like to hear what you like about it. And if you don't, you know, what is your barrier? And what would make you join one? And then what do you think is, would be the ultimate perfusion professional society? What do you think is, is the best of it all that would just serve everybody and be just the most positive experience you could ever have? Okay. I mean, you actually, so I put a, uh, I put a, uh, a thing out on, on our YouTube channel. We have multiple things we're doing. Facebook, we're doing Twitter, we're doing LinkedIn, we have our own internal system, which doesn't have a chat, and then we have YouTube. The one I monitor is YouTube. Magic's over there doing the other one. But I, if he doesn't see me put a question, he doesn't forward it to other people. So notwithstanding, I've gotten one response, uh, but we have John, we have Matt, we have me, we have Tammy, we have Patrick, we have, uh, of course, Deb, and we have you. So if you participate in a professional perfusion society of some sort, raise your hand. So half. one, two, that's a little yeah. more than half. Well, just slightly more than well, yes, and Eric Hundley. So actually more do than don't. Yeah. So about two thirds do. Uh, we don't. I don't. I can speak for myself, but let me ask you this if I can. Matt, you're the Tennessee Perfusion Society, so if I could just start with you, what is your, and you may be also a member, What which ones are you a member of? Uh, I'm a mem- member of AMSEC and uh, my state society. And your state society, okay. John? I'm a member of AMSEC and also the Academy, mm-hmm. and also ELSO. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And? I'm a member of the Academy and AMSECT. AMSECT? The same, Academy, AMSECT. Both both societies? Yes. Patrick? I was a member of AMSECT, but I haven't. Uh, the first time I left the profession, I, I never rejoined. Never rejoined? So it's been years. Yeah. Previously a member of AMSECT, 
Never the Academy. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was a member of AMSEC, never was a member of Academy. Of course, the board, you know, we all have to be a member of that. We don't have a choice. <laughs> no you want to work. I paid them a lot of money, and we got to talk about that. Okay. We've got to talk about how much money you have to pay the American board. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot. So, um, uh, but, uh, you know, so let's talk about reasons, okay? So let's start with, I'm just going to go back around the horn if I can, if you don't mind. Uh, Matt, your reasons for being a member of uh, the professional societies. Um, I'll start out with the, uh, the, the state society. Um, I think it's important. Um, it's, I think it's a great networking tool. Um, the state, Tennessee, is geographically very wide. And so, you know, it's a, you know, eight-hour trip from one side to the other. So geographically, I think uh, networking to keep in touch with what's local uh, is going on, what, what trends are happening, whether it's case volume, um, from a from a practice standpoint, uh, to, for this education, it's a it's a convenient way um, to get our required CEUs. Um, I will say Tennessee certification or Tennessee licensure. Uh, I have mixed messages about the licensure, but um, the way it was written. We have to have 15 category, or we have to have 15 CEUs per year, um, which is a little more uh, restrictive than the 45 every three. So we have to have 15 every year with the state. So I'm, I'm not really pleased how that was written, but it is what it is. That's how they, they did it in the legislature. And then while I'm a, a, a member of uh, AMSEC, I think that's more, uh, I would think, more <coughs> education and uh, actually, as I become a little more um, involved in some of the things that we're like we're doing today, um, I, I, I would like to see uh, the national membership uh, organizations or societies be a little more proactive for our profession. And I, I hope we get into that discussion uh, later. Okay, John. Yeah, I'll just keep it brief. I mean, I um, I I'm, I'm a member of of a. AMSEC in the academy and, you know, mainly because I want to support our organizations, they do need financial support to, to stay in existence. It would be a pretty devastating blow to our, to, our, uh, to our field if we didn't have these societies in place. And um, basically, I, tr I do it mostly for, for educational reasons so I can get involved with and get access to the educational side of things. That's the main reason for me. Mm -hmm. And? I participate for the education. Um, I, I feel like the academy, I, I, I'm more active there than AMSEC, but I think they do a, a great job with students. Um, those presentations and those students presenting papers at their meetings, uh, it's a great way for them to enter that profession, our profession, and, and know what it means to have mentors around them that are so supportive of their presentation, their efforts. Um, you know, it, it makes me feel very good about our schools and the type and the caliber of um, students they're putting out there and the fact that they, you know, can put together a presentation, very good presentations, and, and deliver them, even though they're probably very, very nervous. Sure. I think to, to do that, it's putting yourself out there. And so I like the giving back and the education of that and the, the fact that you're, put, you're mixing new with maybe just out, seasoned, you know, experienced, and everyone's collaborating and supportive. Mm -hmm. So I, I enjoy that aspect of it. And I, I also, both those um, organizations do put out uh, publications. Uh, if you're a member, you do receive their journals. Um, I have utilized those in, in just you know, writing present, you know, papers or presentations, making presentations. So I think there's something worthwhile there. And again, I have to agree with John. I, I feel like it would be a disservice to lose them if we didn't have a professional society of any kind. Um, I just, I don't, I feel like we need, we need it. I agree with that. I agree with what you just said. That that very point, and that's a, I think it's a very uh, poignant, it's a very poignant uh, statement. 
Uh, I mean, full agreement with what John and and both said. I am probably an example of that because I was told to join the academy by Charlie when I was, you know, a very young perfusionist. I had, you know, I started on staff before I even graduated, which is a whole nother, that's an ethical dilemma. But Charlie, you know, he was very, you know, started both professional organizations. And so Charlie Reed was a lot of things, which I'll talk about a little bit in my talk. But um, just, you know, we got to present our case studies. We got to present papers as students and new graduates, met lifelong mentors. You know, that's how friends with John Tumazian and Mark Caruso and Aaron Hill and Jim McDonald and on and on and on that helped develop, you know, my commitment to education and, you know, I'm a, involved in education pretty much my whole, you know, perfusion career. And so I think it's part of our um, responsibility. Agreed. So that's Agreed. Why Jerry Dobbs, don't forget him. Yes. Um, Another there's so great many good guy. Mar Mar you know, the Richmonds. In anyway, there's so many. And AMSEC, I'm not as involved in, but I, um, I am a member and was a member and then not a member for many years and rejoined um, some years ago and feel like it's important. I can't, you know, ask the students to get involved in their professional organization so they can make change and be proactive about our profession. I do think what you said, our professional organizations, we need to do better about marketing ourselves as, you know, an allied health professional that has great skills beyond just being behind the pump. And Absolutely. so, you know, it's kind of hard for me to tell students to pay their $15, $25 while they're a student and I, you know, I need to support our organization. So that's why I do it. So why are you not? Um, <clears throat> well, you're making me think I should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not against We've it. We've convinced uh, you, kind well, of Joe. Think you should pay for their professional. Oh, get that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we get a commitment on camera? <laughs> I won't. What, uh, what Matt said uh, was, was really, uh, when you said, what if they weren't here, you know, that's what makes me think. You know, that, that would be very bad. So, you know, I don't have a good reason other than uh, I just feel very busy. But I wish I had a better answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not, I'm not against it. I wouldn't like it if they weren't here. I think they do, uh, they do legitimize, you know, our profession. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a good thing they're there. So supporting them would be important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if Joe will pay, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tammy. Um, I, I actually don't have a very good reason either. Just one year I didn't renew. I can say that um, I didn't utilize really the resources that were available to, available to me when I was a new perfusionist, when I was a member of um, the society. And I think that's probably why I was like, well, I didn't really do much with it. But, you know, I do see the value in it. Uh, it would be very sad if we did not have professional societies. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, Patrick. It mm -hmm. legitimizes us as uh, professional people. And um, I, I, I really feel like you've all made a compelling argument uh, as to why they're important. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think so, too. Um, of course, I have maybe, of all the people here, the strongest feelings of which I'm going to probably reserve a lot of those uh, in the interest of uh, being politically sensitive. Um, I think one of the things that perfusion has as a challenge, regardless of what perfusion society we have, is that we are an extremely small fraternity. There are roughly 4,300 perfusionists. And when you talk about lobbying power, uh, which is what you're talking about legislatively in that regard, 3.4 million nurses have a lot of power. 4,300 perfusionists have next to none. Um, I've seen the dark days uh, where, Deb, of course, you were around too, where they were just taking anybody who seemed to have some aptitude for being able to turn some knobs, and we don't need these perfusionists anymore, and we're just going to train in-house and train people to run the pump, and that was it. And of course, that didn't work out too terribly well. But you know, you have to be incredibly well-trained and very, very intelligent and a really good 
problem solver, to be a good perfusionist. It's not as simple as it all looks. We make it look easy. Um, very quickly talking about the uh, students giving lectures and their nervousness. I do wanted to bring, I wanted to bring that up very quickly. I tell people this all the time and it's just, un, it's fundamentally true, is whenever we go to work, just like you and I the other night when we were at work, we had an audience. We work under scrutiny or under observation or being evaluated by how we do something, not necessarily in a, in a, in a, a, in a student educator context, but we are, we are performers and we have an audience and our performance is going to be graded by the audience, not necessarily whether we decompensated, the patient didn't survive the procedure, uh, but how we conduct ourselves, how we acted. Now, was I nervous? Yes, I was nervous. I'm always nervous when I'm turning somebody who's ECMO dependent completely off ECMO, clamping and cutting their lines in half and having to reattach it. I'm under the clock. We were under the clock at the time, and there's a lot of pressure, but you have to hold it together and do your job. So I think students giving lectures in what ever form it is. I don't care whether it's here. I don't care whether it's live in an in-person meeting. I don't care what resource it is. I don't care if it's AMSEX or some other, or, or the Tennessee Perfusion Society online programming teaches them early in their career that I can do this. I can operate under pressure because every time you go on bypass, you're in a performance and you're the star of the show until you come off bypass. And then, you know, obviously the surgery is very important, clearly, that's why we're there. Mm -hmm. But there's that block of time where it's us. They can't do their job without us, and the result of that job is what their reward or what they're judged on later, that the patient went on to do well. But we have a block of time, it's just us. So I think learning early in your career in a supportive environment to be able to get up there and just be a nervous wreck and do it enough times to learn to do that and do it well helps you tremendously in terms of running the pump. That's my view. Um, credentialing versus the legal thing, this whole issue of AMSEC offering these micro uh, certifications, whether it be the autologous blood management person or whether it be the ECMO specialist, to me, that sounds like a real conflict of interest. I mean, they're not the ones certifying perfusionists, and they're, what are they providing that is, other than taking an online test, which is an online test, um, how do you grade that appropriately? I'm very uncomfortable with a professional society versus a something like the American Board or KHAP or whomever making that determination that this person has demonstrated the appropriate qualifications to practice this. And it's like physicians. You go into a hospital, if you're a, 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 an orthopedic doctor, you, know, you, can, you can put a patient on ECMO. If you're a doctor, an MD, period, you can do anything. You can do heart surgery if that's what you want to do. It does the hospital credential you to do that. If you're a physician, you're a physician. It doesn't mean you're capable of doing it, but legally you can. It does the hospital, will they credential you for it? Go ahead. Hey, Joe, can I, can I say something? I'd like to get the panel's input on this if we have enough time. Uh, about five years ago, when I took to the road, decided to be a uh, largely a traveling, uh, you know, ECMO perfusionist. I got called to go to an account out of state, out of Florida, and I they wanted all kinds of documentation. They wanted my diploma, you know, my CCP uh, update, updated. They wanted all my liability. They wanted my immunizations, and then all of a sudden I couldn't go because I needed a state license. I went out and got the state license. This was a very rigorous process, as you know. 
So I finally show up on this ECMO to relieve the, uh, to, to do my shift, and I'm relieving a respiratory therapist, no knock on respiratory therapist, I'm relieving a respiratory therapist, ECMO specialist, who has none of the credentials that I was required to have. They don't have a CCP, and they don't have a perfusion state license in that state. So, mm -hmm. you know, to Very me, I realize why this happens. I realize we have a tremendous need. We can't do it all. But at some point, uh, how undercut do we get to ourselves? Yes. Well, for, that's. For mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point. So my, you know, my complete summary, and I'm not going to say another word about it, is I think AMSEC and the American Board are both. I mean, the American Academy are both needed organizations. I agree 100% we need a professional society. But with that said, as I said, I'm going to try to be as politically sensitive as I possibly can. Both of those societies also have a responsibility to reach out to the community at large. When you look at the numbers of participants in those organizations, it's remarkably very low. And that is for a reason. Um, so the society, in my view, has to, one, of course, be an advocate for the best care of patients, not any one individual member. Notice the membership as a whole, not in, an individual, right? And uh, I think that they also have a responsibility to reach out, be more inclusive, recognize that diverse thought is extremely important, and not just be monolithic in their approach that we're the only ones that should be doing X, Y, or Z. That, there's my final thoughts on that. Well, I, I agree that there's got to be a reason to join. You've got to get something out of it. They've got to offer something that makes you think that this is worth your time, mm -hmm. worth your money. Um, I know that I have coworkers that didn't think the academy was open to you. You had to be invited or you had to be a fellow or something like that. It's, and that, that's not true. So mm -hmm. they, they need to represent themselves in terms of what can we, you know, why, why should you join and, and maybe market a little bit better. I know we've mm -hmm. had those discussions with the academy for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And be more, as I said, be more inclusive. You can't just <coughs> make it a good old boy club or a girl, whatever the case may be, you can't just have these are the same people that are always recognized and always this and that and, you know, uh, we should be the only people providing education. I mean, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons puts on a meeting, but you know how many other meetings they have? And, you know, they outnumber us. You know, the, ST, the, the, the cardiac surgeons in this country do outnumber us, but not by a whole lot. There's about 52 to 5,500 of them. So they are a little larger than us, but not by a large margin. So, you know, I think that we have to become more inclusive, I think, on both sides. Mm -hmm. I see your point. I agree with you. The value of professional societies is critical. I wouldn't want to see either of those societies not exist, uh, but it's a two-way street. I'll meet them in the middle. Mm -hmm. But they got to move towards the middle of themselves and become way more inclusive with the rest of the overall perfusion community that is out there. Mm -hmm. My view. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Fair enough. Yeah. Well. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> Come on, Deb. <laughs> you, you say that they need to reach out to you and be more no, inclusive. Not me personally. I'm seeing us as a community. Absolutely. So. How how do they do that? I mean, if the I'm just, I'm going to use the academy as an example because I've been in the academy since you know 1985. The academy is available to everyone, and like Ann said, we do need to do a better job the academy on making sure that everyone understands it's open to everyone to join. Mm -hmm. But how do I mean reaching out to you? I, I mean in, inclusive. It is inclusive of, of everyone. The academy stays, you know, the mission of the academy is education. Well, now you and bring a good point up. I don't know a lot about the academy, so I have to, I have to plead some level of ignorance there. Quick question, should we have two professional societies, or do we need one, one that represents us? Is it AMSEC or is it the academy? Or is two, does two make sense? So 
I don't mean to interrupt you, but it's a question that I have that's germane, I think, to the conversation. Well, Debbie Adams, perfusionist, not a member of either one, think there's value with both, and their missions are, are different. And I think we need two professional societies. And I think, um, and that's, you know, just seeing how they both work and what their missions are, I feel like that it's important for us to have, have both of them. Well, if they have different missions, they serve different purposes, yeah. I guess, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. And, and, what, but, and what does reaching out look like? That's, that's kind of, you know, you okay. say, they so, need to reach out to me. So like I said, I'm trying really hard <laughs> to be. Am I forcing you not no, to No, you're putting me in a bit of a quandary. Matt, I hope you're enjoying this. John, I see you smiling, <laughs> so you're probably enjoying the hot spot that I'm in, too, the seat. Okay, I'll, I'll just sort of throw it out there even though I think that this may be unnecessary, um, but you're asking me. Joe so. Basha, please join the Academy. <laughs> I probably would join the Academy. I'm not sure I would join AMSEC. Um, so, you know, AMSEC has, and, 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 and this is an example, I think, and there's several of these examples, uh, but I'll just give you one of, as I said, many. They have an event calendar. There's somebody else that has an event calendar. I am banned from advertising or putting on their event calendar any of these programs. And there's two such event calendars out there where I have been contacted directly by these people and told, you are not permitted to advertise your programs on our event calendar. That's not reaching out. That's kind of pushing away. Um, there are some other things, as I said, there's examples of things like that, you know, who, you know, these nominations and so forth for Perfusionist of the Year. I mean, we're all pretty smart. We see, you know, well, if you were a member, you could change things from the inside. But I've been a member before. You can't change anything because, well, you're not an officer. You have to do this. And there's always this carrot that's dangled that keeps moving farther and farther and farther mm -hmm. away. And I think you have to have inclusiveness. You have to have a set diverse thought processes. You have to have uh, people who are willing to be a counterweight to something that seems like the norm. Um, and I don't see that. What I see is just a group of people that all rah-rah each other, and it's always this same group of people that are doing the same thing, and it's not necessarily, in my perception, in my opinion, in the best interest of me as a professional, in my view of the professional atmosphere that I have to work and operate under, um, or even uh, to some degree, some of the uh, consensus statements I don't find to be in the best interest of what I view as patient care. So it gets pretty deep, and I think that they need to be a little bit more. I do will look into the academy, because I know the academy is different, and I have to claim some ignorance there. I'm not 100% sure I agree with you that a, that a group of 4,300 people needs to have two separate uh, societies. I think that's very complex. I think you just answered the question why we need two separate societies. Yeah. One, one what you just to talked you. about. Yeah, one, one, appealed, yeah, one to appealed to you and one did not. And it well, also it didn't appeal to me yet. I haven't joined. Well, I think I'm going to look into choice, it. I'm willing and to, what yeah. you're looking for. Yeah. I'm willing to. I'm willing. That, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah they have different fair. mission statements and so therefore they might attract different people. Um, but I, I, I do see your point. I don't have any personal experience with it, but just as a, you know, regular perfusionist person in the country, um, if you don't feel like you are um, really connecting and being a part of something, that could be a discouragement, for right. sure. Or represented. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A healthy democracy needs two parties to represent <laughs> each other. Ah, it needs more than that. Okay. So okay. I probably shared more information <laughs> than I really needed to. I'm not going to say any more about it, except that I will... I'm open to, you know, to, again, moving more towards other organizations, and I will look more into the American Academy, because actually 
I have I don't have that same experience with them. Okay. Somebody's going to call in about this topic. Oh boy. Yep. I can tell. I it's know. happening. Well, uh, it's probably well, Joe, I can just say that you know what's really true here because I've had this discussion one for a lot of years. When it comes to our societies, you've heard this before, but it really depends on you know what you put into it, what you get out of it. If you don't do anything except send your money and never do anything else, you're going to say, "What did I get out of it?" But you also didn't put anything into it. So that that mantra on that saying applies a lot to professional societies, That's especially true. for fusion. I don't 100% agree with you, John. In fact, I disagree with you almost entirely on that. <laughs> but that's, that's okay. And I'll tell you, maybe I'll tell you why a little later, but I do. I disagree with that because you have to be listened to. You know, you, you, you can try all you want, but if there's just nothing but a brick wall and you can't get through that brick wall, all you're doing is sending in your money. And at some point in time, you stop sending in your money. You know, but, but that's a debate we can have. Go ahead. We have a caller. Uh, we have a caller. Go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a familiar voice. But it's I, Eric. I, 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 wonder. But all you have to do to see the difference between the two societies is look at the quality of the papers presented at AMSEC versus those presented at the Academy. And you will quickly understand that there are two divergent groups. Yes. Well, now try to be politically sensitive because we don't want to say anything negative about anyone. So, um... Uh, well, I, I uh, was not being negative, Joe. I'm just saying that, that the disparity is quite clear. One has one distinct function and one has primarily another. Uh, and that's, that wasn't disparagement. It was really a, a comment on the quality of papers. But that's a subjective judgment on my part. Well, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, that's fair. So I'm assuming you're a member of the Academy. <laughs> I'm an associate member of the Academy about every other year. Um, I have not been a member of AMSEC for very many years and not likely will ever. That's my personal opinion on the subject. Mm. Uh, well, that's a perfect illustration of why there's two societies. Yes. Right? <laughs> Eric, you're, you're, exactly. you and Debbie... Oh, what am I called? You and well, Debbie are... Shut up and quit, quit. <laughs> you and Debbie are making me... I'm, I'm going to probably have my checkbook out before the day's over with the joining <laughs> right. the American Can Academy. Mine? We're here. Yeah, yeah. We're a part of uh, this. It's worth, it's worth looking at. And um, that's my point. It's worth watching it. I think so, too. Thank you, Eric. We appreciate your call. We appreciate right. your participation today as well. So, Matt. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, you've been so quiet. Shut down. I'm going to put you on the spot before we close this up and move to Debbie's talk. <coughs> Where are you, by the way? You look like you're at some airport. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, actually, uh, I'm actually in a conference room at, at Vandy. Good oh, for you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so what's your view? Just very quickly, we'll wrap it up. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't, I don't think that 4,400 or 4,500 people uh, need two professional societies. I do understand that they do have two different, um, you know, uh, charters. They, they, their, their, their purpose are different. So I, I do understand that, you know, I would just like to see one concentric. Society, and I hope we get in the, into the discussion a little bit uh, later. I, I would like to see what the society is actually doing for the profession, as yeah. opposed to just giving education. And, um, and, and I think it has to do with markets. And um, I, I'll just leave it at that. Hmm. Okay. John, any final thoughts? What you get out of it is what you put into it. That's what I thought. Couldn't disagree with you more, John. <laughs> Couldn't disagree with you more, John. All right. Okay. All right. I think we're ready for Deb Adams' talk about give, it's this very topic, giving back. <laughs> giving. What a giving, segue. Giving, I didn't yeah. giving to receive. <laughs> I've been set up. Oh Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in wherever you are. I, I enjoy face-to-face um, -face meetings, and so I really hope that uh, next year we can all get together because I enjoy the breaking bread and sharing a cup and, and talking with, with everyone. But I, I appreciate you, Joe, for including me in, in your conference, so thank you for inviting me. Um, Joe asked me to talk about this topic, and so uh, I thought about it, and I was like, he, I think he's trying to set me up, but it's okay. 
This is not the first time. I'm really not. It's not the first, <laughs> time. first time. Um, but he wanted me to talk about the unique position and privilege um, of being a perfusionist and the responsibility uh, that goes along with our profession. And so I, re you know, I thought about it, I reflected, and, I, and, and so I see the responsibility of our profession and the actions of all my colleagues and my friends you know, every day. And sometimes I see some behaviors that uh, are challenging to me to, to understand. But you know, I have to, um, at the end of the day, only look myself in the mirror and say what I did right and what I did wrong and what I can do better. And, and I think all of us have to do that. But I, um, I kind of flipped it. And I look at the responsibility is the privilege um, of our very unique profession of perfusion technology. So that's kind of uh, how I want to. So it's going to be a make us pretty proud of what we do because I am proud of our profession and I am humbled and privileged to be uh, all of your colleagues. So for me, it started uh, actually at the Texas Heart Institute where all of uh, a lot of the THI grads. This is where we started uh, not only our skills and knowledge but our professional attitudes of, of what that means and. Um, you know, I can't talk about uh, responsibility of profession without talking about Dr. Cooley. Uh, Dr. Denton Cooley um, is the founder of the Texas Heart Institute. He dedicated his life's work to eradicating uh, the toll of cardiovascular disease and established the Heart Institute uh, for this mission uh, to promote education, to promote research, and to take care of the cardiac patient. And he did that every single day of his life as a, as a, a physician. And uh, those of us that were privileged to work with Dr. Cooley saw that in his behaviors every single day. He was there 6 o'clock in the morning or probably earlier, and that's what time we'd show up, and he was already there uh, rounding on his patients every single day, weekends included. Though he didn't uh, not make time for his family, there was always a Sunday afternoon, of, you know, from, from talks from his family that he was present there as well. But I remember um, one of the many floods that we had in Houston, and I happened to be the call girl, so I was, you know, riding it out. And Dr. Cooley showed up with his neatly pressed scrubs rolled up to his ankles barefoot. He walked to the hospital and the flooding waters so that he could take care of his patients. So uh, example of what we model uh, are professional behaviors. And, and, uh, and you know, promoting education specifically for our profession. Uh, Dr. Cooley um, helped establish and did establish the Texas Heart Institute School of Perfusion, which next year in uh, 2022, we will be celebrating 50 years. Wow. So it will be 50 years of wow. educating perfusionists. And so I think that's, that's a um, half a century. That's a half a century. And so not only for THI graduates, but for everyone, every perfusionist should feel proud about the fact that you know, we're not that old of a profession and that we've had a continuous um, uh, program for 50 years that's been supported um, by the Institute. So it's a celebration not just for THI graduates, but I think for, for everyone. Uh, yes, and that, I hope I think you know, that is great. So. It's an icon. I remember, I mean, it would, you know, I, it's an icon. The Texas Heart Institute School of Perfusion is an icon. Yeah, and, uh, it really you know, is. And, you know, we, which Charlie was the founder of the school along with Dr. Cooley and Dr. Keats, and, uh, you know, he's from the Ohio State, and I was really sad when the Ohio State program closed because another. I mean, that was the first school, and so it was very sad when that program closed. So, you know, we want to carry the torch um, for, for all of us. So I, mm -hmm. I hope to hear from THI grads out there, <laughs> your <laughs> thoughts. And so can't talk about THI without talking about Charles Reed. Uh, Charlie Reed was my program director. Uh, he was our uh, chief when I went through school. And uh, I, sh I share this quote um, about Charlie that was in an article that D Dr. Cooley wrote. And um, he was autocratic, he was abrasive, 
He was an extreme disciplinarian. I suffered all of those things. <laughs> but he also was extremely um, charming and witty, and he wrote poetry, and he collected um, you know, art and uh, grew beautiful orchids um, that he had Terry Crane steal from South America, which is a story <laughs> all into itself. I'm not sure how professional that was. Um, but his dedication to our profession and his pursuit of excellence in our profession is why, along with all the others that, you know, Jerry Dobbs and Richard, uh, you know, Mark Cruz and so many, but Charlie um, was passionately and uncompromising about our professional responsibility and the development of our uh, professional societies, our certification. And so you can have an opinion about Charlie, good, bad, indifferent, and it's usually one or the other. But we are an established pre profession, large in part because of, of Charlie Reed. So, um, uh, but he, those of us that trained under him, and the, in the THI way, uh, part of your responsibility to learn skills and knowledge is also your professional responsibility. And it is a privilege. And um, that was instilled in, in all of the people that trained under Charlie. So, And so I can't talk about THI without talking about the best class that ever graduated, <laughs> the December class of 1984, which was my class. And uh, we were a band of brothers. Uh, yes, the profession is small, um, but with this group of friends and colleagues, I learned um, how to be a team player. I learned how to be responsible and accountable and how to own my own mistakes. I learned how to be humble. I learned uh, friendship. Um, I learned how to be supported. I learned how to receive. Um, because you can't really give of yourself until you learn how to get a gift. And that was hard for me. Um, I, you know, I kind of want to always give, give, give. But it's because I don't know how to get, get, get. So um, still uh, some lifelong friends in this group. Sadly, some of my uh, classmates are no longer with us. And I wanted to share on uh, the American, the, uh, the board has a, a website, at the, well, a page. And you should visit that page. It's a really uh, thoughtful page that they've added. And so they have uh, listed you know, uh, our comrades, our colleagues that are no longer with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're doing some, um, some articles about people you know, uh, honoring them and in memory of them. And I, I encourage everybody to, if you haven't seen it, to, to actually go there and look and, and just do some reflecting. So, so anyway. Uh, whoever's out there in the class of 1984, love you. <laughs> so, uh, just uh, I would like for everybody to reflect, and you know, honestly, I'd like to hear some stories because it is interesting when you hear the different paths of how we got to this unique place of being a perfusionist. So, uh, all of you listening, do, I'd like for you to just reflect on your path of how you got introduced to perfusion technology and who influenced your unique position of being a perfusionist, who that person was. And think about your personal journey and your mentors and um, who you're mentoring because that's part of our professional privilege of being a perfusionist is not only uh, uh, gain, gaining that knowledge but also sharing. And so uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge, because I have the platform to do it, the person that um, gave me the chance, and that's Nancy Anaz Hicks. And I know she's retired now, but she talked Charlie into giving me a spot uh, mm -hmm. in that class. And um, it's, I wouldn't be here without her. And I model the way I teach and the way I talk to my students um, with how she taught me. She was kind and thoughtful, but she was all, always present, even though you didn't know she was there, but she'd appear. And she gave me space to um, make mistakes, but not ever hurt anybody. And she encouraged and, and uh, 
she was a wonderful teacher, and so thank you, Nancy. I love you. And so I hope that all of you, you know, you know reflect on who taught you. Billy Applegate. There you go. So <laughs> I'd love to hear from, from everybody, or call them, or send them a message. He yeah, said, well, definitely. I can't, I, I can't send them a message. <laughs> you don't want to hear from me. <laughs> I, I, if I could send, if I could send him a message and he would reply to it, I, I would probably join him second. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was it, was, and I don't have, you know, here I don't have the numbers, but Joe knows them. When you think about how small our profession is, with there's 4,400 certified perfusionists, and then you think how many cardiothoracic surgeons will, you know, maybe 1,200, like 12,000 currently. Yeah, 500. In yeah. the United States. Yes. yes. Okay. But worldwide, you know, and maybe a third of that pediatric, you know, cardiovascular uh, surgeons. And then um, anesthesiologists, that's going to be what? There are a dime a dozen. Okay. <laughs> so just, you get my point. And then you said maybe millions not. of nurses. So a maybe, uh, you know, 900,000 um, uh, cardiovascular nurses. I mean, I don't know. I tried to. Google it and mm -hmm. find a number. But I guess the point is we are a small band of brothers. We very are so. a very small profession. And that is a unique privilege to be uh, in this. And, you know, it comes with responsibility. But it is, uh, you know, um, I think it's worth it. It's been a great career. Somebody just said Sal. Yeah. Got to add Sal to that list. Exactly. Sal Gretcho. Of course. Yeah. So just sharing, uh, you know, the AMSEC code of ethics. I know we talked about our professional organizations, and these are just the code of ethics from AMSEC, um, that we need to uphold the dignity and honor of our profession. We need to respect the patient's rights and dignity. Um, the third one I'd like, hopefully, to get some discussion about. Uh, we should provide only those services for which they are qualified. So that goes back to, you know, the training and the certification, but also our responsibility to, to make sure that we are proficient in the skills and knowledge and behaviors that are encompassed in our scope. So I don't take this to say, oh, I don't do those kind of cases. I don't do that. Somebody else needs to do that. That you need to make sure that you educate yourself so that you're qualified to do mm -hmm. that. So I'd like to maybe get some feedback if possible on that because I've had some conflicts about that over the years. Mm -hmm. um, well, I will tell you, I don't do pediatrics. I don't do babies. And it's not because I can't learn. Probably can't learn now. Um, but I think it's unique. They're not little adults. No, And I not. think that's a, such, a, mm -hmm. such a different subspecialty. And I think... Uh, it would be, uh, it would be um, probably uh, uh, a dangerous level of hubris for me to think that I could just go do some kid. Um, I think it would be, you know, baby. I think that would be Absolutely. inappropriate. Yeah, well, of course. I would hope that if you're not, for example, a pediatric, experienced in pediatric mm -hmm. perfusion and you took a job in pediatric perfusion, yeah. that you would then be Absolutely. trained and mentored right. and do all those things. Right. We are qualified to yes. do those things, sure. but that doesn't right. mean that you're experienced mm -hmm. enough to be, um, you know, on your own right away. Now, someone showed up at our hospital, and it was a pediatric, a very small pediatric, and they, they, they ended up there, and I had to do something. You know, there is the phone a friend. So I'm on the, I mean, if we had to do something that was life-saving and get through it, uh, you can't, to your point, say, I don't do that and just leave it alone. So, you know, we are, as you said, qualified, but we're not what we do normally. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So number three here, <clears throat> members shall provide only those services for which they are qualified. What do you think they mean by qualified? Does, does that go towards... Uh, you know, your talk on, on certification and such, you know? That's a good question. It is a good question because it, it, it's a little loose there. Mm -hmm. So what are those services? Um, to me, that's certification, the scope of practice. Mm -hmm. I feel that that's those services 
for which we are qualified. Again, going back to pediatrics, um, you know, talking to new grads that are interested in pediatrics, but they think they need experience in adult perfusion first or perfusion in general. I always tell them you've been trained in this. You are learn those skills are the are the same. They are different in in specialty, but they you, you still learn about tubing flow, how to yeah. buffer drugs, uh, calculate. You learn those things, and then where you go. I'm sure there's policy and procedure, there's specifications, there's the way they do it, there's, uh, you know, their mentoring of you, um, their onboarding of you. So I, I tell students, if that's your passion, you go, you mm -hmm. know, and you, you seek that out because it, you have, you are, you are coming out with those skills. And, but again, the certi certification, I believe, qualifies us. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's up to us as the privilege to make sure we are up on things, mm -hmm. and and if we and you know if we get presented with something or if we're worried that so, or something's going to change in my practice, I need to seek out some friends or some mm -hmm. uh, tools that are out there for me mm -hmm. to keep my skills, get new ones, and keep my proficiency and my competency. Because I I'm I'm sure anybody out there would say you know you do not want to go into something that you feel unprepared to do. Mm -hmm. You know the consequences of not being prepared. Mm -hmm. At least hopefully we do. And, and I think that's instilled in us in training. Mm -hmm. Well, I think too it also applies to what's required of us. We are required to get continuing education. It's not to check a box or, uh, you know, go on vacation, although you can do lots of those things together, mm -hmm. but you should be trying to learn things that either you find interesting and you just want to learn about, or that you can apply and bring back to where you are. Yeah. As an employer, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, 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 a grinding wheel because I want to send people to conferences. I won't say who because I don't want to embarrass anybody. It wasn't Patrick. Um, it wasn't me. It wasn't you. It wasn't anyone at this table. Okay. No one at this table, but I, uh, they, were, they were wanted to go to a meeting uh, that was in Europe. Oh, I know. It was a very good meeting. And um, they were, while the meeting was going on, they were posting pictures. Uh, this meeting was in Spain, but they were posting pictures <laughs> from Italy. You know, you know the leaning so tower of pizza is not hard. So it's very hard to be in Spain and Italy at the same time. Well, I think that and goes. That's, uh, that's, that's one of the things that, that, that as an well, employer is problematic and irresponsible on the part well, of. Uh, well, that's an individual's choice. I mean, they're, they're choosing to yes. not. Yeah. But at the same time, even as an employer, and I've been, I was an employee much longer than I was an employer, I would go to a meeting and I didn't want to listen to every talk. Sure. Mm -hmm. There were sure. certain ones that I just didn't. I, like I have no interest in this at all, but what's my professional responsibility to go to every session of the meeting, go to most of the meeting, go to only those things that I found interesting, which was a limited portion of the meeting? Well, I those think, are debatable questions. Yeah, they are, and I think that goes back to you know your own. You you have to hold yourself accountable yourself. Correct. That, yeah, that's correct. personal. Right, a, that's that personal accountability, and you know if you don't have. The integrity to go to the stay in the same country as the meeting. I'm like, I don't know, Joe. That one's um, that's a no, hard one. one. Thing it was a good talking to. Our yeah. uh, our credentials at the hospitals that we have to have signed, I think, every year by the surgeon say that um, you know we're we do whatever they tell us to do. You know. Yeah. So so I mean, I find myself doing some things that are outside of the scope of practice. Yeah. which is fun, really, but, you know, yeah. I'll just clamp a little. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> true. And I, but I kind of take that, that st statement and the, that those services for which we're qualified it, yeah. as that, uh, to stay within our scope. I, you know, we, I don't think we should be, and this is me personally, uh, should be um, telling, you know, physicians what meds to push. Um, I'm not an anesthesiologist. I'm not. I, I don't. I haven't had medical training. I'm trained as a cardiovascular perfusionist. You know. So I think uh, if they ask my opinion about, you know, let me flow more instead of 
get, you know, pushing a presser, then that, that's my opinion. So I think it's staying within our scope, and um, that's how I read that. Not necessarily so that we don't start practicing, like, doing things we shouldn't. Should mm -hmm. we be, you know, taking leg vein? Should we? If you're trained. If, if you're, you're trained. If you're they, trained. They do do that in the... Uh, if you're I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm personally the Navy, not trained, trained, and therefore yeah. I don't find that within yeah. my scope of yeah. practice. I shouldn't and be... I've I proven shouldn't. myself incompetent so that they won't ever ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Yeah. So, I, again, I, I think these, these are, you know, standards that we have to hold ourselves to. I, I think, you know, the last uh, statement here ties into what Ann talked about, uh, you know, promoting uh, and our, our standards and then uh, in, being included in education research and presentation publications, and that takes participation in our professional societies and I, I think it is part of our privilege and responsibility to participate and then you personally have to choose where that participation is and with what group I'm you know it's really exciting to me to see so many state societies and other societies and if that's where you feel like you get value and you can give then that's what I don't think everybody has to be a member of AMSEC or, or the Academy or, or both it's just you know I think that's a professional responsibility that you you have to choose so so um, I, I when Joe asked me to do this I then I started thinking about well, what what are the values and mission statements of you know my colleagues my friends and so I looked at a few of the perfusion groups and I looked at your mission your mission statement and so I decided to um, kind of include that in this talk so Thinking about your own group that you work with, what are the Perfusion Team core values, and you know what, and I think all of us have some of the similar you know core values in what we strive to do, and and these are the hard ones, uh, and I would like feedback on how do you assess and teach that to a young professional, because as an educator, uh, teaching uh, the skills, we have the curriculum, this, the knowledge is in the consensus curriculum, and then we talk about professional behaviors, those behaviors that encompass being a professional and being responsible to our profession, and those are, you know, uh, intrinsic in some people, and in others they, they have to be um, developed, and that's the harder thing to do, and I'd like some feedback, especially people that have um, hired some newer graduates or older graduates um, from years back, and what what did educators do right, and what, how can we do that better? But um, looking at core values uh, for a uh, perfusion team, uh, of course, integrity is always on the list. And um, this is a picture that Terry Crane actually had put up on the class board, you know, the board for all the students to, to look at, um, that reminding us that integrity is doing the right thing even if nobody's watching. And we all do really good stuff when somebody's watching us, but <laughs> when nobody's watching, do, do we behave the same, the same way? Are, are your behaviors the same? When you drop that connector on the ground at 2 o'clock in the morning and nobody's around, do you pick it up and use it, or do you As long as it's within of five seconds. Five <laughs> seconds. That's okay. a cool world. A piece of your skin ends up on the inside, yeah, inside of the in. reservoir. Yeah, if there's not blood and skin on the connector, I mean, but you have to make a decision. Gosh. It depends on what's going on. But, yeah, that, that one. So, again, um, doing the right thing. And that, I think that kind of assesses all of it, at this responsibility of this unique profession. If you don't have integrity, then it's tough to do all the other stuff. So the other one that's always seems to be on everybody's core values and missions is accountability. Your willingness to accept responsibility for your actions. And this includes your per personal and professional accountability. And this kind of goes to what Joe was sharing with his employee that 
went to a meeting, but they weren't at the meeting. They were in a different country. They were in a different country. But um, I would like some feedback from the audience about um, when you have someone on your team that is reluctant or projecting blame or, or not blame, but responsibility onto others. How do you redevelop that skill, that professional behavior? Or is that one that you're either accountable or you're not? I've got a thought on that. Yeah, I do okay. too. Okay. So, um, because when you've got students and you're teaching them, you know, they're apprehensive and, you know, they want to look good and they, want, they don't want to be, you know, shamed in front of their peers. But that's a hard one to do, and you have to learn how to do this if you're going to do it uh, and be the professional in the room telling a surgeon, you know, stop. I've got a problem back here. What happened? I messed up, but, you know, patient, mm -hmm. do no harm. The patient's okay. I can fix it mm -hmm. instead of just not saying anything. Well, you know my favorite saying, right? What is it? Not enough to look good. You've got to be good or no good. <laughs> I should have put this in here. That's a good one. That's he says a it a one. lot. We should, we should have t-shirts. Mm -hmm. We should. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. Then we wouldn't have to say it. Huh? Yeah, you wouldn't have to say it. Okay. This uh, other core value, uh, availability and responsiveness. Yeah. And this one, um, not only to react quickly and positively, and being attentive, being present for your patient, and be accessible for your patient. You know, we have to remember that these are um, our, our patients that we're serving don't know who we are. We're total strangers, and they're giving us the, the, the privilege of taking care of them. These are real people, real lives, with loved ones that depend on them. And they depend on us, and they may never even know who we are. And to me, that is the ultimate privilege, that responsibility, that privilege. And I know you all, um, as perfusionists, um, agree with that and feel that. And if you know, that's that's worth it. You know, the sacrifices that we might feel that we make. It's this responsibility, this privilege of of, of serving a stranger. Um, and um, well, it's not just even serving the stranger, right? They are completely vulnerable. So we're right. complete, the advocate, yeah. right? We have to be their advocate mm -hmm. for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And we and we need to be, you know, trained and skilled and practice our skills so that we can react. And like like you were saying the other night, you and Joe had to change out that ECMO circuit. <laughs> and it's like, okay, let me. This is the real deal, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so. but, yeah, it, yeah. but it wasn't, but you know, handled professionally, could, you know, couldn't freak out, <laughs> didn't mm -hmm. have to act like, you know, didn't know what to do, uh, had a plan and did it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the cornerstone of our unique privilege and responsibility is education. And, and we talked about this earlier as our responsibilities to uh, being participating in our professional societies. But our uh, commitment to lifelong learning, absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, that commitment, I think, even more so in healthcare and especially in perfusion technology because it is dynamic. It changes. We've all seen changes over our careers. And it's getting really interesting. Um, it's fun to teach these young professionals because they have, you know, uh, they've grown up with computers and iPads, and so their their brains are multitasking. And it's really fun to uh, watch how they absorb all this new technology. You know, we're getting all these new fancy pumps with all these, you know, intricate things that control them and I still want the knob so I can hold on to <laughs> That's it. That's what I want is a knob. <laughs> I want the knob. <laughs> Just let me turn it on. Mm -hmm. the, I wanted to share this picture. Terry retired. I see him. I see him. You know, you can use your Terry's finger retired. and with the laser. Oh, I, I Just don't want to mess it, it up. Just, Just hold touch it. it and hold it. There, there he is. is. There he is. <laughs> and he's got his boots on. They're all spiffy and shiny. You can see him. 
he comes back to the classroom to share his pearls of wisdom and tidbits of knowledge. That is the privilege, but the responsibility. I mean, he's the, he walks and talks it. And he comes back to share, and they're, um, as you can see, they're mesmerized by what he knows and what he gives. So he continues to share his skills and knowledge, and uh, we are so fortunate that he chooses to do that in our classroom, at uh, our school. So uh, this is a picture with our, some of our current students with Terry there. So, um, and talking Sal. of, Aww. yeah. So when I think of the epitome of the responsibility of being a perfusionist in this unique profession, uh, this picture is perfect for me. And it has three people that I, I respect and love. Um, and are the epitome of responsibility. Uh, Jim McDonald is a perfusionist um, uh, that is a Canadian perfusionist, but a colleague, a lifelong colleague. He trained in the 1960s when perfusionists were called lung, heart-lung technologists um, <laughs> before the, the word perfusionist came to being. Um, Jim is... Um, a mentor and he's got a unique perspective on the the role of a mentor and a mentee and how what how much you gain from the student and the person you're mentoring and that special relationship and so uh, Jim continues to support the THI School of Perfusion he was in he was in industry before he retired he was involved in uh, the development of the Canadian uh, perfusion professional societies in their professional education process and certification. He was a past president of the American Board. He's an Academy member. And if you have not uh, read his uh, Charlie Reed Memorial uh, speech that he gave while he was president, I encourage you to go to the Academy website and read it because his words uh, will, will touch you as far as what a privilege it is to be a perfusionist and the responsibilities that come with that. So Jim McDonald. Uh, I hope you're on the lake in Canada enjoying a nice beverage. But, <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Sal Grecho, my partner in crime, um, Anne's husband. Um, he was a wonderful friend, but an incredible educator. Sal gave it every time, every day, to every student. And so when I think of the epitome of responsibility to educating others, they're, you know, along with Terry, but Sal, I mean, he, he was it. Um, he could take really uh, difficult situations and um, explain them in a way that, that students felt like, you know what, I can do this and I can be really good at it. And he was honest with them about, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly of our profession. But Sal was always present. He was there for his team. He was there for his surgeons. He was there for his friends. Um, and um, he, uh, I can't think of anyone other uh, as than Sal Grecho as far as you know, when I think of um, being uh, a responsible, unique, incredible person, and I miss him. Um, but Sal, uh, I know you're smiling, so cheers and to you. And for those who don't know, I mean, in case anybody doesn't know, Sal is Ann's husband. Yes, and, I uh, did mention that, but I might not have said it loud enough. I didn't, I didn't hear it, so I'm I apologize sorry. for it. No, that's okay. Yes. You may have. I just didn't hear you, so yeah. I just wanted to mention it again. Yes, and he was a perfusionist at the Heart Institute his entire career. He spent his entire career of all... Uh, close to 30 years teaching students. So of the over 900 perfusion graduates from the THI School of Perfusion, Sal's taught almost all of them, nonstop. So yeah. kudos <laughs> to you. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the third, uh, it's just so, you know, perfect picture because the third person in this picture is, is Terry Crane, who if you look 
up responsibility in the dictionary, you're going to see a photo of Terry Crane. He dedicated 46 years of his life to perfusion, to the profession of perfusion, as a clinician, as an educator, as a leader in innovation, in design, in development of product, in manufacturing, as the program director of the school for many years. Um, his passion for emergency preparedness and for us to be uh, skilled, knowledgeable perfusionist is um, bar none. Um, he is a member of his professional organizations. And um, I think the only thing we think of with Terry is, do we have to be that responsible? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> the bar. <laughs> yeah. The bar is really high. Oh, my wife's in labor. OK, call you back. Can't leave. Bye. <laughs> That's Terry. He did, oh you know, he went home to make sure the baby was breathing, and he came back to work. So. <laughs> Uh, so Terry's retired, he's enjoying his life, uh, but he is giving back to education and will continue to do so. So uh, thank you, Terry Crane, for sharing your tidbits of knowledge and pearls of wisdom with, with all of us. So. so can I ask a favor? Sure. Matt is, he has to leave shortly. We're running a little bit behind. Sure, absolutely. Could we do yours in two parts? Sure, absolutely. And let me let Matt get his done. Absolutely. And then we'll come back and we'll finish your medical mission stuff because I do want to see that. No, yes. tomorrow's medical mission. Oh, what's today? Is this your last slide? No, but no. I want to hear Matt talk. Would you mind? No. We've got plenty of time, time. really. We're, we're good. No, we do have time? Yeah. I'm okay. We're, we're fine. Okay, well. Magic was telling me again. Magic is the the uh, magic once again. Magic is telling me that I had needed to g get you on. He's so, a time management keeper. It's a job. So we're okay. Yeah. He's doing his <laughs> it's job. A thing. Okay. All right. Let me let you continue. Okay. So please I'll forgive finish. me. I'll finish. No, I. No, I'm not trying to rush you. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I got sandwiches. <laughs> Matt, thank you. I appreciate you. I, I just quickly want to talk about making sure that we're, re that we're all responsible to ourselves and our families. Because mm -hmm. uh, part of this privilege um, is also making sure that we take care of ourselves. Take, take care of your physical, spiritual, and mental health. So you don't have to fall on the stake every single day. Um, you know, teaching our students that though they call it work-life balance, which Cherry does not like that. So I n I'm never going to say that if he's a present. But you do need to give yourself gifts. You do need to be um, take time off to you know, give yourself a gift. Take a trip. Just stay home and you know be with a friend and have a cup of coffee or a cup of something else that would well, you'd like to share. And be present. Be present with those that love you and with those you love, so that you uh, can come back to work and give and be responsible because it isn't the easiest profession, which we all know. Mm -hmm. And what I shared earlier about being open to receiving, let people be grateful for you. You give a lot. We, this has been a tough year for everyone. You give, give, give. Let receive also uh, and, and do that with gratitude. And don't and forget to do that. Absolutely. Be humble and kind in how you receive and how you give. Absolutely. So, so in closing, I just wanted to share this. Um, this is a picture that hangs outside of the, the school door. Um, it's a picture of Mary Martin, and in the, her quote, it says, "My sincere appreciation for the privilege of being a member of the first team, and I want us all to continue to um, um, enjoy the privilege of being a member of a cardiothoracic team." as a perfusionist, because it's a unique and wonderful career. And um, I thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. That's incredible. Is that, is that, a, is that, the, is that the coffee pot? That's the coffee there? pot. That's the coffee wow. pot. That's the yeah, coffee pot. That. Wow. There it is. In action. In he action. stole that from, uh, from uh, uh, what's that guy's name up in, he was up in Mayo. Not Lily. Dodgerill, the other guy. Lily High. Well, Lily High, he was the guy that worked in Lily High's lab that originally came up with it. I can't remember his name oh, now. Oh, goodness. Oh, You're going to ask can't me remember. hard questions. It'll come up. But uh, great pick of Sal. Thanks. Say that again. 
You're not talking about John Gibbons. No, no, no. That was no. The coffee pot was from Mayo. I'll think of it later. I can't remember. I, but I, um, but uh, they had uh, Cooley saw it and was like, "Huh, that's interesting." And came back here after visiting when them up Galetti there. When Galetti was it? When huh? When Galetti was it? No, I don't remember, but it that doesn't matter. He worked anyway. with Lily High, okay. and um, Dr. Cooley went to a somebody uh, out there to know. A, uh, a, yeah. a restaurant um, supply store and bought that coffee pot. That's a percolator. It's yeah. really what it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To bubble up that yeah. gas. And uh, and made it, and uh, so they made it by hand. Yeah, yeah they made it in there, and Cooley, they made that. So and it worked. Yeah, it did. It mm -hmm. worked. Yeah. We have so many things to discuss. A lot, but I'm gonna just turn it over to Matt. Matt, go forth and conquer, please. <laughs> and uh, the floor is yours. But there's two burning questions that I'm getting from folks online. One okay. of them is, why did OSU's perfusion program close? Is one of those questions. Um, and uh, I'll look for the other one. But that's so you may want to be thinking about that in your talk because you're going to be talking about, I think, uh, uh, the perfusion market, where it's going, new schools opening up, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and when you asked me to do this talk, you know, I, I, I am not, uh, you know, on the perfusion programs director's council, never have been, you know quite a few people that are, but, um, you know, I, I, I do have a little bit of a, a, a background in business. I have, uh, I have a, a, a business degree as well, post-perfusion degree. And so uh, this talk is really more to present facts and data um, that is, and, and maybe more importantly, that is not available and, and discuss the holes. Um, and then, you know, take a, a broader look and really discuss the scenarios that may or may not happen in the future based on some of our actions uh, as, as a profession, um, as individuals, and as a society. Um, but, you know, perfusion, you know, it, it you know, there's big changes, Joe, and, and the, the panel there. You guys have a lot more experience than I do. Um, you've seen the market change um, uh, in perfusion. And when I say market, you know, business definition is a service that takes place, um, you know, resulting in buyers and sellers being in contact and want to know, you know, you know that and sometimes there's mediating agents. Uh, you know, we're getting into perfusion contract companies, uh, large, small, indifferent. Um, but, but, you know, perfusion market, it's always been a buyer's and a seller's market based on supply and demand. And, it, you know, and it's an evolution of things, you know, there's highs and lows uh, in the market. Um, and some are good uh, for the perfusionists. Some are good for the, uh, you know, the buyers. Um, but really perfusion, you know, I see the service as a commodity. And I don't want to discount our, our um, what, what I want to say, I don't want to discount our, uh, individualism and our skill set, um, but the service really, um, because of the ACPE, KF, and a lot of the management of, uh, of of the education process, it is a commodity to where you know uh, it's it's got fungibility to where you know they're interchangeable parts. Um, every perfusionist that graduates after they you know after they take their boards. You know, they should really be nearly equivalent. I, and I heard someone talk, talk earlier about, you know, we were talking about pediatric uh, perfusion. You know, is that a separate um, entity uh, or should that be a separate license? Well, you know, when everybody graduates and passes the board now, they're nearly equivalent to a baseline threshold. And there's really no regards, uh, you know, who produced them or where they were produced. Now, there are, I will, I will say there's distinguishable differences. But everybody should have a, a baseline or a threshold that they meet, and so that's kind of what I want to I want to wrap up about. That's kind of my preamble to this talk. So next slide. So you know, I, I, I try to do some research uh, concerning where we're you know where this is at, um, and really, there's going to be a nine there's nine hundred thousand open heart procedures going to be done this year. Um, there is a little bit of a bump because of COVID last year, and uh, in that 900,000, don't know how many of those are going to be affiliated with a perfusionist. Uh, you know, there's tavers in there. There's tavers that perfusionists cover. Other places, tavers don't get covered by perfusionists. 
Um, but there's no doubt about it that there's about a 5% increase that's happened and will continue to happen through uh, 2026. So the you know, estimates are that 1.3 million procedures, cardiac procedures, are going to be done in 2026. It's a 5% increase. The, the best study that I found out there um, is INJECT. It was a 2019 study published in 2020. Um, it talks about uh, you know, vacancy rates, turnover rates, the profession, salaries. Um, it's the most contemporary thing we have. Um, but I, what I found very interesting, and, and this is, you know, this all relates back to, you know, where is the market going? Where is our education going? Um, the most common response to address the critical shortages from the people that were polled, um, they want they want to hire temporary staff. So they want, you know, they want traveling perfusions, or they want, uh, you know, PRN perfusions to come in to help with these highs and lows, uh, you know, whether it's uh, shortages because of maternity leave illnesses, short-term, um, you know, peaks and troughs within their practice. Uh, that, that was the number one answer uh, to, uh, or one, number one solution to the problem of, uh, you know, critical shortages. Um, the other one, uh, you know, next, they talked about uh, total compensation, of raising the compensation, whether it was in bonus structure or, you know, uh, some sort of uh, additional hour compensation, kind of a, a gap coverage type thing. Um, provide temporary incentives that, that came along there as well. Uh, but more importantly, uh, and we, we've done this here at Vanderbilt, we've changed our staffing model. And so, you know, that was also an alternative, although that was the, the least, uh, that was the, the, the least, uh, I guess, uh, mentioned a solution to the, uh, to the clinical shortage. Um, and, you know, the vacancy rate that they talked about in the study, which was 12.3% uh, mm -hmm. across all perfusion Large contract perfusion groups uh, were the, the highest in vacancy rates. Uh, pediatric perfusionists were the lowest um, in vacancy rates and turnover. Um, a lot of a lot of that uh, has to do with you know the round robin or domino effect of jobs. It's the same jobs that are always opening. But what I thought was very interesting, if you if you would say that there was a 12.3 percent vacancy rate or a 14.7 percent turnover rate in any professional medical professional society that, that that that's a that's an extremely high uh rate so i i'm unsure if we can you know correlate perfusion with nursing perfusion with anesthesiologists perfusion with cardiac surgeons even uh, even though the, the the numbers are similar cardiac surgeons uh, you know you, you mentioned joe earlier that the the nursing staff uh, across the country is no you know much, much larger, we're, we're not even a drop in that bucket. So when we say, I don't think we can really correlate our numbers, uh, our, the percentages, with any other medical profession. So I'm unsure of the value of those numbers. That's just my personal opinion. Um, and then the other thing I found very interesting in this article, uh, it says that uh, the likelihood of bringing in perfusion students to help out with quote, labor involved in the practices, uh, they were very, very much against that. And I found that very interesting. Um, it, it was just, it was the least popular choice among the respondents uh, to mitigate the staffing shortages. And uh, I, I did get a quote out of, out of there. It was, it, with, with combined, these answers appear to show a significant headwind to the expansion of clinical sites for perfusion training programs, which leads us into our next problem. Next slide. So what we're, what we're running into here, if, if you look at these numbers, these are what we know. This is published, uh, AB, ABCP and the report. And if you look at the numbers, um, you know, I think they show the last 19 or 20 years here. Over the last six years, we have generated nearly 200 new certified perfusions every year. But more importantly in those six years, We've had an average net gain of nearly 100 from what we have new to what we have lost in the same period. And more importantly, in the last three years, it's been greater than 100 gain. So I'm unsure, um, the, the, I'm unsure if this trend is going to stay the same, um, if it's going to change or people going to retire. Um, 
And in, in the next slide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose some questions. I'd like to have some people's input and thought processes, especially the panel that we have today, on their thoughts of, on the ebb and cycle they've seen in their careers and what, what they think the future holds. Next slide. So what we have here is these are the, these are the 17 or 18 accredited uh, that are on uh, the KHEP site. Now, I will say that I've been told, and I will defer to the panel if somebody knows more, I believe Barry is closing um, shortly. Yes. And then uh, the University of Utah and then the University of Texas Health Science Center, they're on the, they're on the, the, the KHEP website. Uh, but additionally, there's another five programs that are, are opening or going to open within the next two years. So you're looking somewhere in the lines of between 20 and 22 programs that are going to be available. Um, one of those programs are, are looking to have 40 to 50 students per class. Um, and so when, when you're seeing these type of numbers and these type of programs with the, the numbers of class and the students, it seems like the trend of the ABCP's annual report, it's only going to increase. And uh, the number of perfusionists are going to continue to increase that are uh, being put out there. The real question is, is will, they, will they outpace retirements or people getting out of the profession? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide. So what we don't know. Like I just stated, will perfusion graduates overcome the rate of perfusion retirees? Um, in, in another study uh, that I'll, I'll reference here later, uh, they talk about that almost 39% of perfusionists in 2015 were going to retire within the next 10 years. Uh, when you think about that number, 39 that's 40%. So it's, it's nearly 2,200 perfusionists at that time, um, at, at maybe a little bit under 18, 1,900. Uh, in 2015. But the real question is, is we had some really dynamic worldwide events that happened in 2016 and 2020. So 2016 had the economic crisis. May, people may have pushed off retirement because, of, the, uh, because of, the, of their savings and their retirement savings. And then 2020 with COVID, did we push more perfusionists out to get out of the field early? Or did, did with the economic turn down in early 2020, did we, did we push some people back later in retirement as well? Those are the questions that you know, I think are still to be answered. And then will the profusion of workforce be able to keep pace with the increased cases in complexity? By, by far, we are getting sicker and sicker pa patients every day. And those procedures are taking longer and longer. Even though the surges, uh, you know, are, are, are technology is getting better, I think technology, you know, breeds a, a better, uh, a better clinician. Uh, the, 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 I think the patient's acuity outpaces the technology, and we're, and we're doing more and more on people that are sicker and sicker. Um, additionally, what's the impact of ECMO on perfusion? We talked about having different certifications and having uh, ECMO technicians. Um, I, I think there is a need for that, but I don't think, uh, personally, I think a perfusionist is the perfect uh, you know, trained person uh, to, uh, to be able to manage multiple ECMO patients at, at the same time. Um, and so I think with the increase in COVID uh, ECMO uh, this year, I just wonder how many, how many perfusions we're going to need to subsidize uh, the increase in volume of ECMO patients. And then it turns, you know, that turns into burnout. When you, when you, don't, when you can't have more people or you're asking people to work more, even with compensated or not compensated, how much does that attribute to, to burnout and people getting out of the profession as soon as they can? Um, and, and then the other question I see is having students come in, would you Google perfusion or you Google um, what, is the, what is the highest paid postgraduate profession out there? Perfusion is definitely in the top five. And so are we getting perfusionist uh, students that are coming into the field because they're able to Google, um, you know, what the income level is. Uh, are, are people getting into the, I, I question uh, sometimes, are people getting into the field because they really want to do perfusion? Or, you know, they Googled, Googled something that's good, pretty be, that's lucrative as of this moment. Uh, that, that's the real question I have. Next slide. And this is a study, um, I think, 
if anybody really wants to, it, I think this study uh, and, and this review was outstanding. Uh, uh, Mr. Colligan wrote this and um, with with some some help, but it was it was published uh, mid mid uh, mid year last year in Jack. Um, I think it's spot on uh, on everything that they say. I I, I completely agree. Uh, but one of the more important things I, about it is, is what I've highlighted here. Um, it says, in summary, we just don't have the answers. Uh, we're such a small society that just a little bit of movement um, in one direction or the other makes big ripples. And um, we really don't have anything other than the 2016 workforce study um, that I've seen uh, that, that really can answer any questions. And we've had such uh, such a change in some of the dynamic structures surrounding not only the, uh, the, the involvement of the number of cases that we do, the type of cases we do, ECMO increased, down, decreased, but also the age of our profession. Um, you know, at Vanderbilt, the, age of, uh, the average age on our staff, uh, we have 11, uh, the average age of our staff is 52 years old. So, uh, you know, that's not to say that um, anybody's retiring sooner or later. I just think as a whole, the people uh, that I see every day and then the people in the surrounding areas that I know, whether they're in the city of Nashville or across Tennessee, we, you know, we have an aging uh, population of professionals uh, in the state of Tennessee. And so I kind of burned through this a little bit because I, I really, I, I think I gave data and I, I was able to do some research and bring some numbers uh, and data to light. But I'm more interested about the discussion surrounding this because I think you, the panel here definitely, and John um, via you know the web, I'm sure everybody has their own experience of what they went through with the periods of the, in the 80s. Uh, you know what I've been told is there was a, a gluttony of perfusionists uh, available in the in the mid 90s, and you know definitely there are shortages, um, or at least there are mentioned shortages, and. We'll get into the discussion. I'd like to hear what people think about, quote, the shortage that is upon us right now, and if that is really true. So uh, cool. I'll, I'll, I'd like to open the floor up to uh, with the conversation. So let's let's go to the four-panel view, if we can. And um, while we're doing that, uh, we'll get everybody on board here. Or no, I guess it's the three-panel, not the four-panel. Oh, there it is, the four-panel. Yes. Hey, dude, that's pretty slick. Yeah, David like is it. really good at this stuff. Hey, John, you're back. Matt, thank you for powering through that. Um, I know that uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, delay your other one. I think in the interest of your time, our perfusion uh, students receiving adequate training. I think maybe that's a topic for another day, but I think it can be included in the discussion. Um, the first question, if you remember, is does anyone know why the OSU uh, uh, program closed? I have people asking online. And then also another question, and this could be to Deb or or Ann, or Ann or you, anybody that knows, um, is is there a method for reporting integrity or unprofessionalism uh, in uh, someone's behavior and uh, I guess professionally, and to whom and what does it really mean and what does what happens when you do that? <laughs> um, to the question about the Ohio State program closing, I think uh, it had to do with a similar situation. And I, I, this is just from secondhand knowledge of, of the institute. It had nothing to do with the, the, the program. It was in good standing. Um, it, the university at the university level looking at you know programs that, because it's quite expensive to run a perfusion education department um, because you have staff and you uh, just something that Matt said 50 students that's incredible that's I mean you need almost 4,000 cases just to get them their minimum of 75 cases so I don't know exactly how they're gonna really do that unless they have like a hundred clinical affiliates but I it had nothing to do with the Ohio State perfusion program it was more of a broad brush about allied health professional mm -hmm. programs at the Institute which happened to the University of Texas Health Science Center program which was mm -hmm. UT with Texas Heart which some of us graduated at from in the 80s and, and 90s they mm -hmm. just did away with a lot of their certain level um, 
mm -hmm. you know, academic program. So. Abs yes, I understand. So it was, it was, sounds like it was more like a financial decision on yes. the part of the university. But, yeah, the university not had nothing to do with how wonderful that program mm -hmm. was. Which brings yeah. up uh, Matt, John, Ann, Tammy, because you remember going to training, mm -hmm. okay? So you, so there's, there's, in my view, this is just my view, you have these financial interests, you have private practice perfusion companies that need people, you have the community that needs a certain number of people, you have institutional practices that need people. And so the question then becomes the risk to patients when we don't have enough people versus the quality of the care the patients are going to get by virtue of the, the wellness or the, 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 the intensity, if you will, of the training that the perfusion student gets before they go out and start practicing. And so there's all of these very, um, very complex moving parts going all around. And then, of course, for those of us that stayed in the business or those of us that still have 10 years, 15 years, maybe 20 years of practice left, what is that going to do to your professional standing with the market becomes flooded, your salaries, your benefits, how you're viewed versus as very needed and essential or a dime a dozen, so to speak. So Matt, you want to go first and we'll just go around on that? Yeah, and, and, and so I, I'll comment as well just from where I, I can comment on the Vanderbilt program. You know, uh, um, by 2025, um, Vanderbilt has to turn their program into a, a master's program. And so going from whether it be a certificate or a bachelor's degree to, you know, to a master's program, um, it's, it's quite an expense and, and you know, it's, it's a business. And when, when you, you're caught with, you know, saying you, we need X number of students, well, you, you know, you need X number of students at a certain um, tuition rate to make the, you know, to make the break even point. Um, and, and sometimes when that, you know, happens and the numbers don't add up uh, to, to, um, the point, you know, the program isn't worth having anymore. I will also say that um, a lot of clinical sites that we have in Vanderbilt started putting uh, students at clinical sites outside of Vanderbilt probably about three or four years ago. A lot of those clinical sites don't want, well, I'll just say it, greenhorns. They don't want students that haven't pumped any cases before. They don't want to put them on the rotation. So we at Vanderbilt have been left. Um, with that we take all the perfusion students right out of the gate right. and then once you know they've got 30 40 cases under their belt we'll put them out to the clinical sites um, the other part of that is when you've got uh, you know certain perfusion schools that they're all the you know 90 percent of the cases that they do are at the different clinical sites you're competing with other perfusion programs for those clinical sites right. and there's only so many places out there that'll accept students exactly. um, I mean, it, it, it is not easy teaching students, as everybody on that panel probably knows. And uh, if you've never done it before, what is the, you know, change, change, is, change is hard. And so what is the advantage of doing it and until someone's willing to step off that box and say, no, we're going to be a clinical site because, you know, we, we want to help the society. Um, you know, it, it's, it's tough to make that transition. Well, should we be, you know, and, the, and you bring up such a good, uh, such a good point, you know, should should these other schools be opening or should we be supporting the current schools that exist that are that are established that have you know that have reputations and then that you brought up the point of how are they going to get all of their cases you know mm -hmm. you could make every place a clinical site but if you in the entirety of your training is doing two or two vessel or three vessel off pump one two or three vessel off pump cabbages or warm beating heart you don't do type one dissections if you don't do you know uh thoraco thoraco uh aneurysms if you don't do selective cerebral perfusion if you don't do you know vads or whatever if you're not trained in that then what's your what does your career look like 
where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And are you really trained um, adequately? Now, you may be trained adequately to go to a program that does 40 or 50 hearts a year that are going to be straightforward cabbages. But, you know, I mean, no one's ever, I realize that, you know, like anything, every profession has, you know, some people maybe that shouldn't be in it. But if you're training, shouldn't you be at a place where you're going to see all of that? Well, and what about not everyone is of the right personality or skill set? Skill set to teach new people, um, or may have the motivation to do that, mm -hmm. and it's just a chore. Is that how we want to train our future colleagues? Mm -hmm. The you ones know? that are going to be doing our case. Correct. <laughs> right. <laughs> what a way it's to think scary. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the point that Matt brought up, it, it's kudos to those programs like Vanderbilt and, you know, uh, THI. CHI, St. Luke's, the staff, you know, I didn't give them credit in my talk, but it seemed like your, your team. You're training, the, you know, their first semester where they've not pumped one case. And then after you get them proficient in some skills where you can – give them some independence, then they go out, and then you get that next group. That is exhausting. It is hard. And um, so your team, you know, CHI, St. Luke's team, they are, you know, pros at it, and they, they do it. But it is tough. And so how long do you do that before you throw your hands up and say? And then you don't want a clinical site or an instructor that isn't wanting to do that. Right. Like you said, that, that's, the, that's the key. You have to want to do that. And I respect anyone that says, no, I don't want to do that, as much as having someone say, yes, I do. I mean, that's okay. Yeah. But I think that if we have schools, we already have students trouble, are having trouble getting their cases. Mm -hmm. um, they're competing with other, even students at the clinical site to get the cases, is what I've been told. Yeah. So I understand we need more people in our profession, but... Do we really have the capabilities to put so many out there at the same time? I think the bottom. Or at the same quality. Yeah. yeah. I, th right. I, think, I think any, we have these discussions with program directors and uh, on the board in terms of the case requirement. And I, I and anybody out there, I, I welcome your comment as well. I mean, we just feel like there, there has to be, we can't go much lower in terms of what you, you've, you've got to do the deed. It's, it's a clinical profession. Um, you know, uh, simulation was talked about um, in terms of could you put in with COVID especially. Mm. Um, and all Allied Health, uh, KHAP, th there was a good meeting about that. They all chimed in, radiology, EMS, uh, scrub tech. You know, you can only get to so much through simulation, mm. and you've just, then you've just got to do it. So um, it's a fine line, and I think dilution is really scary. It's concerning. Agreed. Well, yeah. that's what was going to be mm -hmm. my next question. Is it going to be a push to now you only need 50 cases to graduate? You yeah. know, it just, it, that doesn't seem like enough. I mean, it's not the flavor right now <laughs> yeah. among, yeah. among the community. And I mean, I invite anyone to say if they think that, you know, less than 75 is acceptable because I, we all know how we trained and maybe how many cases we did. And um, I would have liked to have gotten more, and I had like 130. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. still was like, oh, I, I really wish I could do 25 more cases before I graduate, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, the way to regulate this. Hey, Joe, can I chime in? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. please. Yeah, so, I mean, everybody on the panel probably uh, seen this happen because you talked about that, um, you know, you have places, and I, we see this everywhere where, they really don't want to hire a new grad. And let me tell you something, that wasn't always that way. In the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and up to the mid-90s, if you were a new grad, it didn't matter really which school you came to. You came out of school, people wanted you. I knew people that came out of school, I'm not advocating this, came out as chiefs. And you know what? They did okay. I had some in my class that way. They did okay. It's unbelievable. And the training by all the schools was intense. They were highly selective with who they chose. They had small classes, and it was intense since day one until you graduated. And it didn't matter where you graduated. You were prepared. 
Somewhere in the mid-90s, there was an inflection point where it changed. And I can tell you what I think, but I won't elaborate now. It started to become a shortage that was pretty critical, and, it, and the school's mindset, some of them changed and started up with it being about volume. How many students can we admit per X period of time, per semester, per every six months, or whatever the school was? When that happened, and they also changed something that didn't exist before that in the mid-90s, which was sending students out to outside clinical sites. 99% of all the schools I knew of had their own major university with their own ORs, and all the fusion staff gave you the same message every day. The message in the classroom mimicked what you saw in the OR, so your instruction was consistent. I'm not sure how it works, to be honest with you, because I was not in that era, that you go to three different clinical sites, none of those people are instructors. They're just practicing for fusionists. And I ask for fusionists many times, are you told different things at different sites? Oh, absolutely, we're told different things at different sites. When the fusion student comes back, I know the schools then debrief all those students, and it's not necessarily about right or wrong. Maybe they can learn something by the diversity of seeing different things. If that's the case, perhaps it's positive. But the minute that it became about volume, all of a sudden, students came out and they were a problem. And I've seen this so many places where everywhere I go, by the way, Matt, I don't know where you get 12%. It's way higher than that, the people that need at least a part-time person. There's nobody out there that says, oh, we're totally fine. Even when everybody goes on vacation and a meeting, we're fine, we don't need any help. I don't run into that anywhere. Everybody needs a, a little bit of help. So it becomes about volume so we can fill warm bodies and seats. And then the quality dropped off dramatically. And then there was tremendous problems. And we still see to this day what you just said is absolutely true. I think it's about 35% of the places out there will not hire a new grad. And I've been to places that will not hire somebody with less than five years experience. I've seen that many times also. So if, if new programs are going to open and make it a, be about volume, we're going to be continuing down this path, I'm afraid. That's my opinion. Well, this is exactly, I'm sorry, forgive me. This is exactly what happened with specialty care, or not, not specialty care, psych work back in that day. And I'm starting to see the exact same thing happen again. And I can tell you the quality of the students that came out of that PSYCOR program, who got selected, you name it, left me with some very deep concerns. And that was way back then. We're talking about the, or the early 90s. Yeah, it, it's a dilemma. And it's something that program directors talk about and, you know, John and Matt, you bring up, you know, interesting things that, you know, are right on the forefront with program directors because it is a conflict of, of uh, you know, do you need to train more students because there's a shortage, but you need to maintain the quality absolutely that your patients and our community expect and deserve. I mean, you want somebody that uh, is has the skills and knowledge and the professional behaviors and you know and I'm going to admit to at, you know Texas Heart our clinical site that was our hub we don't do the number of cases that we used to do and, you know it's for many, many reasons why we don't I'm fortunate where the THI administration say you don't have to take a certain number of students if you want to take two students one okay. student six students it's not about making money or meeting a quota, but that will change when the standards change because Matt mentioned in 2025 the standards will change and it will be an expectation to offer a master's degree when you complete your perfusion education. And THI and Vandy are certificate programs right now and we will have to convert to a master's program which means you have to be affiliated with the institution of higher learning and, you know, and they are not going to let a, a department thrive when you only have six students. So we're either going to have to figure out a way to um, combine programs. This is my personal opinion, not program director, so that we can at, and have the same quality standards that are demanded by our accreditation and our community. We are, that's our colleagues, that's our future, and our patients deserve that. Um, and our surgeons and everyone. Uh, 
I, I just can't see us getting back to 40 schools where everybody's got, you know, two students here, six students here, um, 50 students somewhere else. It's, that's going to be, um, I don't think it's going to be good for anything personally. So that's I don't think I so. have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So if we're, it sounds like it's going to be a requirement. I'm not really familiar with this, so correct me if I'm wrong, that all perfusion schools will have to be master's programs by that date. Is that correct? Well, that's the, that's the discussion. The, because the standards are, and Anne can speak to this because she's on the accreditation uh, committee, they're evaluated every five to seven years, and the push is towards a master's level, but yeah. I'll let you, if you want to add to that. It's, it's, a, it's a recommendation mm -hmm. that um, all programs be moved to a master's. Um, it's been, while, hot, not hot, well, hotly debated in terms of, you know, does it, the market, does the market support that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what does the master's look like? Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is it just um, a paper you write? It, I mean, there, if you look at it now, the, it's, it's ver there's variation. Yeah. So if, you, if that's the recommendation, now the discussion is, what does it look like? And what, what does that entail? But it, but it is the recommendation that it moves that to that level. Well, the reason I'm asking mm -hmm. no, is because if private industry staffing companies, if you will, want to make their own schools, they would have to be affiliated with the university to do that and is it, with that recommendation, correct? I, I mean, you couldn't start the Joe Basha School of Perfusion. Oh. Right? If, if the master's is required, you will have to be. Yeah. So is it a recommendation or is it a requirement? There's it's a, a big difference. It's a recommendation two. now. But when the next standards come out, mm -hmm. there's, it will highly likely be a standard. Yes. Unless, you know, the accreditation committee, which Kay have, uh, yeah, and decides the ACPE, differently. If yeah. they, if and they what, have that recommendation to make so it a Joe, standard. Sir, so it's good I can give you an example right now of what, what Deb's trying to, uh, Deb is spot on um, on it. So, Vanderbilt students, as of last year, can never work in the state of New York. Exactly. What? Is now, that because of the state license requirement? Yes. 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 Okay. Because oh. it's a certificate program, so they don't they don't acknowledge uh, a certificate program because it's not affiliated with a degree bearing program. Right. That being said, and kind of uh, what I'm really concerned about is in what you talk. I've got two other points, and I'll let I'll get off. Um, the point that, that, that John made uh, concerning that you know we're diluting down people, um, that coupled with having the private industry, uh, you know, some of the biggest perfusion companies, um, you know, private perfusion companies in, in the country, affiliating with degree-bearing programs. What what does you know is that is that that, that seems to me like a, a little bit of a cross between church and state, uh, to where you're feeding, you're you're feeding the the market to to line your own pockets. And they they're big enough to be affiliated with these uh, degree with these degree bearing programs. And you know one of those five that I, I you know I didn't want to mention any, but one of the five that are looking to open will be directly involved with. Um, one of the major perfusion private practice groups, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what they're going to do. Uh, history is going to repeat itself, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. What happens to people who are already, say me, I have a certificate, can I work in the state of New York? No. Nope. You didn't grandfather yeah, no, no, in. I, I, yeah, if you, you didn't I grandfather I believe you can. Your grandfather in. Is that the, true or not? The grandfather period is over. Yes. There was a time when you could grandfather in. But now it is based on a degree-bearing program. But yes, right. you would have already had to have your Texas license. New York, prior, New York, New York. Right. That's what I meant. Right. Before I had to know to, about it. So, right. but if now I wanted to up and move to New York, you I'd could. have to get a master's in Ex perfusion to be able to practice exactly. perfusion. So yeah. all all perfusionists in THI's uh, certificate, like Matt said, if you graduated from the certificate certificate program and did not grandfather in, which I think it ended like 2008, it's been a while, mm -hmm. you cannot practice, you cannot get a license in New York. Mm. Which means you won't practice. Right, of course. And so that's a whole lot of certificate perfusion. Can I ask another question? 
when perfusion programs decided to go to a master's program, did the length or intensity or requirements of the program change, or did they just decide to keep the programs largely the same, and now your admission requirements were that you had to come in with a bachelor's degree? Um, that's a good question. Uh, for so some programs, they did lengthen, and there was a lot of discussion am among you know, perfusionist on the committee that the degree was, instead of it rising up, that we were watering down a master's degree. But most programs have to, in, in order to, to, to get that last requirement, are going to have to go at least another six months. So, for example, you know, we've lengthened our program back to 18 months, which it was 18 when we went through. And if we go to master's, it'll have to be at least 21 months. And um, so I don't know, Matt, do you know what Vanderbilt's plan is? They're already like two years already, so I don't know. That we, we are a two-year program, uh, 21 months. Um, but the, the plan is that we're um, going to uh, try to do a master's program by 2025. Vanderbilt, and, uh, Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University Medical Center split about three years ago. And that's where, that's where the, our biggest obstacle or hurdle is going to be is we have to actually bridge across because uh, we're in the allied health care uh, school under Vanderbilt University Medical Center. But we, you know, the medical center cannot is not a degree um, awarding program. So we were going to have to reach out across. But uh, to Deb's point about combining, you know, programs to make, you know, in my opinion, uh, and I'm from St. Louis originally, um, there's 18 or 19 cardiac programs in St. Louis currently, in in a, in a city that's less than a million people now. So. What I can never understand is why do you want 18 or 19 different places doing the same thing? Because no one becomes an expert, in my opinion, that way. And that, that, I'll leave it at that. I, I think cardiac surgery is no different than perfusion education. I think um, you need one or two centers you know, locally uh, to, to do cardiac surgery in a city. That's my opinion. Um, and I think you know, regionally, you probably need one or two different programs uh, in, in perfusion education to do a really good job. So combining programs, I, I would be in favor of that. That is very, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I agree with that 100%. So Matt, in deference to your time, um, I'm going to, uh, just a couple of things before we leave. I'm setting up for the next Vanderbilt Faculty Forum uh, for May, and it's going to be VADS, right, with uh, Dr. Uh, Hoffman. And then uh, if I could, I don't know if you're available this weekend, but could we please try to connect so that we can maybe talk about a, a little more long-term ter long sort of solution to the topics. I think, uh, you know, and I don't think we have to have necessarily, uh, it's a lot of burden for you, but, um, yeah, you're pretty good at doing this. So, you know, if people want to do it with you, I think it'd be great. And I'm probably going to come up in May and help you set up the, uh, the uh, lighting and all that kind of stuff just to make it maybe a little bit, although I like yours there right now, so that's actually pretty good. Even though there's something that's telling me that's not a real background. Something is, there's, a, there's something I'm he's getting. In, there's he's some, in Spain. Yeah, when you keep, are you, are you in Spain? He's at a perfusion <laughs> meeting. Yeah, you're a, that's actually classic. I, I, was, I would say something, but I won't. Okay. Oh, you say so, it, Joe. You I, I, I can't, <laughs> they love beating on me, man. Okay, so I'm looking forward to, okay, if we could talk this weekend, it would be fantastic. I finished the program Saturday, maybe on Sunday, I'll text you and we can maybe get together and just sort of iron this out because Deb is on the board and I haven't sent the application in yet. They're killing me on fees and because uh, there's a late uh, fee now. Ann, Ann, Ann's, Ann's, Ann's on the board. Yeah, Ann's on the board. Deb is not on the board. Ann is on the board. He doesn't even know what he's saying. They're Ann killing Ann me with fees, dude. Board, okay, they're yeah. killing me. I have late fees now. So yeah, if we could talk on Sunday, it'd be great. And thank you so much for your being so patient, so understanding. We appreciate you very much. Um, John, you're going to stay with us, right? And I'm going to go and get Ann's uh, last lecture done. We were short yesterday, so we're going to run over today, which should make up for the board. So I'm trying to we're stay. We're staying legal. I'm trying to stay as <laughs> compliant as I can. 
It's been a great conversation. Matt, thank you. Uh, thank you, and, uh, yeah, I'll go get uh, uh, Ann's last talk ready, and then we'll finish it up. Thanks so much. Thanks, thank Matt. Thank you. So thank even you. though he's gone, there's one thing. I, bye, Matt. Bye, bye Matt. <laughs> and, I, and I will answer that second question, Joe, that you had while you're getting me set up. Is mm -hmm. for um, you, There is uh, an ethics committee uh, on uh, part of the American board, so if there are um, things that someone wants to bring to us in terms of what they might think is an ethical violation, those, those are taken by us and they are looked at. Um, you know, we will not uh, take an anonymous <laughs> yeah. uh, outreach. Uh, it, it's it, not a you, hotline. You will have to um, <laughs> take responsibility for, for making that, um, for reaching out about it. But yeah. there, there Contact the American Board if you do feel that there is something that needs to come up that way. We do have an ethics committee, and um, there are there is a code of conduct and a code of ethics when you receive your CCP. So um, there is not there is structure there. Yeah. You got to oh. answer that. So what is the what is the teeth behind that, Anne? I mean, in other words, let's say it's really something. I mean, it's really an egregious offense. Um, usually, hospitals are gonna they're gonna take your. Um, they're going to take your privileges away. There's going to be something that's going to happen to you. Um, but uh, what what teeth does the board have? Could they pull your certification? Yes, they can. They could pull your CCP. Of course, uh, you know that's not what we are about. We like to right. award certification and recertification. Yeah. <laughs> we don't like to take it away. Um, and it 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 is a rigorous overview, and it certainly involves listening to all sides you know mm -hmm. I would have to say if, if things do come up it's it's usually around how to uh, re rehabilitate or, or oh make better mm -hmm. yeah it's mm -hmm. it's not to punish right yeah so right. it's because I know the nurses you know nurses have very strict you know it, 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 for example let's say it's a uh, it's a uh, substance abuse issue you are going on, now they don't try to fire you either. It's very hard to lose your nursing license because not unlike us, if, albeit they have 3.4 million of them versus 4,300, 4,400, whatever it is of us, um, they're still in a shortage, we're in a shortage, I mean, those are just realities. So, um, but they put you on a program immediately. I mean, there's no joke. And they will pull your license it's very difficult to get it back, big long process. Uh, but it's hard to lose your license. Mm -hmm. You have to really be doing some bad stuff. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is in the in regards to perfusionists, if somebody is doing something that warranted someone reporting them to the American board, they're likely losing their privileges at a hospital and that's career ending. You know, really, most of the time, if you lose your privileges at a hospital uh, for some egregious act, the chances of you ever being privileged at another hospital is slim to none. Right. It's usually, by the time it would, you know, perk up to us, things have happened either locally or within their company or, or whatever that right. have, you know, precluded what's going to their future. Agreed. And I had one last thought, um, and this is notwithstanding, I think this is not the case with children. So we're not talking about children. We're talking about paid, um, well-trained, educated, perfusionist, professionals of any stripe. I don't care what you do, but I'm talking about people like us sitting at this table. I fundamentally believe that you can teach anyone with limitations, obviously, they just don't have the capacity. But you can teach anyone to do almost anything. But you can teach no one to care. That comes from yourself. You can teach children the value of that, integrity, and so forth. But once you reach the age of maturity, and you're doing what we do for a living, I can't teach Patrick integrity. He can teach. He, he knows what's right and what's wrong by the time he reaches the point where he is. So I think he can teach anyone to do anything, but teaching people to care, I think, is an impossible task. Well, I think you can model behavior that people can then be affected by. It's not that well, the, and that, that would be mm -hmm. kind of the question you're asking, or you were wanting feedback about what people do with their teens. Um, it just starts by, you know, walking that talk. 
But holding people accountable is not the same as teaching people to care. Well, but, but I think... Accountability and internal, um, uh, uh, you know, your sense of individual integrity and pride is from within. That, that can't be... It can be influenced externally only in the sense of your actions, not how you feel. Mm, I don't know. I disagree with no, that. but I think you can influence the actions I so that, that you can... That much you, you can do. You, I, I don't know that you can teach empathy, but you can teach, I think, behavior so that you behave sim well, with sympathy and caring. And, yes. And I think people, you can influence that. Fair enough. And people can be surprised by behaving a different way, it might be rewarding to them in a way that they didn't they think it know. would be, and then therefore they choose to change. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. then, they're, Agreed. then they're on board. Yeah. Right. Okay. Wait. And oh. one last thing on Matt's talk, because I really wanted to ask a question. Um, so a perfusion student who graduates still can't take the boards until they have completed 75 cases. Right? They can't graduate. They, yeah, they can't graduate. They can't graduate. Right. Okay. You need 100 cases, I think, to take your oh, boards. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. No, it's no, 75. 75. 75 to take your boards. As well. Oh, so. Your first to take your basic science exam. To take your. The part first, one, the part academic. One. Oh, okay, part one. Okay. Then if you're going to go on and complete it and take the clinical applications part, you have to be practicing post-graduation and have 40 cases. 40 cases, okay. Thank so you. it's 75 cases. To graduate. That's to the graduate minimum. and take the basic science exam, yes. 40 cases post-graduation in order to take the practical mm -hmm. or what well, used, used to be, to the, be orals. the orals. Right. Yeah. Yes. And you I wish we would go back to that. And they also I have think that was to the have best thing 10 could ever do. pediatric, at least 10 pediatric observations. So of that 75, if you don't pump pediatrics, you, you have to have an additional 10 minimum observation, observations. Yeah. And some programs have even, that's the minimum, yeah. even right. higher. So some programs even have a higher so requirement. Mm -hmm. than you that are required to, graduate. to do pediatric rotations? No. Observe. But well, that would be a rotation. to get yeah. those observations. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's yes. required. It is it's required. a standard. Because I, I just remember, it. like, I, I really enjoyed pediatric rotation, and so I opted for additional pediatric mm -hmm. rotation. Mm -hmm. But there were many of my classmates that did not care for it at all. But they were, I, I don't remember, I'm asking, were they still required to do a certain amount at that time, or is that something new? I don't remember the standards right, when you back. went through. Because I felt like I was asking for more, and they're asking for less. So yeah, I just but it is a curious. standard now, okay. so I'm okay. not real sure when. Well, the bottleneck on, on new, new perfusionists coming out and being certified then is, is that first 75 cases, can they get those in time? Mm -hmm. So if that standard were, were lowered, then we would be getting more perfusions through, plus we would be getting less less quality patient, uh, perfusions coming out. I mean, it depends you can on make your, the argument right. for that. Right. So, it depends but, on the program, right? Yeah, the control of this whole thing comes down to how many cases, you know, do they have to do in school uh, to graduate. Mm -hmm. And you guys set that at the board, right? Well, but I think it goes back to what John was saying, though. You know, then that shifts the, you know, that shifts. Because if you, it's reps, like Ann said. So it shifts to the, 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 the employer to then continue train to develop and train that, that person. Just and then John mm -hmm. just and made a point that, idea. you know, that's so, not And I don't think 75 is enough cases. I don't either. Yeah. Yeah, so I, don't, I think going lower is, is foolhardy, and I, I can't support it's, that. It's, it's hard. They're, you know. Mm -hmm. 75 is, you know, it depends on the student. You know, some of them get, you know, but it's hard to get get a rhythm down with 75 cases. It took me 250, right. and I did 300 before I, before I was allowed yeah. to graduate. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, when cases. you went through, John, what was it, several hundred cases? I don't remember. But. Uh, it, was, it was a lot. It was yeah. A couple, three, four a day. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I was with a group. I was uh, not employed, but I was subcontracted with a group in 2016 out of California, in California, and, and that group there hired uh, a new grad master's, master's program, one of the ones that was on the list that you were showing there, I won't mention, and I thought she was a wonderful student and started talking to her, because I like to talk about the students, talk to the students about, you know, what's the latest and greatest that they're learning in school, 
And she said, well, I thought my education was terrible. I'm like, what are you talking about? She came from a master's program. She goes, most of the cases that we didn't even do, we didn't complete all our classes. She had all these things negative to say. She was a, a very strong student. She was good. She, we, we, they kept her. But um, she didn't have a whole lot of good to say about the fact that um, you go to your rotations, and they don't necessarily get to do the case. Um, mm. And I can tell you, um, back to backtrack what I was saying in the mid-'90s, um, I absolutely had to try to hire somebody. I hired someone from one of these volume-based programs. I had to sit with that student for 12 months oh. every day before I could let him free and my surgeon would let him be there without me. So wow. this is the kind of things that go on where people don't want to hire new grads because of the impression. And it doesn't take a whole lot of bad experiences in our small community before word gets out. And that's what's happened over the last 25 years, I'm afraid. Well, we just hired two great ones. We did. Lydia from your program, mm -hmm. Ramsha from up at uh, Rush. Uh, Rush. And so with that said, and the slides are yours. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. We're <laughs> just going to. My sandwich is growing mold. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about STS database, uh, predicting morbidity, mortality, and cardiac surgery. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll move pretty good through this. So again, um, how do you risk stratify in adult cardiac surgery? I'm sure you've heard your surgeon say, my patients are sicker than everyone else's, or patients are sicker in general. Um, so anyway, how, how do you quantify that? Um, there's been a lot of tools out there over the years. I remember running some Parsonet scores not too long ago. There's something out there called the Euroscore. But, but how do you uh, standardize, and how do you compare apples to apples, and how do you kind of put some structure around, around this? So the so Society of Thoracic Surgeons, established in 1964, um, again, trying to deliver quality of care, collaboration, education, research, advocacy. So they started a, a database. Uh, first, the first was adult cardiac. Now they have uh, databases for congenital, um, thoracic and on and on. But the first one was uh, adult, 1989, and it was started as a quality improvement initiative. So let's, let's start collecting some data. So to date, uh, I looked on their website a couple of days ago, uh, about 6.9 million patient records in that database. And each of those records, uh, and, I, and I do a little bit of abstraction in STS in adult cardiac, so I can tell you there's over 900 data points in mm -hmm. each record. So not, of course, wow. not all of them get filled out depending wow. on the type of case, but there's a lot of data being um, put into that database. And so you can only imagine um, that that database is considered a very rich uh, place to go for research, for any type of trending. So it's, it's very important. Um, and they actually started, because of all that data, you can obviously run lots of statistics, statistical models, you can start doing some things. So they started developing risk models in 2008. So just to kind of give you a little bit, and I'm sorry for the numbers on that slide, uh, they're a little hard to read, but um, this is participation in the adult cardiac database. And you can see um, as of summer of 2019, 165 participants, United States, you've got Canada, you've got some international going on there. And if you look at the uh, map, the darker colors are representing over 100 different programs or participants. Uh, as you can see, Texas right up there um, with California in terms of the amount of participants, and uh, followed closely by uh, Florida, Illinois, I believe Pennsylvania. So again, uh, a lot of participation. I believe that um, STS will claim that they are capturing about 90% of all cardiac surgery being done. Yeah, I think awesome. there's 1,100. And 50, about 1,150 programs in the United States oh, that so it's do open-heart surgery. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so there, so almost all of them are, are submitting data into mm -hmm. this database. So it's it's pretty robust and very representative. Of what's going on? So right now, if you were to um, look in the adult cardiac surgery database, they will they will pull out seven different categories that you can risk model in. So again, isolated CAB was first. Um, it's still the majority of what's being done. 
in, in adult cardiac surgery. Then uh, isolated AVR, AVR plus CAB, your mitral valve replaced by themselves, then with CAB, and then isolated mitral valve repair and repair with CAB. So those are your uh, seven risk models. Again, of course, we know a lot's going on in heart surgery besides those seven, but that's uh, what they have collected data on and have been able to make risk models out of. So those are our seven. So what happens with that is through, through risk modeling and risk adjustment, the, the you know, world of statistics, which gets a little overwhelming at times, even you know, for those of us that kind of like numbers a little bit, they, can, they have been able to come out with uh, rating your program, mm -hmm. a star rating. Okay, I know you guys have all heard about it. Um, your hospital probably knows their star rating. It's very important. Um, and this is kind of how it's made up. So if you look over on the left there, it's a, you've got an overall rating. Uh, two, uh, three's the best, one's the worst. And you have four domains that, that make up that rating. Okay, so that's what the bottom four all get rolled together and give you an overall score. So you've got a medications for isolated CAB, use of mammary isolated CAB, then the absence of morbidity and absence of mortality. So that's how those are starred individually, but then all rolled up to give you an overall. Okay. And if uh, just to make it easy, uh, three stars it means you're performing significantly higher than the STS mean. Two star, you're average, doing just the same as most everybody else. One, you're, you're performing significantly <coughs> lower. Okay? okay? So those are your, so those, that's the star rating. If you want to break it down and know what those domains look like, obviously we know what mortality is, but um, sometimes it depends. It's uh, 30 days post-procedure or during the same hospitalization. So you can be hospitalized longer for 30 days, still have a, you know, pass away, and that would still be a mortality, even if it was at day 65. It was the same. You didn't check out and check back in. Right. You were, it was the same hospitalization. And then for your morbidities, the five are renal failure, prolonged ventilation, reoperation, stroke, and deep sternal wound. Again, a lot of um, definition behind what that means that you can find on the STF website. Then use of the mammary. There is some exclusion criteria for that, obviously, uh, reoperation couple of other things, uh, mediastinal radiation. Question from Joe. Just very quickly, can, can you say that again? So if you're in, if you have a procedure and you, you are in the hospital for 30 days and you do not die, but you die on day 32, it is or is not a mortality? If you've been discharged yep. and it's day 32 after your procedure, that will not count. But if okay. it's day 32 in your hospital and stay, still, still in, in the hospital, then it counts. So that doesn't. So it's only you would have to be discharged, like to an LTAC or to correct some other hospital within the hospital. Like I've seen that before, where they take patients step who were in the ICU. They're not stepped on. It's actually a hospital within the hospital. Oh. Like I've seen that model, and they transfer the patient. It's in the same hospital, but it's a different hospital technically, same building and they move them to that unit and, uh, yeah. Like an inpatient rehab. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's considered a discharge. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even though it's in the same facility, they've mm -hmm. been discharged. Okay. okay. So if that, so there's, there's some nuance in there mm -hmm. and people would argue maybe some gamesmanship skewing. going on there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gamesmanship skewing, okay. Yeah. You answered yeah. that question. Yeah. So. Just, just so you know, had several discussions around is something a mortality or not mm -hmm. over yeah. the years with, with, uh, physicians and clinicians. And then your medication bundle for isolated CAB, it is required to have a beta blocker within 24 hours of incision, to be discharged on one, to have a post-op antilipid prescribed and antiplatelet. And that antilipid does need to be a statin. Of course, there is contraindication um, documentation that can exclude that, but those are required unless contraindicated through documentation. And it's a one and done. You miss one of those, you fall out in that entire bundle. So the pre-op beta blocker question is, that's why it's always asked, right? And if it's not yes. given, it's because they're bradycardic. Right. And if that's documented, that's an exclusion. Okay. If the patient's emergent, that's excluded. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of nuance, yeah. but I'm just kind of giving you the facts. Right. <laughs> gotcha. But we can certainly, if 
You've but I mean, I know that's something we all hear. We may right. not know about the other things, but we I definitely so. hear that one. Because it's, it's considered kind of low-hanging fruit um, in terms of, you know, anesthesia. Well, there's a lot of pushback that I'm just giving a gra um, you know, milligram. Yeah. What, am I, what am I doing? I'm just satisfying a metric here. Yeah. You know, am I really yeah. doing anything? Yeah. But it's, it's been around for many, many years, and it doesn't seem to be going away. So it's mm -hmm. still required. So then of, of those domains, you can see where the weight is. And if you look at <laughs> mortality, it's 81% of that weight. Mm. So again, um, you've got to be doing really, really well to get a three stars. Mm -hmm. About 5% of all programs are able to achieve that from um, one reporting period to the next. So it's pretty rare air as we describe it. Mm -hmm. You can see morbidity is 10%, the mammary seven, and medications around three of your gotcha. overall scar. So just to look, these are some from the latest national reports. It's a little busy, but it's taking all seven of those risk models that we talked about, and it's showing across the five morbidities, and then if you would have mortality and morbidity together, which most of us would probably argue that it's, if you have a lot of morbidities going on post-op, it's probably going to result in a mortality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and if you look at the different, I've just highlighted there, what, what the risk adjusted rate is for isolated cab. Mm -hmm. So you can see mortality is around 2.3%. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna have morbidity or mortality, so any one of the five or, or a death, that's a little higher because obviously you're combining all those together, mm -hmm. about 11%. Stroke at 1.3, prolonged vent at seven, renal failure at two, and re-op at uh, about two and a half. So it looks like if I'm reading this correctly, the mitral valve with a cab has some of the highest? Yes. So you're looking at some of your riskiest or highest risk cases is yeah. mitral valve. Mm -hmm. I've always hated mitral, mitral cabbages. I have hated them for as long as I have lived. Well, there's your reflection. <laughs> and there's, right there. and Nobody there's likes the proof. No, yeah, no, they they likes tend them. not to do, they have problems. Yeah. Right? They're, they're, they're a very complex, risky group. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Just showing you those, and of course, um, as you can see, as you start adding things, those numbers get higher, mm -hmm. except for maybe mitral, eva mitral valve repair on its own. Yeah. It looks like if you can get a nice mitral repair done, things usually go pretty well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we've had the on-pump, off-pump Here we discussion. Go. Oh, here we go. A long here we time. go. <laughs> so if you were just going to look at this database as, as in terms of you know supporting your your stance, um, it's really, and I looked it up yesterday, uh, it's less, it's really around 10% now of all <coughs> ISOCAB being done in the database is being done on pump. Very low, not not very high, really kind of no, top. It used to be up to 30, over 30% yeah, at one time. It, it, was it was pretty good. high, and then it's just steadily kind of declined. Yes. And so, there, you know, we all can talk about papers we've read, we can all cite um, papers that show there's really no difference. So in the database, you actually can tease this out between on and off. And if you look at all those things we just looked at, those morbidities, mortality, you can see that on and off are just side by side. Hmm. So it That's kind of proves the point that there can, there really is considered maybe no difference. Maybe that's why we don't see it. I think there's a lot of talk about concern of incomplete revascularization in off-pump because it's it can be technically challenging so do you do all the graphs you should do mm -hmm. or do you not um, I think most surgeons and if there's any on the call or out there that want to chime in um, it's a tool it's, it's something to have in your toolbox there's a patient that could benefit from that for sure um, but maybe not across the board mm -hmm. and I, I think just looking at the database alone is kind of showing that, that surgeons are, there could be those niches where they're doing it all the time or it's the majority of the time, but 10% of all, it's, it, it's obviously not being done as often as mm -hmm. we thought we were worried that it would be <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> when it came out and we, everyone was doing it. So it's not a higher incidence of stroke? No. I'm so surprised. No, but when it was up in the 30% range, when they were doing a lot of them, I think these numbers are based on 2020. Right. So these are not based on when they were. So I think Remember that's when it was why like cutting we edge? saw oh, the I shift. Know, yeah. Yeah. That's when I left Was the because the you saw actually increased numbers of renal failure. You saw increased numbers of stroke. It was actually 
not as good, and now that the numbers have decreased, the ones that are being done are highly selective. Right. And they're only being done by people who are, look, I mean, I think, I don't know who said it, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> cardioplegia is what opened the door for uh, almost, you know, for a lot of other surgeons to do cardiac coronary bypass surgery. Cardioplegia is what allowed the slower surgeons because in the past it was intermittent cross clamping. Uh, you you had, to be had to be fast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's ischemic arrest. I mean, right. true ischemic arrest, not cardioplegic protected arrest. Right. So, you know, cardioplegia allowed that. And then, of course, you know, off pump is very similar. It's technically much more challenging. Mm -hmm. I just, I've, I've done videos side by side and watched a surgeon do an anastomosis, lima to the LAD with an, a cardioplegia tart still, and one where he's doing it off pump with the stabilizers, and literally showed him the two videos, and he, I'm serious, stopped doing it off pump. It was so dramatic. You have to have a steady hand. It's not, it's, it's, it doesn't behave for you. <laughs> right. And I, I mean, it does, it's, it's really, this just tells you it doesn't really seem to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Right now. Now. Yeah. Yes, now. and I agree with you now. That's 2020, yes. Mm -hmm. So, prediction. So, so, there is something out there called an STS risk calculator. You could go to it right now and play along with me when we get into our s scenarios. Um, you do have to know some things about the patient that, you know, some lab values and things like that. But um, it's it uses the same risking algorithms that the STS is going to use in your analytics to give you risk-adjusted rates. So it, it really is a, a similar animal or a similar way to, to risk stratify patients. So there is one for all seven risk models that we talked about. So you could plug in any of those seven. Oh, and if you knew enough right about your patient, you could, you could plug that in and get a number. Okay. Okay? And it really is based on everything up to wheels in the operating room. So it's a preoperative okay. assessment. And again, that over here on the left, that is right off their web page. If you click on those links, you can see the intense statistical modeling that goes into developing them, how many years of data they took to, to come up with these, and step-by-step -step instruction on how to use it. Okay. So it, it is out there. It's, it's not proprietary. Anybody can go to this website and run this. So why don't we run one? Okay. So, yes. Let's run so one. So everybody so. has to go get, so the people online, I need to tell them to go to uh, Risk Calc, R R I S K. Hey, uh, can you put that on uh, uh, on FaceTime and uh, the other thing? Riskcalc.sts.org. I'm on the right page. Oops. I'm sorry. Yes. The, it, it, correct. It, it risk. It never happens. <laughs> risk C A L C. <laughs> dot no problem down here. I got it. S. Yeah, ready. T S. Well, Joe, this could be dude. <laughs> risk calc dot S T S. Sorry. Okay. There. Good job. Okay, All I right. got it. R I S K C A L C dot S T S dot org. It is errored. So you see that your first thing. It's not on up this slide, but if you're on that. Um, app or you're on that um, calculator, you, you have to select which surgery you're talking about first. So I, I did isolated cab. So here's the information for that particular patient, 65-year-old uh, Caucasian male. He's got some uh, 100 kilos, 170 centimeters. He's got diabetes. He takes an oral for that, metformin. Hypertension, former smoker, social drinker, which is uh, in the database considered two to seven drinks a week. Oh. I know. I'm kind of like, okay. What happened? Uh oh, uh -oh. <laughs> We're learning about ourselves here. I'm like, don't, don't judge. Um, <laughs> he's had a PCI in the past. He, he does take some Plavix, but that's been discontinued on admission, and he's uh, on an inhaler for some asthma. They diagnosed him with non-STEMI. Go ahead. I have a question. On mine, why is it asking me who's the payer? That's part of it. Why would that, that make change the mortality? Yes. Really? So if you're worried about paying for your own surgery, you're no, more No, but stressful? I mean, do you see a doctor? I mean, are you getting care? Uh, are you getting uh, care? That makes sense. If you're not getting okay. care, you're yeah. probably okay. coming in pretty yeah. far along in some gotcha. of these diseases that are hurting. 
you. Yes, you don't even know you have. untreated underlying yep, condition, uh, comorbidities. Yep. Okay. Diabetes, hypertension, hypertension yes, you name it. Fair. You name it. Okay. Insured people do better. Yes. It's true. It is. And it's they true. and they are asking for that information. That's part of what they what we fill out every time on it is who's your insurer? Mm -hmm. and, and do you have insurance? So he's, uh, he comes into the ER, he rolls in for non-STEMI, they take him to the cath lab, he's got three vessel disease, including left main, a little trace MR and an EF of 55%, and there's some labs right there, okay? And mm -hmm. so if you're moving through, and there's some, there's some more questions you're, you're getting asked on this, mm -hmm. that you can either say no or, or move past. Yeah. And if you run the calc, you see he's got 0.785% chance okay. of mortality. mortality. And then if you, and you can see all the other things are risked out too, in terms of renal failure, stroke, wow, vent. Wow, that's so cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. <laughs> and, and if you notice, length of stay. Uh -huh. uh, are they, you know, this patient is 56% guaranteed <laughs> that they should be out of the hospital in six days or less. Oh. Predictable. Predicted. Predicted. Yes. Yeah. And, and then a two percent chance of Whoa. being in there a long, longer time. Longer than fourteen days. Longer than reoperation. Uh, that's a bring back. Yes. So six days is short length of stay. Mm -hmm. Fourteen days is long length of stay. So what's between seven and thirteen? Or what is anything seven over and six is long, isn't inclusive. it? Well, no. It, for long, it has to be over fourteen. Oh. Uh, it's just going to be average. Okay, oh. so not short. Not short. Short is a benefit. Short, shorter length of stay gives you points. You would Good hope points. so. That, that's what our surgeons say all the time. Why don't I get extra bonus? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got it. Bonus points. So, so there's, so there's that. So there's, for this patient, things are kind of looking like, all right, that's that doesn't look so bad. And if, if our overall mortality rate in isocab is two percent, this guy should do okay. I mean. If you're just looking at risk calculation. Mm -hmm. So if you were speaking about this, uh, what would you say their score is? Because do they have, am I missing it? Do they get an overall score? Or is it just broken down by category? It's just broke, well, I would think your, really your overall is morbidity or mortality. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, that's seven and a half. And if I don't mean to interrupt, but morbidity, that morbidity that you have, or mortality, that's major morbidity, right? Those are those five that we did talked the renal, about. Right. The, renal, the big one, stroke, stroke. Mm -hmm. yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's those a question. Are, those are those. <laughs> so you know how sometimes you hear uh, patients coming in, but then uh, they're too high of a risk, the hospital has declined to allow that surgery. What Are they using these types of scores, or do they have their own scoring? They're probably using this, and I'll get to how, how okay. you can use this. Um, in your practice or a hospital, maybe they've got a committee or there's mm -hmm. kind of things like that. We're okay. going to get to that. But I want to show you what happens when you start kind of playing. So what if we just change this patient's gender? Hmm. Oh, she went up a whole percent, right? She went up about half percent. Half percent. Okay. In, in, mortality. in mortality. In mortality. But again, everything kind of moves up. So just being um, a female and not a male changes things. Okay, so just that one change brought it, everything up a little bit. Her, her length of stay for short goes down. Um, everything else goes up a little bit. So that's kind of some things you can do with this. Let's, let's go back to our male, but let's take his EF down and let's double his creatinine. Now look at his score. Oh, wow. That has more than doubled. Okay, mm -hmm. so there are things that are driving the score, and that's what I'll, I'll get to that in terms of you know discussing cases, and if you want to put any type of um, structure around using risk scores, and then let's let's take that for the same. Let's just change the gender again. Took the EF down, doubled the creatinine, and made it a female. It's even higher. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you're just moving moving on up. So again, you can you can go into this calculator anytime you want if you know these things. Um, wh why do we do it? What it's, it's not really a game. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it's something interesting <laughs> to watch. Yeah. yeah. So in some, I know in the healthcare system I work in, we do something called pre-op risk assessment, right. which we all 
refer to as poras. So um, this can be done in advance, hopefully, um, if you've got all this information. Again, it gets a little um, challenging if you've got a cast that's been done elsewhere, if you don't have um, a echo that's uh, readily available. Um, it can be done on site uh, by a nurse practitioner, a PA, uh, the surgeon themselves, um, or um, an instruction team that already works in this database all the time. We know those definitions kind of by heart, so we don't really have to look and say, you know, is renal failure one times creatinine baseline? You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know what those things are. Mm -hmm. And then you can set your thresholds that require a discussion. So, for instance, um, at, in our healthcare system, at most facilities, the threshold is 5%. So, for mortality. Okay. So, if someone's going to risk out at 5 or higher, um, that, that score, first of all, once it gets run, it's, it's sent out. Surgeon gets it, cardiologist gets it, mm -hmm. um, maybe um, the nurse practitioner gets it, hospital, there can be any array of people that see these scores. So, they get used to looking at them, they get used to kind of you know, seeing what's high, what's low, and they can, we, in our health system, have left it to the facility to determine their line in the sand. Mm -hmm. But over time, sometimes it changes, especially based on outcome. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we'll take this, for instance, of 5%. So if someone is at 5%, then usually there is a discussion. So you've got to get the, the surgeon on the phone, you're going to get cardiology on the phone, you're going to get the person who maybe ran the score on the phone to talk about why is it so high? Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's driving the score? Is it because they've got chronic lung disease that's severe? Their FEV1 is in the toilet, it's very low. Uh, is it really cardiac? Um, you know, the EFs is terrible. Um, is it renal? Their creatinine is too high. So that just brings a discussion about doesn't mean you can't do the surgery. I think a lot of people get really nervous about this structure because they're like, they're going to tell me no. It's not necessarily no, but it's like, how can we mitigate what we know is going to is a problem here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can we do something better for for the lungs? Do we do we give a treatment before? Do we do you know? Are we going to do something different with our surgical approach? Um, do we need to give a round of CRRT before they even go to the mm -hmm. OR? Mm -hmm. um, just some discussions like that. That's what I've seen this structure do. And again, if people are doing it out there and have, can tell us what they're doing with it, that's great. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think it just gets the discussion going. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's an alternative, alternative therapy. Maybe we shouldn't do surgery. Maybe we'll do hybrid. Maybe we'll do that single mammary and let the cath lab do some stents. I mean, you know, what do you, how do you want to work with this patient? And I think it's helpful that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, you can also get into the numbers <laughs> and just kind of talk yourself out of things. And yeah. I think a lot of people make that um, kind of pushback that, you know, we're risking ourselves out of doing anything, you know. And so that's, that's kind of the other side of the, so of the sword. You know, you don't, you don't want to get into the point where no one gets treated. You don't want to be a one star. <laughs> okay, or a half a star. Well, but we are That's in bad. the business of helping patients, and so you, you're you not likely going to have very many perfect patients, but you do want to do things that you think are going to be successful. I mean, mm -hmm. the patient's going in there hoping that you're going to help them, not that they're going to die. No, no. but, you know, there's a difference between a, 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 a community practice, medical center, hospital, that does standard cardiac standard. Uh, cabbages or whatever it may be, and either a tertiary or a quaternary facility that has multiple different resources and is more accustomed to managing these higher risk patients. So mm -hmm. I do think you have to take that into consideration. Well, sure. Right. Do you have the resources to deal with someone that's got an EF of 15 mm -hmm. and possibly might get you know complete revascularization mm -hmm. but still need an advanced heart failure therapy? Right. You know, do you have that available mm -hmm. at your institution? Um, I've had surgeons use this to kind of have a conversation with the cardiologist that I don't think I should do surgery on this patient. I don't think that's going to work out. Mm -hmm. And again, then you have to question, is it risk aversion or is it just doing what you think is the right thing for mm -hmm. the patient? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to trust that it's 
that they're doing the right thing for the patient. What, right. You know, right. I could, well, you know, see in an extreme situation where if this, you know, as this all becomes public knowledge and people are shopping for where they want to go, do we change our practice so our numbers, and then that gets into an ethical, I mean, there's a whole yeah. another Pandora box. Over. And that's why we're going to be doing ethics, I think, uh, tomorrow. 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 Um, but I will tell you that sometimes, I mean, this is my opinion, uh, that risk aversion is potentially in the patient's best interest, you know? So I think that's, I mean, those are, those are very good questions, but, you know, we have to look at, you know, what, what, are, our, what are our individual capabilities in this practice? Mm -hmm. What are we used to doing? And is this patient falling out of our comfort zone? What we're qualified yes, I to can, do. Yes, they need right. the surgery, that's true, but are we the right people to do that right. surgery? And if they have no other option, I guess I could see, you know, the uh, the dilemma there. You know, do we do it or not do it? Do we let them go home and be in pain or miserable and have no quality of life, or do we take the risk and do it, knowing that uh, you know they're high risk? Those are good questions. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. No, I wish I did know the answer, but I don't know the answer. You know, no, Joe no, is going to be giving a talk tomorrow on. Uh, ECMO, right? And, I think and it's rate. Saturday. Oh, it's Saturday. Saturday. Okay. And um, it would be great if we had something like this for ECMO. We I mean, I know which patients to put on. Soo, as soon as you started <laughs> doing this, I said, we need this for ECMO. We need <laughs> there, to start gathering it, the data for It does for that. exist for ECMO. Yeah, the ELSA, ELSA registry uh, But it's there, not but very many people participate in that, correct? Right. Well, you have to really kind of... So there's, a lot, of data. Yeah. there's so a lot of data. No, it's not very yeah. many. You have to be I mean, also approved. You're talking about how many data uh, points for how center. long. No, I mean, there's a lot of millions and millions. I, I mean, this is we we discussed it. Yeah. You know, really, it's accurate, a different topic. So. Because they will not bring out a new risk model until they've got the data behind it to support that the numbers that are being generated here have some validity. Mm -hmm. And you know, people can argue that against that if they want. But I mean. CAB was first, um, ABR followed, it, MBR was last in terms of getting um, risk model because a lot of times it's done in conjunction with something else mm -hmm. and how do, you, how do you tease out what is a mitral valve isolated. Um, a mitral valve uh, with a clip and is still a mitral valve. I mean an atrial clip. Like, you know, yeah. Or mitral clip. Right. The mitral clip. No, mean? no, the atrial, atrial clipping. An atrial cure. So if you do that with a mitral valve, it's still a mitral valve. If yes. you do PVI on the epicardial surface, that's still a mitral valve. So I mean, a lot of times you you, you get into the kind of these adjunct things that are done at the same time. Yes. And when does that move it out of that category? Gotcha. There's, there's so a mitral lot valve with atrial with the uh, AF ablation or mitral valve with uh, 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 PFO uh, closure, single right. stitch, or, uh, or primary. Uh, what am I trying to say? Appendage clipping, right? Isolation, whatever you want to call right. it. Right. Mm. So, just for reference, in 2018, there were 500 ELSO centers with 100,000 patients around the world. Yes, around the world. Well, but my point is, is if you're not an ELSO center, and correct me if I'm wrong. You don't report your data. There are a lot of people who are doing ECMO who are not reporting their data. So Correct. the numbers, you know, well, we saw the numbers for STS. It was a it was a pretty good amount of the actual heart centers out there reporting. My point about the ELSO was, it's hard to have um, numbers to uh, to show risk categories if you're not really getting all the data. That's true. I agree with you. you I agree. so in that regard, I agree with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is why. We were talking is these risk models are based on a lot of data huge amounts of data and you know mm -hmm. they they really do go through a rigorous vetting and analysis so that you know we're all using this go looking oh okay but you know is it real I mean is that true yeah. you know because you know some surgeons will you know the smell test I just look at them or I just know they're yeah. not going to do well the eyeball you know, test you know, yeah right exactly <laughs> You know, I, I just don't think so. You mm -hmm. know, and, and that's kind of subjective. Mm -hmm. You do, this gives you some objectivity to bring to the table in terms of, I just don't think this patient's going to do well. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of helps you quantitate it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think, again, this, whatever you think about STS, participating in STS, 
Um, it's, it's really, hospitals and health systems are really closely measured and they've got metrics and they are being looked at and there are penalties for not meeting your benchmarks. And obviously if your hospital isn't doing well, um, that's where we work. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, now we, also, we, we need them. We do I need, need them. To, I need to just throw this out there. Hospitals actually pay the STS to be in this database. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So that may be the, I don't know if that's true with ELSO. I, I don't know if hospitals know. have to pay to give them that data and then they get their score. I don't think that exists because they have the score. They John have a score. They have a rest score. Yeah, John, do you know? I was going to say that um, I've worked at a couple places that don't do the STS, and I thought that I thought it was a requirement. But apparently, it's voluntary, right? They it's it's required that they participate in some sort of quality improvement program. Uh, most most places, obviously, ninety percent go straight to the STS because it's it's there. It's uh, they get they feel they get something out of it. Is but it required by Medicare? Who requires it? It's re in terms. Well, I believe probably everybody for reimbursement. I would I would say so. Insurance Medicare. companies as well mm -hmm. as Medicare. But it doesn't have to be the STS. I think mm -hmm. most people just go there because they do feel like they're getting they're putting and data so in a database that, that they're going to get a lot of bust, and they're going to get something out of it. Yeah, yeah, they're not joking around. I mean, it's a serious they're database. They're not. No, it's not it's not just a a, a willy-nilly, you know, uh, date, you know, like some kind of simple spreadsheet. It's a very complex. I mean, they do mm -hmm. some incredible work. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, is it 100% accurate? I mean, nothing's 100%, but is it a really good guide? Yeah, I think it is. Well, yeah. I think they go through a lot of validation. Well, and the more data you have, the more you can shake out the things that are likely not outliers. Yeah, mm -hmm. as long as who's putting the data in is putting the. But data you know, in. you know, yeah. sometimes you have those those outliers, and they can really skew things if you have a small data set. But the larger your data set, then those outliers yeah. aren't going to matter much. You know, yeah. right? That's it true. softens it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know they'll. For, for valve reporting, uh, they'll roll up three years worth and aggregate it, you know, so it's just not that 50 in a year, yeah. you know, for smaller programs. They'll, ag they'll aggregate it to kind of smooth that out. Yeah. Um, a lot of places will use their local database for, so for instance, you can be with a third party vendor that you're putting all this data in, then, then it feeds up to STS. Mm -hmm. So within your own healthcare system or hospital, you've got a local database. It's not risk adjusted, but you can query that for things for your section meetings. If you know if everyone's interested, blood products, you know, I'm sure everybody's interested in blood transfusion, mm -hmm. pull it. And then some people make their own dashboards out of this for their hospitals and show it on a monthly basis or, you know, have some sort of things going mm -hmm. on there. So that you can track a trend. Because I will say turnaround on this data can be slow. Um, we're, you can put it in as often as uh, once a quarter to get analyzed. Um, it, the star ratings are only done on six months worth of new data, so they only come out twice a year. And, um, and sometimes it takes, like we're still waiting for 2020 mm -hmm. as, a, as a calendar year. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. we won't see that probably till next month. Very interesting. So, yeah. And what data is collected that's, you know, cardiopulmonary bypass? Mm -hmm. Is there points in there for perfusion? Mm -hmm. And there's, so for instance, uh, your times, clamp time, pump time. Uh, if your strategy was full bypass, was it uh, partial? Like did you do some, like for guys that are, or surgeons that are doing aortic valve cab, do they do their distals off pump and do they go on for their valve? Um, you can tease that out. Uh, blood products intra-op, post-op, if you're giving an antifibrinolytic. Um, if you're using cerebral oximetry, um, there's a lot of operative points. And in terms of actual perfusion points, mm -hmm. um, I think that's where Perform has tried to get in mm -hmm. on maybe doing something more quality for perfusion in general, mm -hmm. just for us. There is an anesthesia module uh, with the STS that asks a lot of questions about uh, cell saver given back, uh, fluids during the case. Uh, it's pretty new. It doesn't have a lot of um, 
buy-in right now, mm -hmm. uh, but it will probably gain traction. Yeah, I was yeah, wondering if they're going to add like practice, yeah. like temperature. Yep, lowest temp. Uh, temperature, lowest temp hemoglobin, DO2, index, mm -hmm. CO2, um, whether you ultrafiltrated, whether yeah. you did Z buff, what your you know pressures were, your lowest yeah. pressures during the procedure for how long. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, but I see that in a lot of studies too. Mm -hmm. I see we use the pump. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's all they, they say. They don't ever talk about <laughs> In how they fashion. ran yeah. the pump. Right. And I think that that contributes, I believe, that that can change a, let's say, a mortality score from, let's say, 2.5% or 3% to 4.5% or 5 or 1.5% to 2 I think it makes that, I can think it can make that much of a difference depending on what you do. I believe that. But, and I, I believe that too. But we don't have data to show it, and right. I think that's kind of where we get we, we lose out maybe a little on in our profession. And I'll put that out to John and anybody that's listening, in terms of how how do we measure ourselves mm -hmm. in terms of how we're doing? Um, I think it's mostly subjective at this point. Obviously, if you're not making a huge mistake, yeah, <laughs> and the mm -hmm. patient lives, mm -hmm. <laughs> lives or yeah. dies. That's you're how we're grading it, right? right. But but what's going on in terms of some of these? especially the electronic um, medical record, where they're able to capture some of these feeds off our heart-lung machines mm -hmm. and our, um, you know, our analyzers. How, how often are we staying at that pressure? Uh, what's the threshold? What, what do we set for our min and maxes? And then you've got a tool to have a very objective conversation with your team. <laughs> Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how you're running the case. Yes. And I mean, yeah. like it, these and hemoglobins of six are not good. And you can tie them to post-operative events. I mean, you could, you could make the case, yes. like you're saying. Everybody's all about oxygen, oxygen delivery and renal failure, um, and all about that. If you're keeping it above a certain level and certain in certain types of patient populations, you might avoid it. Mm -hmm. And so, that's huge. If you could show somebody's um, STS post-op renal failure declining solely based on perfusion practice change, mm -hmm. it'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. That would, would be interesting. Would be. And I think you would see it. I'm confident. I believe it to my core. But you've got to start collecting it and measuring it. And yes. Yeah. Think From yes. a lot of places, so everybody has to agree and comply and actually submit the data. Because if correct me if I'm wrong, but in the STS, if you have remarkably high scores, in other words, you're like a three star, three star plus, like you have really just incredible numbers, happen. they'll come audit you. <laughs> well, the <laughs> audits are supposed to be random, <laughs> but they do, they do go looking because there, there's a lot of um, checks and balances in you know, trying to avoid garbage in, garbage mm -hmm. out. Yeah. in terms of abstraction. Yeah. You know, you cannot be, um, you know, cooking the books. Yeah. yeah. Or they, they, they really are going to try to make sure that's not happening. Mm -hmm. You would think that we'd all have the integrity to want to report all of our, you know, you can't just report your best cases. You've got to report all your cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, it is required to participate that you have to record, you have to submit 100% of qualifying cases. Mm -hmm. You can't leave your bad ones over here that mm -hmm. hopefully in no the box. Ever, yeah, the in the box. You've got we the noticed cars. that you have a 0% mortality, but what are all those refrigerated <laughs> trucks outside <laughs> the back door? Exactly. <laughs> Where are those patients? So you, there are audits. It's a very robust audit cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I've been audited in the, our healthcare system at least five times. Wow. 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 So wow. They, That's they, a lot. Well, I think the more facilities that are, they don't really know that in your health system, you might have ah. eight facilities. They're all individual participants. Uh, so they might, we got tagged for three one year. <laughs> you don't understand. We're all the yeah. same. This is all the same. But yeah. they, don't, they don't know They don't that. see it like yeah. that. They don't see it like that, so. Very good, this was great. Yeah. This was great, now I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh-oh, here we go. I'm gonna put both of them on the spot. Oh boy. Okay. Put John on the spot. You're, no, <laughs> I'm putting you and Anne on the spot. <laughs> no, I am. I'm doing it. Can uh -oh. you focus the camera on oh Anne and Deb? Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Um, so tomorrow we have the ethics in healthcare, and we have um, no. That's t that was today. No, that's tomorrow. That's we tomorrow. have the ethics in healthcare, and um, 
the uh, your uh, your your work with your your um, your uh, mission. Uh, mission outreach. Oh, nice. Yes. Yes. And yours at eleven, and yours at eleven thirty. And let's see, John. We have John. You at nine o'clock. Now I know you're going to be coming in via Skype. Um, so if I send a car to pick you up, would you could you, could you make it back tomorrow? No, I'm coming back tomorrow. Good. I'm yeah. going to drive to the ends of the world. But yes. That's yes. not what we say on air. It's really close. It's just a hop, skip, and a jump. It's just a hop, skip, and a skill. Is that the yes. phrase? That's so, what we say. It's a hop so, Anne, um, so you're at 11. Um, how does it look for you? So far, so good. So far, so good. Okay. Fingers David, crossed. did you hear that? Okay, you could you could focus that you could go widescreen with everybody. Okay, put it back on them. I want to see how red they are. Online. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, um, John, you have any closing remarks? I'm going to let you close this out because you have been so incredibly patient, sitting in that big giant leather chair, <laughs> and uh, 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 been here all day. And uh, you you I've only shown you a little bit of love, so I'm going to show you all the love now and let you close this out and uh, discuss what we're doing tomorrow. Well, it was, uh, it was awesome. I hope the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, I'm sure they did. We have callers and emails all the time, right? And uh, tomorrow I'm, I'm going to be doing the uh, BB ECMO without anticoagulation. Does it actually improve nice. outcomes? Yeah. And um, if you need to rearrange the schedule at all, Joe, I can move that to Saturday just as easy, actually. No, we're going to stick with the schedule as is. I mean, unless, it, unless that's what you need. 9 to 9.30 is perfect. Tomorrow. I'll be, I'll be at work. It, it should work out okay, but you never know, so we'll see. If it doesn't, I'll just move with mine and move you you after me. We'll fig, we will figure okay. it out. Okay. And if that's okay, unless that's not what you want. No, that's fine. I mean, a Saturday would actually be better for me, but I, I should, it should work out okay. All right, we'll, no. just, we'll just make it work. We'll just make it work. And, uh, but I can't thank you enough. Again, you've been so incredibly patient. So I appreciate you so very much. You do so much for this program. And, our, and like I said, I think you were incredibly patient today. You don't even get a sandwich. We have Jimmy John sandwiches, oh, well, soup. We got all kinds of stuff. Um, and I feel really bad that I cannot send you one. Well, you know, it's uh, 3 o'clock here, and I had breakfast at 6 o'clock this morning. So. He's hungry. He wants you to wrap this up. All right. Well, no, he's wrapping it up. Oh. <laughs> You're the one wrapping it up. Well, does he have the well, information I, I, to wrap it up? He does. You guys did an awesome job. I'm, I'm so glad to see Deb and uh, Anne again. It's been so, so many years. <laughs> nice yeah. to see you. Uh, I don't know if you were here earlier, Deb, but Ricky Garcia from Puerto Rico called in. Oh, he did. I missed it. Yeah, yeah that was oh, good, too. That was he a does, nice reunion. He? Oh, my goodness. He's a good fella. He's, he's a, a good fella. Yeah, sticking, he's it, a, sticking it out down there. He's been through the hurricane, just total yeah. devastation, he, COVID. He, I don't know how they do it down there on that island. He was, he and Sal were classmates. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. right? They were in the same class, and there was only, I think, five in their class that ended up finishing. They, they were, were, was he your junior? I, he was two juniors back, but we overlapped for about a month. I overlapped yeah. with Sal and yeah. Ricky for about a month. And, yeah. by the way, Chuck. Charlie Reed overlapped for his last month or so. Yeah. And um, I, I could close with a comment about Charlie Reed if you want. <laughs> Do it. Do it. I could sum up Charlie Reed in, in one sentence. Perfection is the only option. Yeah. That was his attitude. Yeah. He must be perfect in an imperfect world. Anything less is unacceptable. Yeah. Wow. That's right. I, you know, I can see that in Charlie. I can see Charlie saying that. Um, I could add another sentence, but I won't. Um, <laughs> you can always add something. I met Charlie in 1977, 1977, in Tucson, Arizona. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you where he took me. It was quite <laughs> interesting. He smoked a lot, and uh, he got me on. He got me smoking. I had quit, but I started smoking again. So, uh, so with that said, uh, tomorrow we have anticoagulation-free ECMO. We have mechanics and CRRT, normal pressures, all this stuff, and how to integrate it into your ECMO circuit. Uh, and uh, Anne on the ethics of healthcare. Deb on her medical mission work and the value of giving back. Um, and then we're doing 
And you're going to really enjoy this. We're doing some really interesting stories. Uh, we're going to have a, a nurse practitioner here that was at the time an ICU nurse talking about her management of her interaction with families of patients that are on ECMO but unrecoverable. <laughs> Decisions are going to have to be made. Tammy is going to be talking about a patient who was unrecoverable and uh, it's going to be a very sensitive topic for you actually when you find out why who they married uh, while on ECMO that one? and uh, Dr. Duvall uh, from, uh, from Houston Methodist the Woodlands is going to come he's going to be here and he's going to be discussing what the law and ethics are from their perspective on dealing with patients who are unrecoverable but the family is like I don't want you to withdraw, I don't want you to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, these are very complex topics and I think you're gonna really tee this up. Both of you, you know, you're gonna you guys are gonna really be sort of laying the stage for this because you probably bat to deal with this out of the country and other places with some pretty sick people. Mission work is not easy work. They're not the healthiest of candidates. And then Patrick is gonna finish it up with perfusion accidents which, you know, somebody said the other day, you're only as good as your last 30 seconds of a case. And unfortunately, that's a reality in our profession, I think. Mm -hmm. So, we did make up for our short time yesterday. <laughs> and Retro, American Board. <laughs> She's and, not uh, going to report you. We're, no. in good, we're, in, we're back in good standing. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow morning at 08. 45 for my opening remarks and John at 9 o'clock. See y'all. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, John. Bye, John. See you tomorrow. The ELSA Monitor is Transonic's extracorporeal life support assurance monitor that helps objectively assess the efficiency of ECMO therapy, which helps to improve your ECMO outcomes. By using gold standard transit time ultrasound technology, ELSA verifies delivered blood flow, quantifies recirculation, and trends oxygenator clotting, allowing perfusionists to provide the ideal ECMO delivery for their patients. ELSA is an easy to use, non-invasive way to measure recirculation in VV ECMO without blood sampling. ELSA also helps perfusionists improve bedside decision-making for COVID-19 ECMO patients. Start maximizing ECMO efficiency. Let the ELSA monitor help your surgeons, intensivists, and patients while safeguarding your ECMO program at the same time. Transonics ELSA monitor.